Well, hello, and welcome to the Old Time Movie Radio Show, where we make a compilation of some of your favorite old-time radio shows featuring movie characters or actors. Tonight's show is a grab bag featuring Gerald Moore as Philip Marlowe and some episodes of Nero Wolf, Sherlock Holmes, Boston Blackie, and Michael Shane. And we pair these great shows with the sights and sounds of a crackling fire. Well, we've got a lot of great shows and a lot of great actors and a lot of action, so we're sure to be in for an enjoyable evening tonight. Well, now, without any further ado, let's get on with our program. It's time to sit back and relax and enjoy our old-time movie radio show featuring the adventures of Philip Marlowe as well as the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes, the new adventures of Nero Wolfe, Boston Blackie, and the new adventures of Michael Shane. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This time it started as a routine search for a rich girl's fiancé and the trail led to a silent house haunted by a face at the window and blood in an open cedar chest. But before it was over, it became a search for a corpse that wouldn't sit still. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story... The Busy Body. Bone jerked me up off my back and out of the sports page at 9.30 in the evening of an already too long day. On the other end was a warm, feminine voice, edged with a kind of self-assurance that means money, and lots of it. But the words were both hurried and panicky, so after I hung up, I reluctantly waded through the sports section with my feet instead of my eyes and headed for the coffee shop at Franklin and Bronson, where my new client, who had identified herself as Liz Stewart, said she'd be waiting. A pair of blue eyes at a table in the corner measured me from haircut to shoelaces, so I took the cue and walked over. After we introduced ourselves, I was waved into the chair opposite her. She leaned toward me and started with a rush. Mr. Marlowe, I've got to find a man named Dean Howard as soon as possible. Not exactly a new switch. He's my fiancé. We plan to notify my Uncle Hanley of our engagement tonight. Who is Uncle Hanley? Uncle Hanley Stewart of Stewart Aluminum. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Dean, Dean Howard was to meet me at 7, but he didn't show up. Mm -hmm. And then about a quarter to 8, he called. He started to tell me something about... Something that he referred to as a horrible mistake, but before he could get it out, we were cut off. Well, I tried to call him... Want some coffee? Hmm? Coffee! Uh, no, no. Well, okay. I-, I tried to call him back, but there was no answer. So I went to his house, but it was locked and dark. And yet his car was still parked outside. Uh-huh. Well, look, Miss Stewart, why don't you save yourself 50 bucks, go home and wait for an apologetic phone call, huh? What do you mean? Well, this stacks up as being a case of cold feet or a little celebration that got out of hand. Either way, there's nothing to worry about. I've come to you for help, Marlo, not a pat on the head. Okay, okay. I'll assume it's my error for the moment. How long have you known this Dean Howard? Well, I, I met him at a party about three months ago. Mm-hmm. Uncle Hanley and I both liked him tremendously right from the first. I suppose you've considered the possibility of another woman? Well, of course, I'm not a child. I can see that. Well, <laughs> Dean has been deeply troubled for the past week. He wouldn't tell me why, but I, I'm certain that this business tonight is tied in with it. Something's wrong, and I want you to find out what it is. All right, but I'm no leg man for Cupid, so if it turns out to be nothing more than a guy's heart beating in double time, I drop it. Fair enough? Fair enough. She gave me a short list of posh joints she and Dean Howard sometimes visited. And his address, which was 312 Normandy. She said I could reach her at home, which was 28 Roxbury Drive in Beverly Hills. Well, 50 bucks is 50 bucks, so after she left, I spent a handful of nickels checking the list by phone and drew a complete blank. So I drove out Los Feliz to Normandy and found the number, 312. As I walked up to the door and leaned on the bell, I got the feeling that I was being watched. There was no answer, so I tried the door. It was locked. I threw a look over my shoulder as I walked around the side of the house and caught a glimpse of a face in a window next door, just before the curtain was dropped back into place. The back door of 312 was locked, too, I found out, as did the face next door, which was watching me again from one of the rear windows. There was one answer to that, so I went out in the street and up the steps of the house next door and knocked, good and loud. What do you want? My name's Marlowe, lady. I'm a detective. You may be able to help me. A detective? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, 
Come right in, Mr. Marlowe. It's about time, is all I have to say. I'm Agatha Lambrigger. What's he been up to? Who? Well, you're investigating that bachelor next door, aren't you? Yes. Oh, <laughs> how'd you know? Huh. Stands the reason. I've known all along he's a suspicious character. Yeah? Live very here now. Comes and goes at all hours. Drives that fancy car out there. Wears fine clothes, but nobody seems to know what he does or where he gets all his money. Well, look, Mrs. Lamb. And Lamb's... girl. Oh. Well, believe you me, they don't come to clean his house. Hmm. Never gets cleaned. But they come just the same. Why, only tonight there was one. Some blonde in a white dress. I tell you, I never... Mrs. Lambrigger, did the girl go inside? Well, no. But she tried to. The door was locked. <laughs> and it's uh, Miss Lambrigger. Oh, how stupid of me. Uh, well, tell me, did you notice Mr. Howard come home tonight? Well, I didn't exactly see him come home. But he was over there all right. And not alone either. Is that so? Another girl? No, no, it was only some man. Oh. But it still bears out what I've been saying. Because I just happened to glance out of my window at this one here across uh-huh. from that one of his, you see. Yes, sir. Well, a light was on over there. And I could look straight down the hallway. And do you know what? What? Those two grown men were roughhousing like a pair of hoodlums in that hall. Wrestling they were like ordinary ruffians. I tell you, I never saw the like. I got a good look at him, and I'd certainly know him if I saw him again. Mm, well, how'd the fight come out? Fight? Yeah. What the... Oh, oh, the fight. Well, I can't say about that. My phone rang. It was Lenore Crowley. She simply talked her ear off. You went she to get started. Mm. So when I finally got back to the window, uh, well, when I happened to look out again, it was dark over there. So I never did find out what actually happened. But yes, I well, think thanks that very it... much for your help. I really must run. Oh, and another thing. The noise and the drinking that's gone on in that house. Why, you wouldn't believe it. Oh, you're leaving? As soon as possible, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you, you still haven't told me what he's up to. Well, I'm not at liberty to do that. I, uh... Oh, oh, that's a shame. Yeah. Well, I'll be here all the time, you know, and I'll certainly keep an eye on that house. Oh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you're going to all this trouble just for me. <laughs> Bonsoir, Miss Slambrigger. Backed out of that wind tunnel, got in my car, and drove noisily around the corner. Then I cut my lights, turned quietly into an alley behind the house, and stopped. Slipped through Howard's back gate and up the side of the house, found a window that could be persuaded, and went in. Eh, Howard was a lousy housekeeper, and everything that didn't get brushed off in normal traffic was covered with dust. I found my way to the room opposite Agatha Lambrigger's observation window and ran smack into her first lie. Where she said there was a hallway, there was a solid wall papered with purple roses and hung with four dingy pictures in bronze frames, two on each side of a big ugly mirror. There were two hallways, but no angle at which either could be seen from her window. Furthermore, there was no sign of a struggle. One hall led to the study, the other to the bedroom, and I checked both. But still, there was no indication of a fight. On my way out, I barked my shin on the nose of a lion carved on the corner of an oversized cedar chest. Just as the abrupt sound of someone at the door brought me to a rigid halt. Whoever it was, had the patience of an eight-year-old on circus day. So I set myself up as a type who might live in a joint like this and answered. Mm. Uh, what's the matter with the lights, Howard? Blow a fuse? Or could this be some new economy measure? I like it this way. I don't think I know you. You should, Howard, you should. I called you yesterday about a certain money matter. The name is Leo. Uh, don't go for your gun, Howard. Well, since yours is pointed at my third rib, why should I? Well, like I told you on the phone, my boss is anxious. You're way overdue, Howard. I want that 50 grand the boss loaned you three months ago. Have it for me the day after tomorrow. All of it. Without fail. He knows I'm good for my debts. Why all the pressure? Well, maybe he figures your investments aren't so smart. Like maybe you've been blowing too much on that second-rate canary, Carol. Oh. Oh, yeah, Carol. I remember. Mm. She's your girl. Yeah, well, that's none of my business. See you day after tomorrow about the same time. And if you get a headache from worrying about paying off, just think of the one you'll have if you don't pay. It'll be like ten times this. Oh. Good night. The forty-five in his hand caught the side of my head, and I went out cold. When I opened my eyes, the room had shrunk until there wasn't enough space left to stretch out in. And I climbed to my feet. Oh. <clears throat> it was as easy as roller skating through a log jam. And it wasn't until I found a match and had a light that I knew why. As 
Somebody had moved me from the front door and crammed me into a broom closet like a bag of wet wash. When I got out, I saw that my cubby hole was off the hall of the bedroom. I listened, but there was no sound in the house, so I started moving. But stopped when I noticed something else. A big cedar chest with carved lions on the corners that had been closed before and now was standing open. I struck another match. Inside on the bottom was a thick red puddle of blood. Blew out the mansion was in the middle of a mental apology to Liz Stewart when it came. I ran for the front door in time to see Agatha charge out of the driveway and down the street. Stark terror twisting her face. Help! Help! Hey, Help! Miss Lambringer, hold it! What is it? What happened? I saw him, Mr. Marlowe. I saw him. Oh, but the alley near the hedge. He's dead, Mr. Marlowe. Dead in my backyard. All right, all right. Now take it easy, Agatha. Who was it? He's there now, lying on his back close to the hedge, and he's dead. What'll we do? Come on, we'll have a look. You can show me where he is. Well, all right. He's right back here. I I happened to look out my rear window, and I I saw something move. The the dogs had been getting in my pansies lately, and I, I thought this was another. So I came out to chase him away. That's when I saw the body. Right back here. It's It's gone. Mm -hmm. Now look, Miss Lambrigger. I've got a headache. I'm getting a little tired of this. You saw a body here just like you saw a fight in a hallway from your window. You're so anxious to be in the middle of things you'd make up any kind of a story. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. I I saw that, Python. I saw Dean Howard's body, too. It it was here, I tell you. Where? Show me exactly. Well, right right about there, I think. Oh, sure, sure. And I suppose it... Hey, wait a minute. Yeah. My apologies, baby. There is something here. Could be blood. Here's two dimes and a bar receipt from the tulip room on the strip. Oh, good heavens. What do you do now? Raid the place? You can use my phone. Thanks, but until we know where the body is, we better play it cagey. Now, let's keep this a secret between us. That'll take a lot of courage, I know, but I can trust you, oh, can't yes. I? I? I won't open my mouth to a soul, Mr. Well, that's Marlo. great. That's splendid. Now, you better go inside and stay there until you hear from me. Who knows? You may yet be a heroine, Miss Lambrigger. The bar receipt was a long shot. When I was still two blocks away from the tulip room, I knew it had paid off because a fluorescent banner, 4 by 12 draped over the front of a squat square building, extolled the vocal virtues of one Carol Cody. I parked across the street, went in, and found a dressing room door and knocked. She distinctly said, come in, but when I did, I thought the room was empty. Until a small handful of spangled satin costume hopped up from behind a screen in the corner. I made a sight unseen introduction. It was only a moment later that a tall brunette, filling a white silk blouse and snug, dark slacks, stepped on. Tossed a few pounds of glossy black hair away from her face and gestured me into a chair. Which paper did you say you were from, Marlo? I didn't, honey. I'm a private detective. I can't use it. Don't give odds on it, baby. Not yet, anyway, huh? Let's talk first. For instance, what's with you and Dean Howard? Dean Howard is Mm. a low-crawling thing. That's strange. How did you love him? I didn't till tonight when I found out that he has two heads. That's so he can lie and keep a straight face with one while he laughs up his sleeve with the other. Nuts to him. Nuts to Liz Stewart and her money and nuts to you. I hate Dean Howard enough to kill him and I might just do that. I don't think you will, no, because somebody beat you to it. You... You mean Howard's dead? Looks that way, yeah. I'm not sure because he won't stay in one place long enough. If you're trying to shock me, you're wasting your time. I'm not sorry. One... I think we've got company. Keep talking, I'll get him. Uh, as you say, my friend, the music business is just as lousy as any other dodge, and I can prove it. Come here. You're a good listener, bud, so join the party. Who are you? Why are you listening out there? Come on. Well, no, 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 just, just a minute. I, I wasn't listening. I was looking for you, Marlo. I'm Ward Odom, Mr. Henry Stewart's assistant. You're doing fine. Don't stop now. Well, I, ever since I learned that Miss Stewart hired you, Marlo, I've been trying to talk to you. I, I followed you here from that place on, on, on Normandy because I must know what you found out so far. Why? What business is it of yours? Because, Mr. Marlo, I doubt very much that you even know of the robbery. Robbery? What robbery? More than $40,000 worth of negotiable securities were stolen from Mr. Stewart's safe this evening. You get all your information? Information at keyholes? Hmm. And I have reason to believe that the man you're looking for took them. Of course, I don't dare accuse him without proof of his relationship with Liz, uh, Mr. Stewart's niece. If I were wrong, it it would cost me my job. Odom, did Liz know about the robbery when she hired me? Why, why, of course. Oh, brother. Look, see this? Her name is Carol. She's involved right up to her mascara in the whole mess. I'll let her out of your sight till I get back. Me? Why, you cheap shot. Shut up! And as for being cheap, I'll take care of you when I get back. In 
just a moment the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, three gentlemen with highly varying but equally effective approaches to dealing with crime entertain you with their deeds of daring on CBS every Sunday. Jethro Dumont, alias the Green Llama, Police Commissioner Bill Grant of Call the Police, and Dashiell Hammett, Sam Spade. These three sterling gentlemen all make their appearances tomorrow on most of these same CBS network stations. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Busy Body. After convincing Ward Odom that his greatest contribution to the cause would be staying close, but not too close to the violent lady in slacks, I piled into my car and started for Beverly Hills in a beautiful liar named Liz. I didn't stop until I was at number 28 Roxbury Drive out of my car and walking fast up the semicircle of gravel driveway that led to the carefully antique front door. But then, for two good reasons, I stopped again. The first, a squad car parked ahead of me that said everybody except Marlowe knew all about the bonds Mr. Hanley Stewart could no longer call his own. The second reason and more important was my client, Liz Stewart, sneaking out of a side door and hurrying toward a gray coupe. I stepped back into the shadow of a squat palm and waited for her to come abreast of me. Late date, Miss Stewart. What? Marlo, why, you you startled me. Considering everything, it's the least I can do. What do you mean? I don't like clients who lie to me. So if you don't mind, I'll just stroll along with you while you assure me you can explain everything. But I can, Marlo. Just give me a chance, please. All right. Why didn't you tell me that 40 grand worth of negotiable bonds disappeared from your uncle's safe at the same time as Howard? Well, because I didn't want you to be prejudiced, to be looking for a thief from the start. If Dean did take those bonds, he had a reason. Like being fond of money? No, like being forced to do what he did. All right, let's say he was forced. What then? Well, then I wanted to help him, to get to him before the police. They'd arrest him in a minute. And you, on the other hand, would get the bonds back to your uncle, convince him it was all a mistake, and talk him out of telling the law, huh? And with your own dough, you would help Howard out of the spot he was in, is that it? Yes. But you haven't proved that Dean took the bonds. No, I haven't. Could have been anyone who knew the combination of the library safe. Which includes how many? Uh, Aside from Uncle Han and myself, just the the family lawyer and Mr. Odom. Yeah, what about Odom? Could he have done it, Liz? No, I I don't think so, as much as I dislike him. Mm. You see, Marlo, for years, Odom's been very close to Uncle Han. He's had a thousand opportunities to steal if he wanted to, or like this afternoon, for instance. He had $10,000 worth of the bonds with him today. What was he doing with all that dough, paying gas bills? He was going to sell them for my uncle. But the transaction fell through, so he brought them back to the house and put them back in the safe. Anyway, Marlowe, I don't think he'd have the courage to steal. I know what you mean. I've already met Mr. Odom. When? Oh, about a half hour ago. In a nightclub called the Tulip Room. Odom thinks Dean is guilty, Liz, but he's afraid to mention it publicly until he knows a little more. What's the nightclub got to do with Dean? Carol Cody. Who? She's Dean's girlfriend. Marlowe, you're crazy. I talked to her, honey. She's a singer there. Told me that she and Howard were more than chummy, but that she gave him the air tonight when she found out about you. And you believe that? Mm Mm-hmm. Now that I've had a little time, I believe even more. The tales that she never bothered to mention, the tales like Dean Howard and Carol Cody playing you for a sucker. He gains your confidence, then the combination of the safe, then goodbye. But you see, the end was a switch, Liz. Dean didn't... Dean didn't what? Hmm? What is it, Marlo? What are you staring at? Back of my car there. That's not gas dripping on the driveway. The color's too red. Liz, stay back. No, Marlo. I don't want to. I want to... Marlo! It's Dean! He's dead, Marlo! Yeah. That, Liz, is the switch I was talking about. I think Dean Howard not only crossed you, but Carol Cody as well. She did it! She killed him! All right, all right. Now listen. Get inside. Tell the police about this. Do you hear me? But first, give me a five-minute lead. I'll take your car. I want to get to Carol Cody before the law does. Without saying another word, Liz Stewart, her face drawn and streaked with tears, handed me the keys to her car and turned and walked slowly back to the house. I took one long look at the blood-soaked shirt front on the body I had been a step behind all night and got into Liz's car and pointed it back toward the tulip room. Twenty minutes later, when my knock on the locked dressing room door brought no answer, I had kicked my way in. Alone and half-conscious in the middle of the floor was Ward Odom, a man I'd assigned to stand sentry over the brunette. Oh, Marlo. Marlo, she tricked me. Asked for a cigarette, and I went to light it. She, she swung. It adds, Odom, and you're lucky she let it go at that. 
It was more permanent in Howard's case. Oh, oh then, then you found his body, Molly. Yeah, in the trunk of my car. Oh, oh, how awful. And she did all that, this Carol Cody? Yes and no. She must have had help, Odom, because... First of all, it takes something stronger than the chanteurs to keep shifting a corpse from sea to chest to garden to car. The rate that Howard was being moved. And second, an old crow named Agatha Lambriger saw a man roughhousing with Howard over at his own place, not a woman. You, you mean there was a witness to the murder, Marlowe? Well, more or less. Then you have no idea who the murderer is? No. And that, Odom, is all the more reason why I want to catch up with Carol Cody. Happen to know where she lives? Uh, why, why, yes, yes. This is the Grayfield Apartment Hotel on mm-hmm. North Havenhurst Drive. North it's, Havenhurst. It's a room, room, or, or 118. 118. And I think that it's... Marlo! Marlo, wait, my, my top coat is gone. What? Yes, and she was wearing slacks, remember? Marlo, maybe she's leaving town disguised as a man. It's a point, Odom. I still think I'll try the apartment hotel first. Open. The bag's over there, boy. Did you get the test? Marlo, what are you doing here? Not doubling for a bellhop, so get over there, sit down, and keep your hands in your lap, because if I have to, I'll shoot. But I don't understand. I'll make it I real just... plain. I think you murdered Dean Howard because he double-crossed you after he emptied Hanley's steward safe. And I think you're out of your mind. Which brings us to a position called stalemate, and that in turn makes this a good time to call the cops. I didn't kill Dean. I swear I didn't. Oh, listen to me. What you said about Dean double-crossing me after he stole the bonds is true, but not the way you think it is. Second verse. He didn't want to just cut me out of my share, Marlowe. He wanted to return all the bonds intact. He really fell in love with Liz Stewart and decided to play All-American Boy. You mean he decided to call it all off after he'd stolen the bonds? Yes, Marlo. That was the reason we argued tonight. That was a stronger reason than the one I already had for your committing murder. Baby, you wanted that money bad. No, you're wrong. Come back here. Why did you belt Odom and run? And don't bother denying that you did because I just left him. And he's minus good health in that top coat over there. So if you think that you... I can explain that. I... I was scared that a confession out of Dean would get me into hot water. And when you showed and then Odom, I... Just a minute, Carol. Marlo, I... Just a minute, will you? I think I've got the answer. What answer? It's dust, Carol. Dust and what an old gossip swears she saw from her window. Right now, I've got to get over to her place before she ends up looking like the late Mr. Howard. Well, then, then you believe me, Marlowe, about not killing Dean. I don't know. But since you've been in on this cheap swindle from the start, what? we'll just tuck you into an old-fashioned wardrobe. Oh, just for safekeeping, baby! <laughs> Outside in Liz's car, I slammed my foot down hard against the accelerator and didn't ease up until I screeched to a stop away from 310 North Normandy, where I knew murder was scheduled to happen again. And I was next to a pair of half-open French doors through which I could see Agatha Lambriger sitting erect in a straight-back chair. I was happy that I hadn't taken any longer in getting there. I was also happy that the man standing opposite her gun in hand, the man who had murdered Dean Howard, had his back to me. I got a firm grip on the 38 in my hand. You've been so nosy, Miss Lambriger. But it's too bad that Marlowe had to let me know you've been a witness when I killed Dean Howard. A rough house, I think you called it. A rough house is what I thought at the time. But when I saw Dean Howard's body out in the alleyway, I knew... You knew I killed him. Everything would have been simple if you hadn't had your nose out a mile. I was going to run over him. And it would have looked like an accident. But I had to move the body after you saw it. Marlowe's car looked good until I could dispose of it. But there's no point telling you all this. You won't be able to gossip about it, Miss Lambriger. I'm sorry. Sorry, but that's the way it has to be. You or me. I vote for you, Autumn. Marlo. Drop your gun before I close the polls for good, real noisy like. Come on, drop it. No, no, don't shoot. I dropped it. I dropped it. Okay. I moved to the middle of the room, hands high. Well, well, I didn't want to do it, but I had to kill him. I had Dean to. Howard was going to return the bonds he took, Marlo, and please that would have left you in me. a spot, wouldn't it? Because Howard only stole 30 grand out of that safe, you were taking 10 grand to legitimately sell for your boss. I know what And when you went to return them, you saw there'd been a theft. And you decided to make the most of it and let somebody else take the rap for the whole 40 grand. Don't worry, a man who shoots another man in the back has no guts. He won't try anything while I'm looking at him. No. No, Marlo. I I don't have any more guts than it takes to jump behind a woman's skirt. A lady I choked to death. Could you take one more step? Now lower your gun and listen. All right. Let her go, Odom. Sure. Sure, let her go. Just as long as you cooperate, Marlo. Marlo! Marlo, don't be a Shut fool! Up. Shut Marlo, up! Marlo, shoot! You kill me anyway! Shoot! No! Shoot! Marlo, don't shoot! Marlo, don't shoot! 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 You were right, Marlo. No guts. <laughs> It was 
An ambulance, a half a dozen squad cars, and a police captain included, and three long hours of questions and answers in triplicate later. Before 310 North Normandy and environ settled back to being just another quiet house on just another quiet street. With, of course, the exception of Miss Agatha Lambrigger, who now would never return to normalcy. <laughs> and as we sipped hot tea together and a clock someplace deep in another room struck twice. Now, Philip, uh, I'm sure I had She was right. still going strong. Dean Howard owed money, so he and that worthless singer decided that he should get friendly with your well-paid client and then at the propitious moment rob her uncle, correct? Correct, yes. Yeah. But what I don't understand is how you knew it was that awful man Odom. Well, there were two things, honey. His anxiety to get me to Carol, together with a streak of dust the length of Odom's topcoat sleeve, all added up to a hunch. That, Philip, I don't understand. Well, you got to take him in reverse order. I saw dust on Odom's topcoat sleeve when I was in Carol Cody's apartment. That reminded me of the dust all over Howard's place. Oh, I messed that up. Yeah, luckily. And the dust was the length of the sleeve, as though somebody had brushed against the wall, coated thick with it. As one would in searching for something. Hmm? That's right, that's right. Now, there's another thing. You saw Howard and another man roughhousing in a hall by looking out of that window there. Mm -hmm. Where, Miss Lambrigan, no hall is visible. But where there is a mirror. Oh, then you mean I actually saw a reflection. Yes, darling, you did. Dean Howard hid the bonds behind the mirror. Which tilted so that I saw the reflection of a side hall. That's right. Well, now, Philip, one last question. Why did Odom move the body? Well, if it's the last, I'll answer it. <laughs> because he didn't want Howard's death to appear a murder on the night the bonds were stolen. It was better if he died accidentally. It wasn't connected with a the theft. Oh, I see. Yeah, well, now, look, well, Miss Lambert. Excuse me, I'll only be a minute. Yeah, but Miss Lambert. Hello? Oh, hello, Judith. Yes, yes, wasn't it thrilling? Miss Lambrigger, really, I... Darling, it all started so innocently. My part, I mean. Will it be back there? Miss Lambrigger, I Maybe. have... Uh, Philip, I'll be uh, with you in a minute. Oh. Uh, Philip, who? Why, the detective, the one I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier. A long minute, I'm sure. <laughs> Goodbye, girl. <laughs> Get outside, the silence was deafening. And then I remembered that I still had a client up on Roxbury Drive who I had to see. And that there were automobiles to be exchanged, and maybe, if I could find them, some right words to say to a girl who had a very rough night. So I started driving that way, slowly. But ten minutes later, when I was halfway there, I stopped, turned around, and headed back for 310 North Normandy. And my 38 that I'd forgotten after a handful of policemen had finished examining it. It wasn't until I was at Agatha Lambrigger's front door again that I realized something more important. Well, then this Odom, this killer, grabbed me as a shield, Judith, and told Marlowe he had guts enough. <laughs> guts were his word, my dear. Yes, well, I could get my gun another day. Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and star, Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Lois Corbett, Lorette Philbrandt, Lynn Allen, Peter Leeds, and John Stevenson. The special music is by Richard O'Rant. Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It began as the threat of a beating that journeyed into murder with a brown-eyed blonde, a jovial hippopotamus, and a tough ex-soldier of fortune. All complicating the problem. Until I got next to the key man. Will you be listening when $51,000 go on the block during Sing It Again tonight? 26000 in fabulous prizes for solving the mystery of the Phantom Voice. And additional 25000 in cold, hard cash for answering only one more question about the Phantom. There's many another prize, too, for unriddling the smart, tuneful little riddle songs that keep singing again, moving at a terrific clip for the hour that it's on the air. It'll be here a little later on most of these same CBS network stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> Thank you.
The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The makers of Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets bring you another adventure of Sherlock Holmes with Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes and Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson. A cold is a miserable thing. A cold may become a dangerous thing. Even a so-called light cold can take a serious turn. Be prompt, be decisive in your treatment of a cold. At the very first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets quickly check the symptoms of a cold, quickly relieve the distress of a cold. They give you speedy results, which are very important. Don't monkey around when you can get such a dependable preparation as Grove's bromoquinine tablets. And now, here we are again on our usual visit to Dr. Watson. He's waiting for us in his study. A cheerful blaze crackling on the hearth. I'm very relieved to see you, Mr. Manning. Hasn't the weather been atrocious today? I was beginning to wonder if you'd be able to get here tonight through all this fog. Yes, it certainly is what you Londoners call a regular pea super. Yes, <laughs> indeed. It reminds me of the adventure of the missing submarine plans. A case that was solved in the underground. Underground? What you Americans call a, a subway. Yes, but what has a solution in a subway got to do with a foggy night? Well, you see, the affair started in weather exactly like this. It was the third week in November, the year 1895, to be exact. On Monday, a dense yellow fog had settled down upon London. On Thursday, it was still there, thicker and, and murkier than ever. At first, Holmes had turned his nervous energy to cross-indexing his huge reference books. But when, after pushing our breakfast chairs back for the the fourth morning, we saw the greasy brown swirl still drifting past the windows, Holmes's patience snapped. Holmes, if you must pace around in circles, I wish you'd change directions now and then. You're, you're making me dizzy. Bah! It's inexcusable, Watson. Inexcusable. No initiative. No imagination. Nothing ever gets done. If you're alluding to the inactivity in this last session of Parliament, my dear Holmes... I'm not speaking of our lawmakers, Watson, but of our lawbreakers. The London criminal is certainly a dull fellow. What makes you say that? Well, look out of the window. Ideal weather for committing a crime. The criminal advances and his intended victim practically unseen. He pounces! And disappears into thin air. <laughs> there have been numerous petty thefts, ah, I believe. Petty, petty thefts, pickpockets, ragamuffins. What's the country coming to? Now, if I were a criminal, Watson... Well, I, for one, would move to America. <laughs> oh, hello, hello. Mrs. Hudson's knocking. Excited. What's up, I wonder? What is it? Oh, a telegram for me. Uh, yes, sir. Very well, thank you. Oh, well, what's it say? Oh, wait until I open it, can't you? Ah, dear me, what next? Most unusual, Watson, most unusual. What's most unusual, Watson? What's it, sir? Well, it's from my brother, Mycroft. You remember him. He helped us solve the case of the Greek interpreter. He's coming here. Why not? What's so phenomenal about that? Why not? Why not, indeed? It's as startling as it would be to meet a tram car coming down a country lane. Yes, yes, now I come to think of it. uh, Mycroft is rather like a tram car. His rails lead from his Pall Mall lodgings to the Diogenes Club in Whitehall. That's his circle. I wonder what upheaval could have derailed him. Doesn't the telegram explain? It says, uh, must see you about Cadogan West coming at once. Cadogan West? Doug and where? Why, that's the young chap who's found dead in the underground on Tuesday morning. I remember reading about it in the papers. Oh? The young man had apparently fallen out of a train and, and killed himself. He hadn't been robbed and there was no reason to suspect violence. Quite an uninteresting case, if I remember correctly. And yet, it's serious enough to cause Mycroft to alter his habits. No, Watson, this must be an extraordinary event. Uh, do you recall any other facts about the affair? Yes, I come to think of it, there was one unusual bit about who came out of the inquest. They were unable to ascertain at what point he entered the train, because his ticket was missing. Strange. But articles were found on the body. Oh, two pounds fifteen, I believe it was, a checkbook and... Oh, yes, 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 two dress circle tickets for the Woolwich Theatre, dated for that evening. Theatre tickets, eh? Then it wasn't suicide. 
man doesn't procure theatre tickets for the evening on which he intends to end his life. Anything else? A small packet of technical papers. Technical papers? What kind of technical papers? The, new, the newspapers didn't say. Ah, as serious as that. What did the young man do? Where was he employed? He was a clerk at Woolwich Arsenal. Ah, government employee. There we have it, Watson. British government, Woolwich Arsenal, technical papers. That's why Mycroft is involved in this affair. I don't understand. No, I suppose not. Watson, have I ever told you what Mycroft is? Your brother, of course. Oh, no, 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 Watson. Do you have to be so dense? I mean, do you know what he does? Hmm? I seem to have some vague recollection that you once told me that he'd held some small office under the British government. It would be more accurate to say, in a way, that he is the British government. What? His position is unique. He made it for himself. As the tidiest and most orderly brain of any man alive, with a great capacity for storing facts and giving them the proper interpretation. The conclusions of every government department are passed on to him. He's the central exchange, the clearing house. Again and again, his word has decided the national policy. He thinks of nothing else. Nothing else can lure him from his contemplations. And yet he's coming here. Yes, Jupiter is descending on us today. What on earth can have a uh, happen? Uh, Watson, that sounds suspiciously like a bad pun. Ah, here he is, if I'm not mistaken, to speak for himself. Come in, come in. Hello, Mycroft. What's up? What's up? You look flustered. Most annoying business, Sherlock. Most annoying. You know how I dislike altering my habits. Extremely awkward for me to come away from the office, particularly with Siam in his present state. Oh, dear me. Yeah, sit down, Mycroft. Sit down. Uh, you know Watson, of course. Yes, how of course. Do I'm trying to find a chair that I can trust to hold me. Yeah, I'd better take the sofa. You certainly haven't got any thinner. I've never seen the Prime Minister so upset. As for the Admiralty, it's buzzing like an upset beehive. You know anything about the case? Uh, Watson's just been telling me what was in the newspapers. Uh, just what were the technical papers found on the body? Sherlock, for the love of heaven, not so loud. Those papers which the wretched youth had in his pocket were none other than the plans of the Bruce Partington submarine. Oh? The submarine which would completely revolutionize naval warfare. The most important papers in our government archives. Under no circumstances could they be removed from the office. Even the chief constructor of the Navy was forced to go to Woolwich if he desired to consult them. And yet we find them in the pockets of a dead junior clerk in the heart of London. Yeah, from an official point of view, it's deplorable, my dear Mycroft. Simply deplorable. You may laugh, Sherlock, but this country won't be safe until they are recovered. But I thought you said that they were found in the pocket of this chap, Cadogan West. Ten papers taken from Woolwich. Seven were found in the pockets of Cadogan West. Three are still missing, the three essential ones. To recover those three papers is imperative. The peace of Europe depends on... Mm, nice little problem, eh, Watson? Why did Cadogan West take the papers? How did he die? How did his body reach the place where it was found? And where are the missing papers? Find the answer to those questions, Sherlock, and you'll have done your country an invaluable service. Oh, why don't you solve it yourself, Mycroft? I believe you could. Mm, possibly. But it's a question of digging out details. Give me the details and I can give you the solution from an armchair. No, when it comes to running about and cross-questioning railway guards and lying on one's face with a lens to one's eye. <laughs> no, no, that's not my major. <laughs> Besides, your uh, your figure prevents your taking such an undignified position, eh? <laughs> Very well. Leave that part of it was, eh, Watson? <laughs> that's you are. <laughs> Good. I've got a cab waiting outside to take the place where the body was found. I can give you the details on the way. <laughs> Now, Mycroft, who was the official guardian of these famous papers? No less a personage than Sir James Walter, a gentleman who's grown grey in the service. His patriotism is beyond suspicion. A uh, bachelor, if I'm not mistaken, lives with his brother. Yes. He was the house of Admiral Sinclair at Barclay Square during the whole of the evening when this accident occurred. The Admiral vouches for him. He's one of the two who have the only keys to save. And his key was with him all evening? Right. His key, the key to the building, the key to the room. Hmm. Who was the man with the other key? The senior clerk, Mr. Sidney Johnson. Man of 40, married, silent, morose, with an excellent service record. Any alibi? He too had his key with him and seems to have spent the evening playing a game of drafts with a green grocer around the corner from his lodgings. Of course, he has only the word of this green grocer to back him oh, up. Oh, come, come, my dear Mycroft. No class discriminations, please. The word of a green grocer is often just as good as that of an admiral. But what about Cadogan West? He had a good reputation. A bit hot-headed, but straight and honest. At least everyone thought so. He was next to Sidney Johnson at the office. 
His duties brought him into daily personal contact with the plans. No one else ever had the handling of them. Oh, it's perfectly clear. He must have taken... Ah, oh, not so fast, Watson. Not so fast. Who locked them up that night? Mr. Sidney Johnson. Ah. They were of value, commercially, I mean. Oh, yes. There's no doubt that West could have got several thousands for them very easily. And yet, only a small amount of money was found on the body. Perhaps the buyer took it back after he'd murdered West. Ah, what puzzles me is, how did West obtain possession of those papers? To do so, he must have had a false key. Several false keys, Sherlock. He had to open the building and the room as well. Oh, well, well, well. Several false keys, then. Let me see, let me see. Suppose West did take the papers and went into town. And on the way back to Woolwich, where he is hoping to replace the papers, he is killed and thrown from the train. But the spot where the body was found is considerably past the station for London Bridge, which is the route to Woolwich. Ah, it's interesting. Also, if young West did make an appointment with some foreign agent to sell the papers that night, why didn't he keep the evening clear? Why buy two theater tickets? Exactly. Furthermore, he actually escorted his fiancée halfway there before he disappeared. A blind. That's what it looks like to me. Why did he take the papers at all? Why not copy them out in the office and sell the copies? He certainly had plenty of opportunity to do so. And why the absence of his underground ticket? Perhaps the ticket would have shown us which station was near the agent's house. So the murderer destroyed it. Good, Watson. Very good. <laughs> and yet... I wonder. Huh? Well, here's the underground station. The railway authorities have sent a man round to show you the exact place where the body was found. You won't change your mind and come with us? Well, crawling round that black hole on my hands and knees is <laughs> not very likely. Well, I shall expect a report on your efforts this evening. Uh, never expect too much, Mycroft. Never expect too much. <laughs> Before we follow Holmes and Watson into the mazes of the London subway system, I have a word of advice. Every year, colds cause a lot of sickness. Every year, they cause a lot of expense and time lost from work. Always regard a cold seriously. Always treat it earnestly. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are famous relief for the distress of a cold. Their efficacy has been fully established. Bromoquinine tablets go right to work on a cold symptom. They don't waste any time. They don't pull any punches. They quickly relieve the misery of a cold. They help reduce the fever of a cold. Thousands of people keep bromoquinine tablets handy all winter. Thousands of people depend on them as their relief for colds. No other preparation enjoys greater confidence than bromoquinine tablets. Follow the example of millions, and at the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Get them at any drugstore, a few cents a box. Ask specifically for Grove, G-R-O-V-E-S, Bromo, B-R-O-M-O, Quinine, Q-U-I-N-I-N-E, Grove's Bromo Quinine Tablets. This way, sir. Step right along the tracks, if it isn't safe. Supposing a train should come shooting round that curve. Oh, that's all right, sir. There won't be another for five minutes anyway. Here we are, sir. This is where they found the body. Right here alongside the rails. Lying on its face, it was. Mm, spooky old place, eh, Holmes? Like the catacombs, only without the skeleton. No. Yeah. Anything in his hands when they found him? No, sir. Were they clenched? Or spread out as if he were protecting himself? No, sir. They was what you might call relaxed. Ah. What time did all this happen? Well, sir, the train he was hoisted out of, as near as we can figure, passed along here about midnight on Monday. All the carriages have been examined for signs of violence, I suppose. They didn't find nothing, not even the missing ticket. There was a passenger to Allgate on the ordinary train, about 11.40 it was. He said he'd heard a heavy thud, like something striking the line, just before the train reached this station. But it was so foggy, he said he was blessed if he could see what it was. Oh, What's the matter? What are you staring at? The curve, Watson. The what curve of it? Of the rails. What of it? What do, you, what do you mean? I suppose there aren't many curves as abrupt as this. No, sir, I can't say as there is. What have curves got to do with it? Oh, an indication, Watson, merely an indication. Hmm, unique. Perfectly unique. And yet, why not? I don't see any indications of bleeding on the line. No, sir, there wasn't any to speak of. But I understand there was a considerable wound. The bone was crashed right enough. Holmes! 
You hear that? It's a train. It's, it's coming this way. Run, sir. Run for your life. Yes, yes, but where? Uh, up ahead. There's a place where the train switches off. Run what? To run. It's just around the curve. Well, we'll never make it. We, yes, we will. Faster, faster. Uh, there's the switch up ahead. Come on. Here comes the train now. We'll make it. We'll make it. Ah, Justin. Watson, for the love of heaven. You're on the wrong track. <laughs> Well, that was a narrow escape, Holmes. I, I must say my knees are so shaking. Look at the shoulder of my coat where you pull it there. Lucky thing for you that I did. Where are we off to now? And then this fog. Yes, it's a nice afternoon. Suppose we pay a few calls. I think Sir James Walter claims our first attention. After that, we might drop in on Miss Westbury. Miss Westbury? Who's she? She is Cadogan West's fiancée and the last person to see him alive. Holmes, we seem to be going around in circles. We've accomplished absolutely nothing so far except to get to, to get ourselves nearly annihilated in the underground. After all, it's perfectly obvious that the young man had a quarrel with someone, in all probability to the agent, to whom he sold the papers, and got himself thrown out of the railway carriage for his pay. I disagree with you, my dear Watson. His body fell from the roof of the carriage where it had been placed. Cadogan West met his death elsewhere. The roof of the train? Consider the facts, Watson. A. The curve in the tracks. The body is found at a spot where the train pitches and sways as it comes around the points. B. There's no ticket. C. There were no signs of bleeding on the line because the body had bled elsewhere. Of course. Everything fits together, but... But where was the body placed on the train? I think I can make a fair guess of that, my dear Watson. Ah. Oh, here we are. This is the famous official villa of Sir James Walter. And that, if I'm not mistaken, is his brother, Colonel Valentine, just coming out of the house. What's the matter with the man? He, he looks positively haunted. Oh, uh, pardon me, Colonel Valentine, but can you tell me if, uh, if Sir James is at home? Sir James, sir? Sir James is dead. Good heavens, dead. He died this morning. It's terrible. Terrible. How did he die? Oh, it's this horrible scandal. My brother, sir, was very sensitive of his honor. He couldn't survive the disgrace to his department. It broke his heart. Pardon me, gentlemen, I must go. It, it broke his heart. Most appalling development. Eh, Holmes? Mm. I wonder if his death was natural, or if the poor fellow killed himself. Yes? Will you tell Miss Westbury that Mr. Sherlock Holmes would like to see her? Oh, please come in, gentlemen. I'm Violet Westbury, Mr. Holmes. I've been expecting you ever since I heard you had taken the case. Please be seated. Well, thank you. Oh, Mr. Holmes, we, we must save his good name. He couldn't have done it. Cadogan was the most chivalrous patriotic gentleman on earth. He, he couldn't have done it. He would have cut his right hand off rather than sell a state secret. But the facts, my dear Miss Westbury. I admit I can't explain them. Uh, was he in need of money? No, Mr. Holmes. His need was simple and his salary very good. He'd saved several hundred pounds. We were to be married at the new year. I see. Had you noticed any signs of mental excitement? Why, well, I... Well, that is... Uh, come, Miss Westbury, be frank with us. Yes, Mr. Holmes. Well, that night, I... I had a feeling that there was something on his mind. Mm -hmm. Tell us about it, will you? We were on the way to the theater. It was a foggy night, you remember? We were walking slowly. Our way took us close to his office. Cadogan seemed thoughtful and worried. <laughs> Darling, what's the matter? You haven't said a word for the last five minutes. Have I said or done something? Of course not, silly. It's just that I've got something on my mind. Well, why not tell me about it? Perhaps I can help. It's no use, Vi. It's too serious for me to talk about, even to you. You know, sometimes, Caddy, I feel just the least little bit jealous of that old job of yours. When you're cooped up in that building all day. Oh, now you're not going to be jealous of a building. <laughs> well, not really. But it is funny to think of a husband having secrets he can't tell his wife. Mighty important secrets, I can promise you. There's one in particular that any foreign spy would pay good money to get hold of. How thrilling. Well, I don't know. They're awfully slack about some things over there in that building, Violet. What's too slack? It would be too confounded easy for a trader to get his hands on those plans. What plans? Oh, never mind, darling. I guess I'm getting a bit melodramatic. There's something been worrying me. Hello, what's that? What's what? Over there, that shadow moving along the side of the building. It's a man. So that's it. I always suspected... Oh, what's the matter? You're so excited. What's wrong? Stay here, Violet. There's something I have to find out. Stay here. 
I waited and waited, but he never returned. Oh, Mr. Holmes, if you could only save his honor, it, it meant so much to him. We shall do our best, Miss Westbury. This, um, this shadow, this man moving along the building, did you see it too? I think I did, Mr. Holmes. But the night was so foggy, I can't be sure. But there must have been a man. Another man. It, it couldn't have been Cadogan. Surely character goes for something. Let us hope so. Come along, Watson. We must return home. I'm expecting an answer to some telegrams I sent Mycroft earlier this afternoon. We've done enough for one day. <laughs> Holmes, where have you been all day? You left this morning before I was up. Now you've come home with your towel awry, your suit torn, and as ravenous as a wolf. <laughs> yes, I've had a bit of exercise, my dear Watson. Uh, pass me the tongue, will you? It would have done you good to go along. Yes, what were you doing? Investigating the premises inhabited by foreign spies known to have been in London on last Monday. Mycroft sent me a list of them. Took a bit of doing, too. Climbing walls, breaking into cellars, prowling around rooftops. Well? I discovered... There was only one residence which had the uh, proper facilities for disposing of West's body after the murder. Well, whose residence was that? It belonged to a Hugo Oberstein. The address is 13 Caulfield Gardens, Kensington. The gentleman himself has departed for Europe. Gone, has he? If he took the plans with him, it's, it's too late. Not necessarily, Watson. What can we do now? We're going to keep a rendezvous with the gentleman who stole and sold those plans. The assignation will take place at Mr. Oberstein's house this evening at nine. What the deuce are you talking about? Uh, these newspaper clippings. I found them in the drawer of Hugo Oberstein's desk. Read them. Hmm. The Daily Telegraph agony column. Hmm. The first one says, Two complex for description must have full report. Terms agreed. Two payable when goods delivered. Signed, Piero. Piero, indeed. Sounds like a Mardi Gras. Now, read on, Watson. Read on. Second goes, Matter presses must withdraw for unless contract completed. Piero again. And the last, dated Monday... The day the crime is committed. Monday night after nine, two taps, payment in hard cash. I say, do you think it was a submarine that, that the plans that, that he was buying? I'm almost positive. And Puro was Oberstein himself. But we'll find out for certain this evening. I've invited the gentleman who sold the papers to meet us. But how? I don't understand. I'm this advertisement in today's Daily Telegraph. Tonight, same hour, same place, two taps, vitally important. Your own safety at stake. Signed, Puro, as usual. By George, if he answers that, we, we've got him. Unless we're too late. Come along, Watson. There's no time to lose. You can take this passage, uh, package for a change. I'll, uh, I've been carrying it around all day. What's in it? Oh, just a jemmy, a dark lantern, a chisel and a revolver. Nice equipment for a respectable citizen to be carrying about the streets of London. I must... Yeah, you know, Watson, there are times when I suspect we aren't quite respectable. <laughs> Here we are. This is Caulfield Gardens. Thank heavens, it's so foggy. I shouldn't like to be caught in the act of housebreaking. Yeah. Over this wall, Watson. With a window we can easily pry open in the back. Scale that wall? Oh, come on, hurry up, hurry up. There's no time to lose. Here, here. I'll give you a boost. Mm. Come on, up here. Oh, uh, that's it. Look out, here I come. I must say, Holmes, you're as agile as a cat. <laughs> it's uncanny. This is the window. Light the lantern and give me the jimmy. One. Two. The underground runs right past here, almost on the level of these windows. I could reach out and touch it. Yes, quite convenient, wasn't it? It was here the body was placed on the roof of the train. Look out of this, uh, look on this windowsill. Hmm? You can see the soot is blurred where they rested the body. And here, look here, look, look. This brown stain is blood. Mm, nasty, eh, Holmes? Let's, let's get on to the house. Very well, then. Come along, come along. The window's open. Easy, easy, don't break the glass. Supposing Oberstein should happen to return home. Well, we must take our chances in this business. Come along, Watson, come along. My visitor will expect to be let in by the front door. I wish these stairs didn't, didn't squeak so. Nine o'clock. We can expect him at any moment now. You take your position on one side of the door. I'll be on the other. So we can pounce on him when he enters. I'll throw my greatcoat over his head. Oh, well, I, I wish he'd hurry. Shh, Watson. What if, what if he doesn't come? There he is. Ready now. I'll open the door. You wanted me? No, you don't. Oh. Take that! Brother, what the... Easy, Watson, easy. All right, Holmes, I've got him. Well, let's take a look at our catch. 
Take the overcoat away, Watson. Right. Hi. Oh, it's Colonel Valentine Walk. Walter. Sir James's brother. Quite. Well, sir, what have you to say for yourself? Why did you steal the Bruce Partington plans? Who are you? What do you know about this? I am Sherlock Holmes, and I know everything. Oh, this is terrible. I'm lost. I didn't realize their importance until my brother killed himself. But I need is the money. I had to have it. Oberstein offered to give it to me if I'd let him see the plans. So you took an impression of your brother's key, opened the safe, and procured the papers. Cadogan West saw you leaving the building, followed you here, and you killed him. No, I didn't do that. I swear I didn't do it. No? Then perhaps you'd better tell us who did murder Cadogan West and placed him on the roof of the railway carriage. I'll tell you. I promise you I will. I did the rest. I confess it, but, but not that. Very well, then. How did it happen? I got the papers, as you've discovered. Made my way through the fog until I reached the door. Once or twice, I fancied I was being followed. I could hear footsteps on the pavement behind me. Colonel Walder? Yes? You have the papers? Yes. Let me in, quick. I think someone's been following me. Yes, it's me. Yes. You can't do this, Valentine. It's treason. Oh, All right, do you hear? No, you can't sell the papers... Papa Oberstein, he knows how to use a blackjack, eh? You, you, you've killed him. So? It's murder. I'm going to get out of this. Oh, no. I think different. You will come in here if you do not wish to taste a blackjack, too. But I... I... But... That is better. Oh, what can we do? They'll find the body. I have an idea. First, I look at those papers. I take the ones I want and the rest. You put in the pocket of this foolish young man. And then we give him a nice ride on top of the underground train, no? He will be the guilty one. Who will ever know? What a thoroughly unpleasant gentleman. What a pity that he got away with the papers, Dr. Watson. Oh, but he didn't. Oberstein had left a Paris forwarding address with Colonel Walters. That gentleman sent him a letter dictated by Holmes saying that he had discovered that one essential detail in the plans was missing, and that he had procured a tracing which would make it complete for a price. And did Oberstein swallow the bait? <laughs> did he swallow it? He was arrested as he got off the boat at Folkestone. Some weeks later, I learned, incidentally, that Holmes had spent a day at Windsor Castle and returned with a remarkably fine emerald type in. When I asked him where he got it, he answered it was just a small present from a certain gracious little old lady for whom he'd been able to do a... A small th favor. Yes, and I think I can guess the lady's august name. Elementary, my dear Mr. Manning, elementary. I see. Ladies and gentlemen, in just a moment, Dr. Watson will be back to tell us about next week's story. In the meantime, let us repeat. Watch out for colds. At the first sign of a cold, take Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Bromoquinine tablets are made especially for the relief of colds. In other words, they're specialized medication, and that's what you want. Yes, at the very first sneeze or sniffle, go right to your druggist and get a package of Grove's bromoquinine tablets. Now, Dr. Watson, next week? Next week, I think I'll tell you the story of the lion's mane. The lion's mane? What was that, Dr. Watson? Well, the answer to that question, Mr. Manning, almost stumped Sherlock Holmes himself. Suffice it to say that they were the last words gasped out by a dying man as he lay writhing in agony on the sands of the Sussex coast. You have been listening to a Sherlock Holmes adventure Adapted from Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's story The Bruce Partington Plan With Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes And Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson The dramatization was by Edith Miser This program is presented from Hollywood Every week at this same time By the makers of Grove's Bromoquinine Tablets Quick relief for colds This is Knox Manning speaking Get this and get it straight Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. This one began as the threat of a beating that turned into murder with a brown-eyed blonde, a jovial hippopotamus, and a tough ex-soldier of fortune, all complicating the problem until I got next to the key man. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, Stardust Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Key Man. A 
Along about dusk, Hollywood Boulevard is some desolate place between the end of work and the start of play. And about as boisterous as taps. So except for a sallow-faced masher leaning against the nearby storefront warming up his evening leer, I was alone on a lot of fancy pavement when I walked up to the box office of the Newsreel Theater near Cahuenga. Paid my 40 cents admission, tax included, and started inside. Where, of all places, I was to meet my new client, one Mark Hummel. He'd called my office at 6.35, and in a tight voice, fringed with fear, urged me to find him in the last row, last seat, far left of the Boulevard Cinema at once, if I could use a $50 bill. It was exactly a quarter to seven when I crossed the length of lobby to aisle four and entered the theater proper, which was almost empty. It was two minutes after that before I could see well enough to tell that the man all alone in the aforementioned seat, who wore white French cuffs protruding out of gray flannel, a pleated frown and not paying any attention to the bathing beauties on the screen who were water skiing through Florida's Cypress Gardens, had to be my client. I eased in and sat down next to him. I could see he was watching me out of the corner of his eye. Marla? Yeah. My plane leaves for New York in half an hour. Watch it, honey. You ought to see that I'm on it and in good health. Who wants it otherwise? Barney Kovac, an ex-soldier of fortune who thinks with his fists. He works a straw boss in a garage where they park cars. He's threatened to kill me with his bare hands. Why? What'd you do? Well, nothing, nothing. It was perfectly legitimate. Mm-hmm. He had a chance to get out of Hippo Link's place. Uh, get out of whose place? Hippo Link. Oh. Uh, Kovac had a chance to buy a location of his own. But you got there first. Look, Mr. Hummer, why don't we continue this in the lounge? It's quieter out there. Uh, yes, with a few people. Yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> oh, this is better. Now, come on, we can talk over here. Hmm? So, uh, you beat Kovac out of the property he wanted. Then what happened? And when he found out, he went crazy. <laughs> he swore I bribed the real estate broker, high pressured the owner, mm. all that kind of wild talk, you know. Mm. Now, Marla, the place I bought from under him is a good investment. Oh, yes, yes. But chicken feed compared to the deal I'm going to close in New York tomorrow. <laughs> if I get there. So for 50 bucks, I'm to see that you do just that, huh? Yes, but I've already uh, made your work easier. I told Hippo Link. Uh, all 300 pounds of it. No. Oh. I told him in a loud voice this afternoon that I was going out of town by train at seven tonight, uh, figuring, of course, that Kovac, who's nearby, but wouldn't do anything with people around, would uh, overhear me. Mm-hmm. And your connection with Hippo is what? I parked my car in his garage. Period. Anyhow, at 5.30 tonight, I drove downtown to the Union Station. I left my car on the lot there and went inside. After which you doubled back, got outside into a cab and headed for here in a comfortable wait until plane time, which you're afraid might not fool anybody, including the tough Mr. Kovac, since you've hired me, right? Uh, yes, that's right. I never caught sight of him trailing me, Milo, and uh, frankly, well, I'm... I'm afraid of him. Can you understand him? Sure. Fear is always understandable. Well, what's the itinerary, Mr. Hummel? Here to the airport? Uh, no, 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 no. First to my house. I still have a bag to pack. I'll take a cab. You follow in your car. Then wait outside my place. That's 4100 Fountain. And just below La Siena. Yeah, I know. Yes. Now, uh, when I get back into the cab, you follow again. Until I'm safe aboard the plane. Yes. Now, here. Here's your money. Right. Anything else? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you carry a gun, Mr. Hummel? Ordinarily, no. But tonight, Marla, yes. It's a service gun. 45. And believe me, if I have to use it, I will. Now, let's get out of here. Quickly. I was 20 minutes playing follow the leader up through Hollywood to Fountain Avenue as far as the neat cube of stucco that was number 4100, where I parked behind the taxi lights out and waited until I heard a frightened scream from what had to be Mark Hummel. I piled out of my car and darted past the cabbie who said he had enough trouble in his life and ran up the front steps and into the house where in the light of a single overturned lamp in the bedroom, I found my client face down in a widening pool of his own blood. I started for the rest of the rooms, but then the sound of a motor roaring out of the alley behind the house told me I was wasting my time. When I returned to the bedroom, one glance at Hummel's still form said that the man who had been afraid for his life only 30 minutes ago was already very dead. Next to his body was the 45 he never got to use, and alongside of that, the miniature crystal ball splattered with blood, but it killed him. There was a key which I found fit the front door, lying in the middle of the carpet. The drawers and closets were all open, as well as his half-packed suitcase. It was a good time to call the police. Homicide. 
Hi, Detective Lieutenant Matthews speaking. Marlowe, Lieutenant. I'm at 4100 Fountain and standing next to a man named Mark Humble. used to be a client. He's dead, Matthews. Murdered. Oh, any idea who did it, Phil? Well, I got an idea. It might be a lot of muscle called Bonnie Kovac, who works in a garage on Santa Monica Boulevard. You sure it wasn't a robbery killing? No. Well, you know, we've had a lot of second storage jobs there, about every three weeks in that neighborhood. I'm not sure of anything yet, but you see, I was high... Uh Uh-oh, company, Lieutenant. I'll catch up to you later. Mark, I... Oh, I beg your pardon. Is is it Mr. Hummel in? Yes and no. Did he expect you? No, he didn't. Who are you? Philip Marlowe. Well, is Mark in or not? Yes, he's in. You'll find him in here, if you insist. Oh, thank you. I'm sorry I bit your head off, but what I have to... Oh, no. He's dead? Shot with that? No, no, it's his own gun. He was beaten to death with that glass ball there. Oh. That key is his, too. It fits the front door. I already tried it, and then I put it back when I found it, since the police appreciate neatness on the scene. But that doesn't make sense. Mark always carried his keys in a leather case. It should be right there in his right pocket. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Out's key with a bunch of others, and, uh... Yeah, this one matches the one on the floor. How'd you know about this? Oh. I'm an old friend of Mark's, Marlowe. You'd have to be. What were you in such a hurry to tell him? I I don't remember. Maybe I can help you. Maybe it was a little message you were going to deliver from Bonnie Kovac. I don't know anyone by that name. And since that leaves us with very little in common, Marlowe, I think I'll leave with only this forty-five here for companionship. Oh, fine. Now, get over there against the wall and turn your back. Well, go on. Now what? And don't move until you hear me drive away. Or your health will suddenly be very, very poor. Good night. When Little Red Riding Hood slammed out of the place, I knew I could either follow her or wait for Matthews to siren up to the front door and then tell all. One last look around the room, including the key in the middle of the carpet, made me change my mind again. If the key could be traced, it might be a definite link to Kovac, so... I headed for Hippo Link's garage on Santa Monica Boulevard in the hope of further information about a hot-tempered man who worked there. Less than five minutes later, I was walking down a cement ramp that dropped from the street level into an acre of underground parking space filled with a crowd of heavy with chromium cars that belonged to the fashionable neighborhood nearby. Hippo himself was a perspiring oval, approximately 5'8", measured in any direction. With tiny eyes, tiny nose, and a dozen chins that danced when he laughed, which seemed to be always. He was standing next to a pickup truck marked Ace Battery Shop, oh, talking to the driver. Hit, huh? And because of that, you want more money for him, huh? <laughs> that, I suppose, is easy to get. Now look, Hippo, I... Listen, Plume, I won't pay any more. My overhead's too high already. So if you can't get them for me at the same price, forget the whole deal. Besides, I don't like the way you do business at all. Meaning what? Meaning that when I give you an order, Plume, I want it delivered to me in person, not to just any flunky that's standing around. Okay, okay. That was a slip. It won't happen again. Yeah, not twice it won't. (laughs) Goodbye, Plume. I got customers. Can I help you, mister? Maybe. I'm looking for Bonnie Kovac. Is he around? Uh, No. Why? What do you want him for? Maybe murder. What? Bonnie, he killed someone? Wait a minute. Plume, I said goodbye. Go on, beat it. Okay, okay, Hippo. I'll see you around. Let's, let's go in the office here, Mr. A little quieter. Yeah. Sit down. All right. You a cop? No, private detective. Name's Marlow, Hippo. Marlow, huh? Mm-hmm. <laughs> never heard of you. You know, but then uh, I, I never heard of a lot of people, huh? <laughs> mm, that's right, Hippo. People like, for instance, Mark Hummel. <laughs> Uh, why him, Marlow? He was the one Kovac killed. Well, 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 what do you know? Doesn't seem to break you up. Why should it? Hummel was a louse, Marlow. Everybody said so. Of course, I didn't know him personally, except a joke with him when he brought his car in. You know, a little laugh goes a long way with some guys. Eh? Mm. <laughs> Tell me, Hippo, did you know that Hummel was going out of town? Yeah, he told me this afternoon. <laughs> Should have gone yesterday, huh? <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so you don't like jokes. I can play it straight. What do you want? For an opener, this. A tall blonde with brown eyes and a pretty face who knows how to handle a forty-five as well as conversation walked in here. Would you know her? Am I? Could be Rhonda Beaumont, Barney's girl. She lives in a plush apartment over at 38 Sweetser Drive, just above the Strip. How does she figure? Probably great in a Catalina swimsuit, but in this deal, I'm not sure. 
She might have put me on the right track by setting me straight about a key to Hummel's apartment that I found next to his body. Wasn't his. A key? Hmm. There, yeah, the design on it, near the top, the round part was like a fancy figure eight. Mean anything to you? Not being a locksmith, no. <laughs> anything else? Yeah. Where can I find Barney Kovac? How would I know? He quit at five today, just like he does every day. And I quit at nine, Marlow, which happens to be right now. So, goodbye, mister. Just like that? Yeah, just like that. You see, if I work late, Marlow, I gotta pay myself overtime. <laughs> that hurts, because I can't afford it. <laughs> see what I mean, boy? <laughs> I was out on the street and behind the wheel of my car before I saw the man in the back seat who had a snub-nosed 38 leveled at my hairline. He looked rugged enough to be no one else but Barney Kovac. Drive, Marlo. Straight to the corner of Melrose and Orange Drive. I live over a store there, and it's quiet. So we can talk without being disturbed. Come on, drive! <laughs> Right ahead of you, Marlo. One with a closed transom. Keep walking. And when I get there? Then you'll go inside, sit down, and rest while you listen. To what? To the truth, Marlo. I've been following you long enough tonight to know that you're off your rocker. You see, fella, I didn't kill Hummel. Yeah, I know. He's double-jointed. It was suicide. Slugged himself from behind. All right, cut was... it. Yeah, here's a key. Open up. Okay. Hey, you made a mistake, Kovac. Wrong key. What are you talking about? Let me see that. Sure. With pleasure! <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> now that I got your gun, bud, try it yourself. Am mind, Kovac. Close quarters make me nervous. You're making a mistake, Marlo. Yeah, yeah, sure I am. The guys who are off their rocker always do, remember? Now get over there in that chair and behave while I use your phone. Marlo, don't move or I'll kill you. Hippo. Barney, take the gentleman's gun. It's heavy for him. Mm, sure. Here, now here, boy. Here's some money. Get clear of L.A. till this thing's all cleaned up. You're in a bad spot. I know, but I didn't kill Hummel, Hippo. You gotta believe me. Yeah, by all means. Barney, my boy, if you say it, I believe it. But others won't be that accommodating, I'm sure, so go on. And no matter what you do, don't worry about Marlowe. Huh? Nah, he won't be following you. <laughs> you can count on that, Barney. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, programs on a summer Sunday afternoon come to you at home, in your cars, on the beaches, and 101 other places where you are at ease. And for your leisure time listening, what is better than music? Every Sunday afternoon, CBS brings you two outstanding programs of music. Gems from the great composers played by the symphonette. And the sweet, memorable songs of the outstanding modern composers and semi-classicists sung by the choral ears. Each program is designed especially for fine summer Sunday afternoon listening. Hear both the Symphonette and the Carl Ears tomorrow afternoon on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Key Man. fists of Hippo looked like a toy as he leveled it at my chest while Kovac got away. And the fat boy kicked the door shut, leaned his ponderous 300 pounds against it, and smiled. The smile faded gradually and finally died, but the muzzle of the gun in his hand didn't so much as twitch until the battered alarm clock on the dresser had clanked off a monotonous 15 minutes. At that point, Hippo Link leaved his face up into another smile, waddled across the room, and laid the gun down on the table in front of me. Okay, Marlo, you behaved yourself real nice. Barney's got all the head start he'll need, so you can leave now. You know something, Link? You're not only fat between the sleeves, you're overweight between the ears, too. Helping a suspect escape doesn't sit well at headquarters. Now, now just a minute, boy. You're kind of jumping to conclusions, aren't you? You were putting the muscle on a friend of mine, and I helped him out. That's all that happened so far. So <laughs> you look a little silly running me in on that. But if you still want to try, boy, the... Guns right there on the table. Okay, Hippo, you win for now. But don't think I buy that silly one, two, three story of yours. May not be Peck's bad boy, but I don't see you as Sir Galahad either. 
<laughs> well, how do you put the story together then? <laughs> I don't know that that's any of your business, and even if I thought it were, I wouldn't tell you. But I'll let you in on this much. I don't know for sure that Kovac is guilty, but then I don't know for sure where you or Kovac's girl Rhonda Beaumont fit either. Mm, I wouldn't know. You said you knew her. So? You seem to think a good deal of that kid, Kovac. So? So couldn't it be possible she paid you to come up here and see that her boyfriend got away? <laughs> like you said, Marla, I don't know that it's any of your business. <laughs> How much cash does it take for you to stick your neck out as far as you have, huh? Or could it be you've got a thing going for Kovac's girl and be glad to see him out of town? <laughs> ah, you're kidding, yeah. boy. <laughs> Look, why don't you loan? What's it to you now? My client was knocked off right under my nose, remember? Now you're going to let me out of solitary? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Pick up your pistol and run. <laughs> and if you need me for any more help, why, be sure and let me know. Chippo standing in Kovacs' flat, and downstairs I stopped in a phone booth long enough to have the latest developments for what they were worth relayed to Lieutenant Matthews. And I drove out to where suites had turned straight up into the hills and parked in front of number 38, the Murrow Apartments, a terraced heap of pastel plaster and angled glass in which Rhonda Beaumont had a first floor front. I took a look at the large, private view of the city as I crossed the small, private patio and knocked on the substantial private entrance. When it cracked open, I helped it along just enough to step inside. Fast! What in the... Marlo! You will come in, won't you, whether you're asked or not? Yes, and it's sweet of you to ask me, Rhonda. Is, um... Uh, is he here? He? Hmm. In a city of four million, half of which are male, that borders on being a stupid question. But the answer is no in any case, because until you strong-armed your way in here, I was alone. I can't buy it. I figure Bonnie's the kind of a boy that would want to take stuff like you right along with him when he leaves. Bonnie leaving? Mm hmm. What are you talking about? He's running away from that mess over on Fountain. He's leaving town. You're lying. I've heard enough uh -uh. from you. Mark. I'll take the handbag, baby. Oh, you. Hmm. Heavy enough to have that cute 45 caliber compact inside, right? Okay, it's in there. Take it. I don't care. But look, Marlowe, is that the truth about Bonnie leaving town? As if you didn't know, yes. And while we're on that subject, why did you show up at Mark Hummel's place tonight? Well, I went there to warn him about Barney. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought you were in love with Kovac. I am. Do I have to draw you a picture? Barney Kovac's strong and reckless, but he was trying hard, awfully hard, to get started for himself, and then... Well, I, I used to go with Mark before I met Barney, and, and because of that, Mark deliberately beat him out of the best deal he'd ever had, the lout. Just to spite me. Well, Barney was furious, and I knew something terrible would happen if they ever got together, so so I went to tell Mark to stay out of his way, that's all. You got there a little too late, is that it? I don't know. Well, at least give me a handkerchief out of my bag, Marlo, darn it. <laughs> yeah, sure. Here, I, um... Uh... Hey, hey, these keys. Rhonda, this one, the one with the figure eight design, where'd you get it? Oh, it's my new door key. Yeah, I know, but where'd you get it? I don't know. Barney had it made for me one day while we were having lunch. Who's the guy who made it? I don't know. Where were you eating that day? Well, Hungarian place on Fairfax near Santa Monica. Well, where are you going, Marlo? Fairfax near Santa Monica. Here's your bag, Rhonda, and if you got any sense, stay put and try real hard not to shoot anybody. At least until I call. Okay. <laughs> Along, baby. Bye. <laughs> Papers, it's all over now. Paper, mister? No, thanks, kid. Tell me something. Where's a locksmith on this block? Locksmith? No, there ain't none. Oh, come on. Sure there is. A guy who makes keys. It's got to be. Think hard, will you? It's important. Think hard, he says. Look, mister, I know this whole neighborhood like the back of my own hand. No key maker. Uh-huh. Well, how about a guy who sharpens saws, scissors, things like that? Nah. Nothing like that. Hmm. We got uh, filling stations, bars, a delicatessen, drugstore... Shoemaker, dry goods store, three restaurants. One's Hungarian, that's on Fairfax. Yeah. Ace Battery Shop there across Ace the street. A toy shop. store on the corner, a lampshade battery joint. Shop. Wait a minute, hold it. Battery. Ace Battery. Plume. Uh, uh, plume. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Old man Plume owns the joint. Uh. A real sour apple, you know what I mean? Place a dump, too, but he works hard. He's probably over there right now, working in the back room. Bless you, my boy. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Yeah, 
Yeah, who is it? Customer, my battery's dead. You gotta help me. Now look, mister, my place is closed up. Come back. Hey, what is this? Sorry, Plume, but tomorrow's a long way off. This is an emergency. Now take it easy and you'll be okay. I got a job for you and it's gotta be done tonight. Well, listen, I said my place... Shut should... up. Now get this, Plume. I'm a friend of Hippo Lynx and Bonnie Kovacs. All of which makes you perfect for my job. Now, what kind of a job are you talking about? This. It's a key. Duplicated. A key? Hey, buddy, this is a battery shop. I can't make keys here. In the first place, you got to have a license. I said this was an emergency, didn't I? Get busy. With what? My fingernails? I don't know how to cut keys. Somebody's stringing you, pal, and I... Bloom, keep away from that drawer! Well, 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 well. Whole drawer full of blank keys, huh? That 38 in the drawer here must be that license you spoke of. Come on, you get up. Hey, wait, wait. Leave me, leave me alone. I, I didn't do anything. Now listen, Plume. I want one straight answer out of you. Fast. You made a delivery to Link's garage sometime today, and it wasn't batteries. Who'd you give it to? Come on. I I, I left it with Barney Kovac. He was the only one around, but it was nothing, an envelope. Yeah, full of keys. Thanks very much for your help, Plume, but I'm in a hurry. And just so I'll be sure to see you later, good night! <laughs> My car piled in and headed straight out Santa Monica for La Cienega. And when I got within sight of the dark cabinet's entrance to Hippo Link's underground storage garage, I slowed down and looked for a phone that I could use to call Matthews and still keep an eye on the garage because the way things stood now, I couldn't afford to miss a lick. But then I got a break. I decided to try a mobile gas station on the corner when the scream of a siren shoved me up against the curb and a squad car swerved out from a side street, ground to a rubble burning stop in front of the garage and disgorged Matthews himself and the driver on the double. I slammed out of my coupe and belted across the street after him. Matthews! Hey, Matthews! Hello, hello, get back! Go this way! We get Kovac corner down inside there. You're just... Now, down. wait a minute, wait a minute. Matthews, you got this deal all wrong. Oh, no, we haven't. I got two out and back. He's trapped. We'll get him... No, no, no. Right. Hold everything, Matthews. Listen to me. I'm going down there and talk to hey, him. No, I'll no, be back no. in a minute. Oh, oh, come back here, fool! Kovac! Kovac, this is Marlowe. Come on out. I got all the answers now, Barney. I just had a talk with Plume and I got a lot of truth out of him. Come on, Barney. You're not helping anything. Help! Ooh. Oh, oh. Phil. Phil, you all right? It's my shoulder, Matthews. Oh, I knew this would happen sometime. Oh. No, this oh, No, listen Please to me. Don't shoot. shoot. Don't. Look at my arm. Uh, listen, Matthews, Kovac didn't do it. What? The shot that got me came from back there on the other side. Yeah, that's it, Pete. Further back. There. There he is, Matthews. That's the boy. That's the fat guy runs this. That's joke. right. Yeah, Hippo Link. Second Lieutenant, he's your killer. Stop, Link. Stop. <laughs> I got him, Phil. He's down. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one nice thing about Hippo. You can't... You, you can't miss him. Oh, thanks. I, I... I think I better sit down a minute. Hello, Marlo. You feeling better now? Oh, great, great. Uh, you can't beat these hospital beds for comfort, Lieutenant. <laughs> I'm getting one for my apartment. You can crank it into 30 different positions, you know that? Yeah, yeah, I know. The doc says you got off with a flesh wound. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're pretty lucky, Phil. <laughs> well, I just stopped by to tell you they saved Hippo Link, so he'll have to be tried. There won't be much, though. He's already admitted everything. Well, what about Plume? Did you get anything on uh, him? Still so groggy, I hardly knew his own name when we picked him up. Yeah, it was quite a racket they had, Matthews. Yeah, smooth, smooth. Every rich customer come into Hippo's garage, left his house key with his car keys, was a cinch to be burglarized sooner or later. Yeah, Plume cuts a duplicate key, they find out when the people are away, and that's all they need. Some set up. The show backfired on him tonight. Hummel went to a lot of trouble to tell Hippo that he was leaving town at seven just to throw Bonnie off his trail. But Hippo took it as a great opening for his racket. So Hummel came home right in the middle of the burglary, and Hippo had to kill him to get out of the way. That's it? Oh, uh, by the way, hmm? it's a friend of yours, Harvey. Oh? Yeah. I'll get him. Come on in, Barney. He's feeling fine. Oh, swell. Hi, Mr. Marlowe. Hi. I guess Rhonda and I owe you quite a vote of thanks. You don't mean nothing but an explanation, Kovac. Why'd you run? Oh, I don't know. Half the way I shot my mouth off about Hummel, I figured I was hooked for sure when he turned up dead. Once I started running, I couldn't stop. Kept getting worse. Yeah, it's exactly what Hippo figured. Yeah, that's one I don't get, Marlowe. Why'd he help me in the first place? He had to, brother. Hippo knew that my best clue was an extra door key. He also knew that Plume had left a bunch of keys with you to give to him. He was sure that if we ever got together and talked about keys, he'd be stuck. 
But as it turned out, I got the same lead anyway from the key plume made for Rhonda. Uh, hey, Matthews. Yeah? Crank me up in the middle, will you? Uh, what, like this, Phil? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's perfect. <laughs> Barney, turn off that reading lamp, will you please? Sure. Yeah. Anything else, Mom? Uh, yeah, yeah. You see that no visitor sign there? Yeah. Well, just hang it on the door on your way out. <laughs> I'm here for three days, fellas. I'm gonna make the best of them. Good night, all. When they left, I nestled down to the solid comfort of clean sheets and quiet darkness. And my eyes were almost closed. When it happened, the light snapped on. A pair of efficient hands grabbed me, stabbed an inch of hypodermic needle into my right arm, jammed a cold, hard thermometer under my tongue and splashed a half a pint of icy alcohol on my back. Oh, it was awful. But when it was over, she looked back from the door and smiled before she went out. A red-headed nurse and very pretty. <laughs> Only then did I notice the set of keys she'd forgotten on my medicine table. One was thick with a figure eight design. It was her door key. And for just a moment, I wondered foolishly if I could get a hold of Mr. Plume again some way. For just a few minutes. <laughs> ah, cut it out, Marlowe. Go to sleep. <laughs> Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Vivi Janis, Parley Bear, Jack Moyles, Howard McNear, Shep Menken, and Don Oreck. Detective Lieutenant Matthews is played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard Orant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... It was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces, but a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe meant a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse, because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. Most of us think we are free of tuberculosis, yet how many of us make sure with periodic chest x-rays that we have no symptoms of this dread disease? Anyone can have TB without being aware of it. In the early stages, there are often no signs, and yet it is in this early stage when it is most important for the disease to be detected. So remember, TB can be cured if you catch it in time. Make an appointment for that chest x-ray immediately. This is Roy Rowan speaking. 10 p.m. B-U-L-O-V-A, Bulova Watch Time. For supreme accuracy, expert design, and outstanding value, choose a Bulova. Watch of a lifetime. W-E-A-F, New York. Rinso, R-I-N-S-O, Soapy Rich Rinso presents Boston Blackie, starring Chester Morris. <laughs> Check here, please. Check your hat and coat. May I have my coat, miss? Uh, here's the check. Thank you. Number 503? Yes, a camel's hair coat. Oh, yes, I remember. It's right over here. Here you are, sir. Help you on with it? No, thanks. I'll carry it. Here you are, miss. Thank you, sir. Check here, please. Check your hat and coat. Oh, taxi! Taxi! What's your hurry, Blackie? Oh, oh, well, Faraday, my favorite cop. Don't be so happy to see me, Blackie. You're going with me. Oh, goody. <laughs> what are we celebrating tonight? Your birthday? No celebration for you, Blackie. I want you for the murder of Andrew Lawrence. Oh, you do, do you? Who's he? You know. The caretaker of the Devon Estate. Now, look, Inspector, I don't know any caretakers, and I never even heard of the Devon Estate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, Blackie. What about those stains on that coat you're carrying there? They look like blood. Stains? Yeah, stains. Hey, wait a minute. This isn't my coat. Oh, let me see. 
Well, now, what's this on the label? It says here, Boston Blackie. Yes, that's my label, all right, but this isn't my coat. Oh, uh-huh. I suppose somebody sewed that label in another coat. Well, that's not bad for you, Inspector. Could be. Well, all I know is you're going down to headquarters and the coat is going to the lab. And I hope those stains prove to be blood. Well, I hope you don't get your hope. Once again, Boston Blackie and Inspector Faraday have tangled. Boston Blackie, enemy to those who make him an enemy, friend to those who have no friends. Is there anything prettier these hot summer days than a nice-looking girl in a crisp, bright-colored cotton dress? Well, to us men, those dresses always look fresh and cool as peppermint ice cream. And it's almost as easy as snapping your fingers to keep those pretty printed washables bright and gay with Rinso helping out. Yes, indeed, those hard-working Rinso suds make dirt disappear in a jiffy, whether you're using a tub or a washing machine. Rinso's mighty easy on your pretty washable colors, too. They stay fresh and bright even after dozens of washings. So take a tip from Bob White for easier wash days and brighter, cleaner clothes. That's Rinso White and Rinso Bright for your colored clothes. If you value them, better use Rinso every time you wash them. <laughs> And now, back to Chester Morris as Boston Blackie, who is in Inspector Faraday's office, waiting word on the laboratory tests of the blood stains found on the coat he was wearing. Blackie, for a smart guy, you get into more scrapes. Uh, look, Inspector, can't you think without pacing the floor? Uh, I've got a little proposition to make you. Oh, but how about the blood stains on the coat, Inspector? Remember, you wanted me for murder. Well, not just in case those bloodstains turn out not to be bloodstains. Oh, you don't need to apologize, Inspector. Who's apologizing? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what are you laughing at? Well, your shoelaces are untied. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't you tie them? Me? Yes. <laughs> now, wait a minute. This is going to be fun. Yes. All right, you tie them, Blackie. What? Now, really, Inspector, yes, this you. is quite humiliating. I, I never fancied myself as a gentleman's gentleman. Gentleman's gentleman? Cut out the double talk and come on, tie my shoelaces, Blackie. Oh, oh, well, all right. <laughs> you know, I'm enjoying this. Boston Blackie, finally on his knees. Yes, but not begging, Inspector. <laughs> By the way, don't you ever get your shoes shined? What for? Oh, well, there you are. <laughs> I hope you realize it's a privilege to be tied by Boston Blackie. Wonderful. Here's the report, Inspector. Okay, let's have it. That'll be all, Matthews. Right, Inspector. Goodbye, Matthews. You ain't going anywhere, Blackie. What? Huh? Well, come on, Inspector. What's the verdict? I'll read it to you, Blackie. It says, quote, stains taken from the coat of Boston Blackie analyzed. Yes. Tests show them to be human blood matching that of Andrew Lawrence, murdered caretaker of Devon Estate, signed Murphy Police Laboratory, unquote. Well, that's it, Blackie. I'm locking you up right now. Oh. And I'm not taking any chances on you getting out of here first. Hold out your hands. Oh, now, Inspector, cuffs for me? Yeah. Oh, you've got a very bad memory. Okay, maybe you can get out of handcuffs, but my gun doesn't miss. What, a gun again, Inspector? Again. Say, look, why don't you try a bow and arrow for a change? All right, let's get going. Just to make sure, I'm going to escort you personally to your cell. That'll be nice. All right, down the hall, and don't try anything funny. Well, will you sit with me a while and hold my hand? Oh, come on. I'm sorry I had to tie your shoelaces together, Faraday. And thanks for the gun. (laughs) You know, you look very funny. Generally, you're only flat on your feet. But now you're flat on your face. <laughs> Got the answer yet, Blanky? Not yet, Shorty. Hello? Oh, oh, hello. Savoy Cafe? Yes. This is the manager speaking. Well, my name is Jones. Yes. My niece works in your check room. I just arrived in town, and I'd like to talk to her, please. You mean Marion Macy? Yes. Well, she's not here. I'm sorry. She's gone home. Had a headache, she said. Left here about an hour ago. Oh, she did. Too bad. Uh, by the way, could you give me her address? Why, yes. The Lincoln apartment. The Lincoln, huh? Well, thank you very much. Goodbye. You know, I still can't figure out, Blackie, why that hat check girl would take the label out of your coat and then sew it in another one. Well, she was probably following orders. That's what we're going to find out. Uh, we're going to leave this hideout, I think? Yes. We're going to the Lincoln Apartments. (laughs) 
Here's the apartment, Shorty. That's funny. Probably asleep. But I've got to talk to her. Can you can you open that door, boss? Are you kidding? I've got it, Shorty. There it is. Come on. I'm getting a creepy feeling, boss, like I always do. Oh, before. Shorty, will you relax? Hey, what's this? What? Holy mackerel, the dame. Boss, that feeling of mine was right. Yes, it's the check room girl, girl all right, Shorty. She's dead. Come on over here and take a look. Oh, no, no, no. I'll take your word for it. Poor kid. Stabbed to death. Somebody's playing for keeps, Shorty. Somebody wanted to make sure I didn't find out who told her to switch coats. If Fandy walks in now, he'll try to pin us on you, sure. Come on, we better get out of here. Come on, boy. Yeah, that's Let's... right. There's nothing around here will help us. Shorty. Yeah? That caretaker was murdered out at the Devon Estate. Yeah. So that's where I'm going. <laughs> I beg your pardon, miss. I, I didn't see you. What I was... are you doing here on my grounds? Well, this is the Devon Estate, isn't it? Yes, and you're trusted. Well, I hope that means looking for a job, because that's what I'm doing. It doesn't. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. There's no job open here. Well, you know, I'm a pretty handy fellow. I can do a lot of things. I'm I... really not interested. There's a policeman on the grounds. If you don't leave immediately, I'll call him and have you thrown off. Oh, please don't do that. I understood there was a job open here, a, a caretaker's job. Your caretaker was... Uh... Was murdered. Yes, he was. Now, please leave. I already have a new caretaker. Jerry? Uh, yes, Miss Morrison. Coming. <laughs> Miss Morrison, huh? Awful pretty name. Over here, Jerry. Will you go now, please, Mr... Oh, I'm sorry, Miss Morrison. My name is Jones. John J. Jones. I'm a detective. Oh, please don't give me away. Oh, here I am, Miss Morrison. Oh, I, uh... I, I don't need you, Jerry. I, I just wanted to know you were around. Oh, okay, ma'am. If you want me, just sing out. <laughs> Where did you get him? I hired him a little while ago. So you're a detective, Mr. Jones. Have your credentials? Well, uh, you see, I never carry them when I'm on a case. Things can happen, you know. That's what I'm afraid of. Oh, Miss Morrison, please believe me. <laughs> I believe you, but I'll never know why. <laughs> Thanks. The house is up this way. What can I tell you that might help you, Mr. Jones? Well, uh, for one thing, I'm puzzled. Now, your name is Morrison, and this is the Devon Estate. Well, I bought it six months ago. Oh. It was formerly owned by a man named John Devon. And when he died, this place was sold for taxes. I see. Well, why are you still living here, Miss Morrison? I mean, aren't you a little frightened after what happened? Yes. Yes, I am a little. But where could I go? Besides, I'm anxious to know the answer to a lot of things. For instance? Well, right after I bought this estate... Strange things began to happen. One morning, the chimney was torn apart. A few days later, I found the cellar ransacked. Then one night, the whole living room was turned upside down. I see. Well, where was your old caretaker during all this? He was down the road, sleeping in his own cottage. Oh. But after the living room was ransacked, he slept in the house on a couch. That is, until last night. Or, rather, early this morning, when we found him murdered. Here we are. Oh. Please come in. Thank you. You're pretty calm about all this, Miss Morrison. It uh, must be rather annoying. It's more than annoying. My nerves are beginning to jump. Yes, I'm sure. Anything else you can tell me that might help? Well, possibly. I've had two offers to sell recently. The agent who negotiated the sale of this house made me an offer the day before yesterday to buy it back. Oh, and what's the agent's name? Arthur Moran. Oh, I see. Go on. Well, when I refused, he said his client, in any case, would like to buy the gun collection that was here when I took possession. Oh, well, are you interested in guns? Yes, and it's a wonderful collection. It came with the house. Well, it's obvious somebody is looking for something in this house. When he couldn't find it, he wanted to buy the house. When he couldn't do that, he wanted to buy your gun collection. And, of course, he was looking for... The gun collection. I bet your caretaker surprised him while he was searching for it. Uh, how long had the caretaker been here? A long time. I sort of inherited him this place. I see. You mentioned there was a policeman on the grounds. Where is he? He's around somewhere. He's staying with Jerry in the caretaker's cottage. Uh, Miss Morrison, could you arrange for the policeman and your new caretaker to sleep downstairs here and for me to take over the cottage for the night? Certainly I can do that. Oh, fine. And can you reach me in a hurry if you need me? Yes. There's an extension phone between here and the caretaker's place. Good. I'll call Jerry and tell him he's sleeping down here tonight. Thanks. Oh, uh, Miss Morrison, uh, what do your best friends call you? <laughs> Polly. Good night, Polly. <laughs> 
You see, I'm one of your best friends. Good morning. Hey, what's this? Hey, wait, Jerry. Jerry, I'll have you untied in a minute. Oh, even my Aunt Hattie couldn't talk with that gag on. I better take it off. There. There. Now, what happened? I I don't know. I I went to sleep last night on the couch here, and, and during the night, somebody tapped me on the bean. And when I woke up a little while ago, I was I was tied up and, and gagged. Yeah. Well, oh, there you, you're not tied up anymore. Now, where's the cop that was with you? I don't know. Uh-oh. There he is, over in the corner. He's tied up, too. Get him loose, Jerry. Oh, take a look at this place. It's a mess. Everything's turned upside down. Well, never mind that. I want to find out about Miss Morris. Polly. Polly. <sighs> Polly. Polly, what's happened? <sighs> Wake up, Polly. Wake up. What? Get up. Come on now. Up. That's a girl. Come on now. Now walk around the room with me. Here, put your arm on my shoulder. That's right. Now tell me what happened. Well, I don't know. You've been drugged, Polly. Now come on, try and think. I don't know. I'm tired. I want to lie down. Again. Now look, Polly, you've got to keep walking. Come on. We'll go downstairs and then you'll feel better in a minute. Hey! Hey, you upstairs! Yes, what is it? Miss Morrison okay? Yes, how's the policeman? Oh, he's hurt pretty bad. I'm taking him to the doctor's down the road. Okay, Jerry. I'll see you when you get back. Now, Polly, come on. Walk. Come on now, down the stairs. That's right. I... I'm beginning to remember now. Good. I put a glass of milk on my night table. And then I went downstairs for a book. When I came back, I drank the milk... And then I got terribly drowsy. Mm. Well, that explains the drug. But you're getting over it all right. What's happened down here? Well, the whole place is turned inside out. Well, I don't know what happened yet. I can't stand this any longer. I can't. Oh, now, Polly, take it easy, please. Here, sit down for a minute. Come on. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> Well, now, isn't that a pretty picture? Well, Inspector Faraday. Yes, Inspector Faraday. So I caught up with you again, eh, Blackie? Blackie? Certainly, Miss Morrison. Boston Blackie. You've heard of him. But he said his name was Jones. Well, he was a detective. I can tell you why, Polly, if you'll only give me a chance. Not a chance, Blackie. I figured you'd come up here after we found the hat check girl murdered. Yeah. You've got a killing complex lately. Faraday, will you take it easy? I'm really getting close to the murderer. Yeah, me too. I'm practically standing in front of him. Right. Get your gun drop on the floor, Faraday. Drop it. Hey, who, who are you? Let the gun go or I'll let a bullet go, copper. Come on. Uh, that's being smart. Hey, Danny, get Blackie's rod. Step on it. Okay, Eddie. All right, what is all this fuss about Blackie? Hero stuff? You're going to knock out these two guys and show off for the gal here? Well, I'd like to, Faraday. Only a bullet moves faster than I can. <laughs> hey, you mugs. I don't mean to be inquisitive, but uh, what's all this about? You'll know soon enough. How about it, Danny? I got Blackie's rod and the inspectors. Okay. Put the straight jackets on him, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> Gee, I didn't think we'd get the inspector, too. You better go call the boss. Yeah, he said to follow orders to the letter. Where's the phone, lady? Well, I... Yeah, you better tell him, Polly. Well, it's just outside the door. Thanks, lady. Keep them all under the gun muzzle, Danny. Okay. Watch that Blackie especially. Yeah. Be right back. And watch that Blackie especially. What is a guy, a gunman or a press agent? <laughs> what a build-up he's giving you, Blackie. Well, after all, I haven't established a reputation for nothing. <laughs> Even you appreciate me sometimes, uh, Faraday. Uh, okay, Danny. I talked to the boss. Stick the straight jackets on him. What size straight jacket you take, Blackie? I always have my straight jackets made to order. Yeah. After we get through searching the house, we'll stick their feet in concrete and toss them in the river. Feet in concrete? Now, you wouldn't dare to do that. Oh, don't yeah. worry, Faraday. At least we won't get our feet wet. Very funny, Blackie. Very funny. <laughs> don't do it the hard way, ladies. Take it easy. What am I talking about? Why, dishwashing, of course. And the way to take it easy is to let Soapy Rich Rinso take over. Because those lively, hard-working Rinso suds get right after every little bit of clinging grease and all those sticky food particles and chase them away quick as a wink. Just try it. 
And by all means, have Rinso handy for wash day. This hot weather, you certainly don't want to knock yourself out doing your wash the hard way either. Well, remember, Rinso not only makes wash day a cinch, it helps you turn out a wash you're really proud of. I'll bet you'll be singing your way through wash day like this. Rinso, wait, Rinso, wait, happy little wash day song. Rinso, wait, Rinso, wait, pretty see it all day long. Your fine feather friend has a message to send, so listen, you can't go wrong. Rinso, wait, Rinso, wait, happy little wash day song. So get Rinso tomorrow. And now, back to Chester Morris as Boston Blackie. <laughs> Boston Blackie, Polly Morrison, and Inspector Faraday have been put in straitjackets by two thugs after Blackie has been accused of the murder of the caretaker of the Devon estate. One of the gunmen is on guard while the other is searching the Devon house. What are you twisting around for, Blackie? <laughs> straitjackets were made to hold people. Yes, handy little things, aren't they? Yeah. I hear you can get out of ropes and handcuffs and things. Oh. Yeah, well, why don't you try to get out of that canvas coat you're wearing? You're due to get a bath, you know. <laughs> All three of you. That's the boss's orders. Well, that's charming. Uh, by the way, Danny, who is the boss? What's his name? Uh, didn't he give you his card? No. Well, I guess he must have forgot. Huh? <laughs> Gee, you look funny down there lying on the floor. You know, if I felt like it, I could step all over you. How'd you like to have your face stepped on, Blackie? Like this. Hey, let go of my feet. You don't want to step on anybody, Stooge. Hey, this will make sure you stay on the floor till I leave. <laughs> well, how in the world did you get out of that straitjacket, Blackie? Never mind that. Get us out of out of ours. How did you get out, Blackie? Well, it's simple. I had my pocket knife in my hand, and while they were putting this jacket on me, I, well, I just sliced right through the canvas. Hey, hurry up, Blackie. That other guy will be back in a minute. I'll let you out, Inspector, if you'll give me a ten-minute start after I do. What for? Well, I think I can find the man responsible for the two murders, but I've got to have time to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, I want ten minutes, Faraday. Come on, what about it? Ten minutes? Okay, you've got it. Thanks. Polly. Yes, Blackie? Uh, tell me, what was the agent's name again? You know, the one who sold you the house and later wanted to buy your gun collection for a client. Arthur Moran. Why? Arthur Moran, huh? Okay. He's due for a phone call. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Moran? Yes? This is John J. Jones. I'm working with the police department, and I'd like some information. Yes? Uh, who instructed you to try to buy the Devon estate back, and who wanted to get the gun collection? A client of mine in South America. I see. Well, what's his name? Parker Adams. Why, uh, what's this all about? Oh, just checking, Mr. Moran. Who is Adams? Well, uh, he was involved in a scrape here five years ago and went to South America to live. Well, why did he want to buy the Devon estate in the gun collection? Well, I haven't the slightest idea. All I know is that he sent a check every week to Mr. Devon from Brazil. Uh -huh. I, uh, I believe he owned a coffee plantation or something. Well, thank you, Mr. Moran. That's all I wanted to know. <laughs> Did, uh, did you get all that dope I wanted, Shorty? Yeah, yeah, sure, boss. It was a cinch. Look, I go into the files at the Daily Globe, and I pulled out this stuff about this uh, Parker Adams. Huh, no trouble at all. And say, no wonder this guy Adams had to go to South America. Just put your peepers on this clipping, will you? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I see what you mean. Come on, Shorty. We're going up to the Devon Estate. <laughs> It's me, Polly. Blackie. I'm over here in the bushes. Is the coast clear? Well, there, there are two policemen in the house and one outside. Okay. Polly, I think I found out something. I know who the murderer is and I know why he's ransacking your house. But Blackie, how did you find that out? Well, I checked the newspaper files on a man named Parker Adams, who asked Moran to buy this house from you and then wanted to buy your gun collection. He's in South America now, but he was a suspect in a murder case five years ago. But... What has that to do with what's happened at my house? Well, you see, this Adams wasn't convicted because the police couldn't prove him guilty. 
They couldn't find the gun. And you think the gun is in my house? Yes. And that Devon was blackmailing Adams with it. Polly, I've got to get by those two policemen and get into the house and find that gun. But, Blackie, how? Oh, let's see. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll climb that tree by your window and then drop to the first floor roof. Yes, I know, but the policeman outside... Yeah, I know. I'll throw a rock in the pool. That'll keep him busy while I get in the house. Uh, where is the gun collection, Polly? In the library. Fine. I'll meet you there. Blackie, be careful. Oh, sure. Well, here goes. Is that you, Blackie? Yes, Polly. Oh, I'm so glad. Where's the library? Over here. The gun collection's in this room. Come in, Blackie. Good. Now, we've got to work fast. Now, where are they? In a box in this desk. I'll show them to you. There's a drawer here, but you'd never find it unless you knew it was there. Here they are. Take a look at them. Ooh. Say, this is a fine collection, Polly. All old-timers, too. You know, I was pretty sure that one of them was the gun that Parker Adams killed a man with five years ago. But I can see now that I was wrong. But you said you knew who the murderer was. Oh, sure I do. And I know why he did it, but I can't prove it. Uh, I'm just a dummy. I'm... Dummy. Hey, wait a minute. That gives me an idea. Look at this. This isn't a real gun at all. What? No. No, it's a dummy. It's hollow. Oh, and look what's inside. A Colt 25 pistol. Why, this must be the one Parker Adams used. And we can easily prove that by the serial number on it. Polly? Polly, I think this is our ace in the hole. You don't mind if I thump that ace, do you, Blackie? I'll take that gun. Jerry! I'm not surprised, Polly. I had a pretty good idea it was this fellow who was in back of these murders. No, you did, eh? Smart guy, huh? How did you know? Well, when one of your thugs went to call the boss before he put us in straitjackets, he, uh, he just casually picked up the telephone and didn't bother to dial. Hmm. There's a direct connection between the house and the caretaker's cottage, and that's where you were, Jerry. You were the boss. You only took this job so you could search for this gun. Hmm, nice figuring, pal. Well, as long as compliments are being handed out, that was pretty clever of you to get yourself tied up here this morning. But not clever enough. Huh. Why, any good boy scout could tell you tied yourself up, Mr. Parker Adams. Adams? Yes. Hmm. He went down to South America and planted somebody to take his phone calls and pretend to be him. It was simple, but effective. Listen, I've spent a lot of time and money trying to get that gun back, Blackie. Yes, and killed two people trying. And now it's going to be four. And Miss Morrison, don't keep looking over my shoulder for your cops. My boys have taken care of them. Okay, Blackie, give me the gun. Now, just a minute. Uh, let me get this straight. Uh, the caretaker recognized you when you were ransacking the house, and you had to kill it, right? Well? And you had to get rid of the blood-stained camel's hair coat you were wearing. And then after you had the hat check girl switch coats and sew in my own label... You had to kill her to keep her mouth shut. Oh, she didn't pick your coat on purpose. It could have been any camel's hair coat. Oh, well, I know the rest. Devin was blackmailing you because he, he had this gun. When you found out he died, you tried to buy this house, but Miss Morrison got it first. So you came to the States and began operations to get the only evidence that could convict you of murder. Oh, you've said enough. You're stalling. Hey, Eddie. Eddie! Yeah, boss? Oh, you got these two, huh? Get the gun Blackie's got in his hand, Eddie. It's not loaded. Okay, boss. Come on, Blackie, give. Sure. Here. Oh. oh hey. Holly, she's fainting, boss. Catch it. Hey, stand up. Stop leaning on me. You get off of me, will you? I'll get her, boss. <clears throat> go to sleep, Eddie. Hey, you let go of my hand. I'm yeah. holding Jerry's gun hand, Blackie. Hurry. You can let go now. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Thanks, Polly. You know, that was mighty nice fainting. Uh, thank you, Blackie. But I think I feel a real one coming on. Oh, you're wonderful. Do you want to be more wonderful? How? Oh. Call Faraday and tell him what you've heard. That will be enough to clear me. Of course I will. Oh. Oh. What's the matter, Blackie? Hold me. Hold me. I think I'm going to faint. Faint? A big, strong man like you? Well, it seems to be the only way I can get your arms around me. <laughs> Austin Blackie will be back in just a moment with an interesting preview of next week's program. Now, uh, you heard about the language of music, ladies. You know what this means? That's right, rinse or white. And it means the cleanest, freshest, whitest wash you could ask to see. But you can't get clothes that clean with lazy, old-fashioned soaps. You need a hard-working, lively soap like rinse -O. 
Because Rinso actually gets out more dirt. Why, Rinso just soaks clothes clean, often in as little as ten minutes. And then a few quick finger rubs on extra dirty places, and there's your Rinso White Rinso Bright Wash. Yes, for a wash that you'll be really proud to hang up on your line, get Soapy Rich Rinso. <laughs> And now, a brief glimpse of next week's adventure. Hello? Hello. Say, uh, I'm supposed to meet a young lady in your lobby there, and I've been delayed. Would, uh, would you mind having a page, please? Why, sure, sure. What's the young lady's name? Uh, her name is Alice Manletter. Miss Manletter? That's right. Why, she left here just a minute ago. She met someone she was expecting and left with him. Well, that's impossible. Miss Manletter didn't know a soul in New York. Oh, I wouldn't know about that. But she told me she had an appointment with a Mr. Boston Blackie. And that's the man she left here with. Well, but that can't be possible. And why not? Because I'm Boston Blackie. We'd like to take a moment here to congratulate the women of the United States Navy, the Waves, who are presently celebrating two years of service to their country. In two years, approximately 70,000 of America's finest young women have volunteered for the most important jobs of their lives, serving in the Navy. Waves work hard at important war tasks, but they keep their individuality, have plenty of fun and enjoyment with good companions, and have great pride and satisfaction for a job well done. If you'd like to help get this war over and bring your loved one home sooner, here's your chance. Join the Waves. <laughs> Be sure to listen at this same time next week for another exciting adventure with Boston Blackie. You can see Chester Morris as Boston Blackie on the screen at your favorite movie theater. Boston Blackie's latest Columbia picture is One Mysterious Night, soon to be released. Richard Lane appears as Inspector Faraday, music by Charles Connell. This is Harlow Wilcox saying goodnight for Boston Blackie, brought to you by the makers of Rinso, the soap that gets clothes. <laughs> Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. There's no other end. But they never learn. This time it was going to be a vacation in the wide open spaces. But a black stallion, a tiny emerald, and a battered horseshoe met a 24-hour delay. It could have been worse. Because to the dude from Manhattan, they meant death. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy. As we present... The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Dude from Manhattan. <laughs> So often, life in the city seems to boil down to nothing but noise and concrete. Where all a deep breath does for you is to pack more exhaust fumes into your lungs. And the nearest thing to nature is a mangy sparrow pecking survival out of a dirty alley. So when I got a long-distance call from an old friend inviting me to spend a week in the great outdoors at a ranch he just bought near Rattlesnake Mountain, <laughs> I snapped at the chance. Inside an hour, I was rolling down the highway toward San Bernardino. And 120 miles later, at 5 o'clock, I turned in under a big arch of gnarled cedar that spelled out Rainbow Ranch. But the layout beyond was about as primitive as a dry martini. A ranch house the size of a Union Station was backed up by blue tile swimming pool, paved tennis court, and a semicircle of bungalows with all the rustic charm of a Hollywood motel. I drove on in slowly as a broad-brimmed hat, red gabardine shirt, hickok belt, and hand-tooled boots bounced out the door and ran toward me. It was my host, the ex-hotel man, Harold R. Lost. Oh, old rascal. How are you, boy? I am sure glad you can make it. File out, and I'll show you around. Hey, what is all this, Harold? <laughs> From your phone call, I expected a shack with oil lamps, a wood stove, and at least a few head of cattle. Oh, you mean I didn't tell you? Why, this is a guest ranch, Phil. Guest ranch. The best in the West. Oh, brother. <laughs> oh, and incidentally, don't call me Harold. No, huh? Bad atmosphere for the dudes. 
The name's Buck now. Buck Lawson. Buck? <laughs> oh, 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 no. Oh, I got a real spread here, Phil. Real spread. Fourteen big cabins, string of thirty horses, stables down there. Oh, hello, Buck. Beautiful day, isn't it? Howdy, folks. Sure is. <clears throat> Mr. and Mrs. Dogelman. He's a big fan of storage man in L.A. No. As I was saying, I... Thunder! Who's coming? Red Rider? Uh, not funny, Phil. Not funny. Look, it's Thunder. Oh, that black devil. He's loose again. That horse will kick the fence down if those fools don't hold him. Hey, hey, that's some animal. He's a beauty. Yes, yeah, and a renegade. A skittish, temperamental bronco with anybody but Virgil Sawyer. Yeah? Oh, they got a rope on him now. That'll hold him, huh? Yeah, not for long. Sawyer's the only hand I've got who can get close to that stallion. And he's leaving tomorrow. Blast it. How come? Well... Frankly, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah, uh, uh, wait a minute. I came up here for a rest, not a job. I know, I know. You'll get it, Phil. You'll get it. But uh, since you're here, I figure you could sort of keep your eyes open for me. Lawson, it's a dirty trick. No, 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 Phil, please. I'm expecting trouble, and bluntly, I can't afford it. Mm. Every cent I've got is tied up in this ranch. A serious scandal could ruin me. And you're just the one who can keep that sort of okay, thing Okay, okay. So it's the old hotel business on horseback. How does this Sawyer mean trouble? Well... There's a couple here from the East, the Mortons. He's a top silk wholesaler from New York and rich. Oh. And that kind means everything to me, Phil. But his wife, Judy, an ex-dance instructor with Arthur Murray back East, is... Well, she's bored stiff out here. And the upshot of it all is that somehow... Mm -hmm. Somehow she and your cowboy Sawyer started making eyes at each other and the husband got nasty about it, huh? How did you know that? Yeah, well, it's standard, like a B-picture plot. Well, anyway, they came to blows this morning. Maybe Virgil's innocent, maybe not, but I can't take a chance, so I fired him. Ordered him to pack and get off the place by tomorrow. Well, that's that. What are you worried about? Plenty. Sawyer's a proud man, Marlowe. He, he was furious. He threatened to get even. I'm not sure he means it, but if he does, well, that's what we have to look out for. The we, huh? Now look, Buck, you built me into coming up here, and I got a good notion to turn wait, around... Wait, wait, wait. Hold it, Phil. What's the matter? You see that couple going into cabin number eight? Yeah. That's the couple I'm talking about. The Mortons, Paul and Judy. Cabin eight, huh? But don't tell me. Just let me guess. Yeah. Yeah. You're right, Phil. You've got number seven. Mm. Okay. Yeah, sure. Number seven it is. I'll be seeing you, Buck. <laughs> up to number seven and waited for the boy to show up with my bag. Then I started to unpack, but stopped when I heard a riot next door. At that point, sprawling Rainbow Ranch was just a horizontal tenement. Nothing more. Well, let me point out a few... Now what are you doing? Shutting the window. Isn't it bad enough to make a fool of yourself in private? You have to make a public scene as well? The voices rattled on for a few minutes, then dwindled off into a long and golden silence that said maybe a peace treaty had been signed. But then a door slammed to number eight, so I peeked out. It was Morton. And from the look on his face, I knew the peace treaty was nothing but an armed truce. I followed him to the big lodge and into the bar, and when he sat down, I took the stool next to him. Well, uh, what'll it be, gentlemen? Scotch and water, no ice. Uh, the same, with ice. Well, Mr. Morton, I guess that brands us as dudes, huh? <laughs> Bourbon's the only drink out west. I wouldn't know, I'm sure. Oh, it's a fact. Uh, hey, that's a handsome ring you got there. And the initials are the same as mine. Those stones are emeralds, aren't they? That's right. Yeah. There's supposed to be four of them. One's missing, I see. Is that an emerald, too? It was. Happens to be my birthstone. Oh, here you are, gentlemen. Oh, fine. Allow me, Mr. Morton. There you are. Oh, thank you, sir. How'd you lose it? Stone, I mean. I don't know. It happened several months ago, and in any case, it's no concern of yours. Now, if you don't mind, I'd just as soon be left alone. Oh, well, that's too bad. Here I was hoping I'd find out all about the silk business. The silk... What do you mean by that? Oh, just conversation. You are in that business, aren't you? Of course, but... Hey, who are you, anyway? Name's Marlowe. And just why are you prying into my personal affairs, Mr. Marlowe? Because I got a little free advice for you. Cool off before you start the kind of fire you can't put out, huh? So that's it. That cowboy saw it. Mm -hmm. Marlowe, now you're getting too personal. I suggest that you mind your own business. Oh, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to lose my temper that way. Good night. Yeah, it's bound to be. Charming, isn't he? Well, Mrs. Morton, where'd you come from? I was standing over there watching. My husband has all the social grace of a tarantula. Well, maybe you should have looked closer before you made the leap. Oh, that's the wonderful thing about him. Yeah? You're not apt to like Paul much when you first meet him. But once you get to know him, you hate him. Yeah, I'm not sure that's funny. It's not supposed to be. I've been living with him for six months now. 
so jealous it's unbelievable. He wouldn't leave me in New York, oh no. Insisted on dragging me out to this, this dust bowl with running water. Why a ranch, I'll never understand. He doesn't know one end of a horse from another. Well, with his aptitude, he'll learn. <laughs> you know, it might be, he figured you two might get back together if you had a chance to relax in the open, Mrs. Morton. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So he said. However, we weren't here ten minutes before he accused me of getting romantic with that leather-faced cowboy. Does that make sense? I don't know. Both gentlemen are justified. You're lovely to look at. Somebody ought to remind my husband. <laughs> his idea of welding a marriage is to spend all his time playing gin with that Doverman. Who? Doverman, the van and storage character from Los Angeles. Oh. Which, of course, leaves me saddled with his wife, Carrie. Now, there's a cute personality for you if you happen to like neurotic Paris. So what with the desert, the dame, and gin rummy? Virgil began to look pretty good, is that it? Uh, excuse me, folks. Uh, care to order another drink before yes, dinner? Yes, I would. And I'd like it over there, alone. Make it Manhattan, bartender. Strictly Manhattan. And make it double. Mr. Marlowe, good night. Hmm. No, I'm not so sure. It was almost dark when I left the bar and headed down to the bunkhouse where the working personnel of Rainbow Ranch called home. The casual clutter of rumpled cots, scattered pulp fiction, and dusty boots gave it the only sign of authenticity I'd seen in the entire place. But aside from that, it was empty. Then a noise from outside brought me around the building to the back, where I ran up against six and a half lean feet of solitary cowboy, with his hat shoved back on his head, pitching horseshoes. <laughs> he was out of uniform for a flashy dude wrangler, which left him in a faded blue shirt and Levi's that fitted his lanky legs like a pair of bent stovepipes. He spotted me and stood there swinging a battered horseshoe in each hand while I walked up to him. Hello? Hiya, Sawyer. A little dark for horseshoes, isn't it? little. Hey, hey, you're good. <laughs> good at horses, too, huh? I understand you're the only man who can handle that black stallion, Thunder. Yeah. What's the secret? No secret. Just have to treat him right. What's on your mind, mister? The fact that you're leaving tomorrow. I reckon you better keep out of my business. Uh, now, look, Sawyer, it takes at least two to make a fight. And fights are poison to Buck Lawson. So? I don't like to see my friends poisoned. Now, uh... Why don't you take it easy, huh? Lay off. Keep your nose clean. I don't know who you are, mister, but I'll tell you this anyway, seeing as you're so interested. I'm leaving here tomorrow, all right. And I'm going to square up with a couple of folks first before I go. I got a raw deal here, and I'm just not the kind to take it laying down. What do you mean, raw deal? You're a big boy now. You ought to know better than to get yourself all involved. I'm not much for conversation, fella, but I'm going to say something real plain so you'll be sure to sell me. Oh! <laughs> By the time I got myself untangled and back on my feet, the strong, silent fugitive from the old Chisholm Trail was gone. However, my original theory that it takes two to make a fight was still valid. So I decided to find Paul Morton and spend the rest of the evening close to him. His cabin was dark, but I remembered the running gin game he had with a big van and storage man. So I went down the line to the Doverman cabin and knocked. It was Carrie, the perennial dude, who galloped up to open the door. Howdy, stranger. Come on in and set a spell. Our latch is always stringing out. Well, I sure do. Thank you, ma'am. My name's Marlowe. Orville, this is Mr. Marlowe. <laughs> Howdy, Marlowe. Howdy. Hope you'll excuse the looks of the place. Our box of extra clothes just arrived from town. Carrie's been unpacking it. Sit down there, Mr. Marlowe. They're mostly old things. Just throw them on the floor. Oh, thanks. But really, I can't stay. I'm looking for Paul Morton. I thought I might find him here. Morton, say. Hey, there's a nice chap. Met, met him day before yesterday for the first time and won $90 off him in gin already. Haven't seen him tonight, though. Orville was out looking for him himself just a few minutes ago, weren't you, dear? Why, oh, yes, as a matter of fact, I was. You didn't locate him, huh? No, I didn't. You know, he seemed to be all upset this afternoon. Couldn't keep his mind on the game. I thought I'd have a little chat with him to calm him down, so. Orville's a whiz at that, Mr. Mott. Oh. oh, it's not me, Carrie. It's this country. I don't see how a man can keep trouble in his mind on a place like this ranch, Marlow. Yeah, it can happen, believe me. Poppycock, why, son, there's something about this open land round here that cleans out a man's head and his heart, too. You sound like a travelogue. I mean it. A few more days of this and mortal forget there ever was such a thing as a cash register. Yes, sir. Give this untamed countryside a chance and it'll cure anything. Oh. Yes, well. Oh, no, come here, come here. What was that? Wasn't the call of the wild, Mr. Doverman. Lawson, what's the matter? Bill, come on, down to the stable, hurry. Something terrible's happened. <laughs> I 
to find out about it, Lawson. One of the boys told me. Heard Thunder raising a terrible fuss. Come over to check, but by then it was all over. Mm. Give me the lantern, Harold, will you? Here you are, here you are. Holy smoke. It's Paul Morton, all right. He's been trampled to death. Oh, it's a ghastly accident. And it's all my fault, Phil. I, I knew Thunder was dangerous, and I didn't get rid of it. All right, take it easy, take it easy. Well, there's I... a lot of questions to be answered before anybody takes the... Bl- hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look at this. Here by the gate. What's just a horseshoe? Stables are full of them, Phil. Yeah, not like this one. Look at it. It's all battered up. Well, all right, it's battered. Well, what's that supposed to be? Nothing yet. But it gives me an idea. Because the last time I saw one of these was being pitched at an iron stake behind the bunkhouse. What are you getting at? Well, the chances are at least 50-50 that Paul Morton's death was no accident. It was murder. <laughs> Just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, perfect musical settings for a Sunday before the 4th will be yours tomorrow afternoon. The symphonette, the half hour of fine orchestral music, and the choral airs, a half hour of brilliant vocal music, are regular Sunday afternoon features on most of these same CBS network stations. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Dude from Manhattan. Paul Morton's death, something worse than an accident. Lawson's mouth fell open and the muscles in his face jerked as his eyes moved slowly from me out to the now quiet black stallion in the corral who somehow or other seemed to sense the death at our feet. Then as the trembling man's lips silently formed the word murder, he gestured for me to help him carry Morton's body out of the stable. After that, he looked at the dead man's broken face once more, said he was going to call the sheriff's office and hurried away. A minute later, Judy Morton stepped into the small circle of light that surrounded what only a short time ago had been her husband except for a thin line of perspiration above her lips. She was no different than when I'd seen her last. I just passed Buck on my way down here. He told me my husband was dead. Did you tell you anything else, Judy? About how Paul died, I mean? No. It was a stallion, wasn't it? An accident? I doubt it. Why, Marlo? For one thing, this horseshoe, too close to the body. But this is a stable. And this is a horseshoe that's been used exclusively for pitching at a stake in the ground. Here, look at it. And remember, Cowboy Virgil's favorite sport is horseshoes. Besides, what reason would your husband have for coming down here at this hour in the first place? He wasn't too crazy about horses, you know. No, but he was about me. Let's move a little away from here, Marlo. A cigarette? No, thanks. I'm not coming apart at the seams because it isn't in me. I hated Paul. Hated him with all my heart, Marlo. I'm down here only because he pleaded with me, begged me to talk to him once more, to listen to reason. About what? About the decision I came to less than an hour ago, which was divorce, unconditionally. I thought you said you came out here to try to patch things up. I did. I also said that we weren't doing a very good job of it. Then, tonight, a little after we left you with the bar, Marlowe, I got my hands on the lever I needed to pry myself loose from that jealous maniac. It was the knowledge, Marlowe, that my late husband was crooked. So business? Yes. While he was drinking his dinner, I went to one of his suitcases for an aspirin. Found what instead? At least three dozen samples of the best silks made without any importer's or manufacturer's name. And underneath that, $200,000 in cash. I know enough about the silk business to fill in the blanks, Marlowe. Hmm. All of which comes under the heading black market, huh? Yes. I added what I had found to the fact that this dude ranch he had insisted on was close to Los Angeles. Close enough for him to run off and conduct his purchasing while I thought he was communing with nature or playing gin with that Mr. Doberman. Then I had him. Mm -hmm. You also had a divorce, no strings attached, right? Exactly. Blackmail to get rid of your own husband. (laughs) Pretty, isn't it? Yeah. Well, at least with this this accident or whatever it is, it's no longer necessary. No. No, Judy, only two things are necessary. One, the location of Virgil Sawyer, and the other, you and your own cabin, where I can ask you some questions later. Why do you want to ask me questions? Well, I might be making a big mistake, baby. But it might be that Virgil and you are out for the 200,000 bucks. You know, honey, that man in the saddle might like money, too. I'll see you. When I started back for the bunkhouse, the only place I knew of that might give me a lead on the strong, silent horseshoe pitcher, I realized that tagging Paul Morton's death on murder was one thing. Proving it was going to be quite another. And when I was there and the place was empty without even signs of a hasty departure, I was sure of it. But not by intuition, as was the gentleman standing in the open doorway watching my every move. 
Orville Doverman, champion of the wide open spaces, didn't believe that a clean-cut cowboy could be guilty of anything more unrefined than spitting on a pot-bellied stove. Well, oh, I think you're crazy. Buck told me about your finding that horseshoe next to Morton's body and the conclusion you jumped to from there. You're being very hasty, boy, and that's dangerous, and that's the reason I'm here. I don't believe in necktie parties. Neck a man's got parties. a right to hey, a fair trial. Hey, hold it. Nobody said anything about lynching your hero. Huh? I want to find Sawyer. So that if I'm right, we can save the state the time and trouble of a manhunt. But since you brought it up, vigilante, don't scramble for conclusions too quickly yourself. I happen to have a little more to go on than the relative position of a horseshoe. Not that idle gossip that's going around. The same. But at the moment, it figures two ways. Virgil's unhappy enough for the status quo to liquidate the city slicker. Or... Virgil and the squall light out after a clean start the hard way. Choose one. Nonsense, Marlowe. In either case, and especially the stupid suggestion that the girl and Virgil Sawyer are in cahoots. That I can't believe. Well, sentimental reasons I can't either. Besides, Judy Morton found out enough about her husband within the last hour to make murder for freedom's sake very unnecessary. She learned he was a crook, Mr. D., if you can stand the disillusionment. Oh, no, Marlowe. Yeah, as in shady dealings in silk. Judy didn't go into details about it, but I gather she found out enough to make him sit up and take notice. And that brings us right back to Virgil. Boots, saddle, and all. Yeah. It does, sort of. And we'll argue the fine points later. But right well, now, Mr. Doverman, if you want to make sure that everybody gets a square deal, get close to Judy's cabin and stay there. Sentry duty, your object. Oh, all right. And if I'm wrong about the cowboy, you've done nothing worse than waste your time. Goodbye. <laughs> Spent the next 20 minutes talking to cowhands, guests, miscellaneous hired men, any and everybody who might have been able to say he went that away, of Virgil Sawyer, with no success. And to make matters worse, when I'd given that up and was on my way back to the lodge to help Lawson wait for the sheriff, I found myself being paged, Howdy. Western style, of course, by no one else but oh, Mrs. Gary Howdy. Doverman, the capital D in Dude Ranch. Howdy. Howdy, ma'am. Oh, Miss Marlowe. Yeah. Miss Marlowe, look at this. Look at what I've found. I've struck it rich, you might say, much like the old rustlers. The old uh, rustlers, Mrs. Doverman, stole cattle. Oh? Yes. Uh, oh, yes, so they did. I, I guess I meant those panhandle men. Mm. You know, gold is where you find it. <laughs> and anyhow, look, it's a precious stone. Small, but nevertheless precious. Uh, uh, mine while digging for worms, no doubt. Oh, Mr. Marlowe, you're teasing me. Yeah. You know very well that this is a polished stone. Funny thing, though, is where I found it. Shall I tell you? Oh, please. Please do, Mrs. Doverman. Well, I was just unpacking those clothes that mm-hmm. Orville had sent up from Los Angeles. Yeah. Some slacks and things like that. And, well, when I started to hang a pair up, this fell out of one of the cups. And then... <laughs> now, I wonder how a little old emerald like this ever got there. Well, it was probably mice, Mrs. Doverman. Em- emerald? It... Let me see that, quick. Well, yes, of course, but believe me, Mr. Marlowe, it can't be very valuable, I'm sure. I'm not. What are you talking about? Murder, or a reasonable facsimile thereof, and a girl named Judy Morton, if I don't hurry. Goodbye, and bless you, Mrs. Doverman, and you talk too much, but now is the right time. As I ran for Judy's cabin, I didn't know any more about the whys and wherefores of Paul Morton's death than I had before I made small talk with Mrs. Doverman. But I did know that unless Lady Named Luck and I were on the same team, the Rainbow Ranch was due for a second corpse. And when I was close enough to the rough oak door, numbered eight, and Orville Doverman, whom I'd asked to stand guard, was nowhere in sight. The full impact of that responsibility sank into where the wingtips on the butterflies in my stomachs were scratching at my hip pocket. Until I moved in still closer, and there in the light of a single lamp that was halo enough for me, I saw the girl from Manhattan nervously lighting one cigarette from the end of another. But more important, very much alive. I didn't bother knocking. Marlo, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Honey, I'm uncrossing fingers and toes alike. You know, they've been that way since I realized that I opened my mouth too wide, too soon, which puts you right smack on what used to be known as the spot. Oh, so that's the way it happened. Yeah, that's the way it... Now look, Judy, baby, you can't know what I mean yet. It's Doverman, honey, the gin player with all the moving vans. He's the one your husband was buying that black market silk from. I didn't know that until a few minutes ago, which was after I told him where you could be found and that you knew an awful lot. Oh, which Mr. Marlowe, he thanks you and warns you not to move. Yo. See what I mean, Phil? Yo, sure, I see. You know, it's funny, Doverman, when I was outside and didn't see you around, uh, did see that Judy here was still in good health, I figured that either you had decided to sit tight until you knew exactly how much she did know or that you already started to run. Yeah, this I didn't count on. And this, Marlowe, should point up what I said earlier about your jumping to conclusions. It's dangerous. Handling hot silk is child's play. It has been for me for 20 years, Marlowe. For your husband, Mrs. Morton, it was much more. That's why I had to come to you like this. 
That's why I had to know if his stupidity went so far that even you knew of me. You shouldn't have bothered, Mr. Doverman. I didn't. No, but you see, Marlowe did. That leaves me even. Uh, correction, Doverman. Paul Morton's dead. You're out in front. I didn't kill Morton, Marlowe, and neither did Virgil Sawyer. I saw it all, my friend. So I can tell you that the man who killed Paul Morton was... Paul Morton himself. Suicide? Are you out of your mind? No, not suicide, Mrs. Morton. Merely a plan for murder that backfired. The intended victim was you, his wife. Oh, no. Keep talking, Doveman. <laughs> Why, Marlowe? I'd rather keep you guessing. I wouldn't. Duck, baby! Oh! oh. My shoulder! Now the man said keep talking. I, 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 I can't. I'm hit. You'll be again if you don't. So you know. Stay out of this, Marlowe. Come on, Doberman. I'm not going to ask you again. Look, I'm not even going to let you fall until you tell the rest. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll tell you. I overheard Morton ask him. Tom, go to your place first, Sawyer. Pick up one of your horseshoes, and then he went to the stables near the Black Stallion store. The horseshoe in his hat. Oh, Sawyer, my shoulder. Come on, Doberman, you're not finished yet. Well, I, I figured that he was going to... To knock his wife out, leave Sawyer's horseshoe where it'll be found, then half make it look like an accident that would fool nobody, huh? What went wrong, Doberman? Why didn't it work? Well, he, he approached Thunder from the right side instead of the left. The horse got excited, kicked out, and... Caught him. The dude. Now, let go, Sawyer. Sure, Doberman. With pleasure. It was a slow but steady two hours of first aid and questions and answers mixed with a San Bernardino deputy sheriff who couldn't quite get over it before Orville Doberman was on his way to a hospital that featured barred windows. Mrs. Doverman, a complete innocent, was on her way back to Los Angeles. And Buck Lawson, Judy, and I were in the bunkhouse, watching Virgil Sawyer watch a pot full of water boil for coffee. Ranch style. Well, you know, you can't ever tell, Marlo. This whole thing might have just the right effect. Oh. Put the ranch on the map, I mean. <laughs> After all, it was a genuine 100% cowboy who saved the day for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's not right, Buck. Huh? It was Milo here. I only followed him. Coffee's ready, folks. Oh, yeah, oh, that's good, for me. Good. Let's go. What uh, <laughs> did make you go up there, Mr. Milo? Oh, a little precious stone, Virgil. An emerald that once fell out of Paul Morton's initial ring. But, Marlo, that happened a long time ago, three, four months. It was just after Paul had returned to uh, New York from Los Angeles. Yeah, and negotiations with Doveman. You see, honey, it was Mrs. Doveman, really, who found the missing emerald tonight and a pair of slacks that Orville had sent up here. Then that was proof that Paul must have been with Doverman in Los Angeles before. Yet they claimed to have met for the first time here at the ranch. Uh, yeah, that's what they claimed. That plus what you told me, Judy, made the man with the moving vans it. And, uh, yo, oh, hey, Virgil, that coffee's hot. Uh, but it's good. <laughs> well, anyway, since I told Doverman where you were and that you knew your husband had been dealing in black market silks, he took his cue accordingly. Yes, and fortunately, you, yours. Well, that makes it two people who tried to kill me tonight. My husband and his partner. The is a discouraging word Oh, fine And the skies are not cloudy all day Good night, gentlemen Virgil Sawyer made good coffee and lots of it So another hour went by before we finally broke up and... I was outside, smoking a cigarette and strolling toward my cabin in the start of a vacation that already had been postponed too long. But halfway there, I stopped the sound of raised voices ahead of me. A man and a woman were arguing violently, and a little away from them, on the porch of my cabin, watching the battle of the sexes with consternation while he waited for me, was Buck Lawson, mine host. <laughs> I turned quickly and hurried back to the bunkhouse where I knew Virgil Sawyer would put me up for the night. But I knew that early the next morning, I could sneak off, find a quiet, cool stream, and fish. A coyote high in the hill someplace said I had the right idea.
Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Charlotte Lawrence, Bill Johnstone, Bill Lally, Herb Butterfield, D.J. Thompson, Lou Krugman, and Jack Carrington. The special music is written by Richard O'Rant. <laughs> Be sure and be with us again next week when Philip Marlowe says... I went from a mansion in Bel Air to a cheap flat in Southgate, looking for a girl with a secret, who a man in a pork pie had a wise cracking secretary and a fat corpse didn't want me to find, but who I found anyway because of the quiet number. <laughs> highly individual, highly entertaining mystery adventure shows stand high among the top shows on CBS every Sunday. The Green Llama, Call the Police, Sam Spade. Go adventuring with them every Sunday when they come to you over most of these same CBS stations. This is Roy Rowan speaking. Now, stay tuned for Gangbusters, which follows immediately over most of these same CBS network stations. <laughs> This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The fourth bullet tore through the flesh on my left shoulder. There was nothing between him and me now except the tree. I stood there waiting. There were two more shots left in the gun. I caught the glint of the gun barrel in the moonlight, and then the granddaddy of all firecrackers blew up in my face. The New Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. This is your director, Bill Russo, inviting you to listen to Michael Shane, that reckless red-headed Irishman back at his old haunts in New Orleans in another transcribed episode. We call it The Hate That Killed. Seventy-five, eighty-five, eighty-six, eighty-seven. $3.87. Michael, you old capitalist, how do you do it? Mr. Shane, Mr. Shane, you've got to listen to me. You've got to help me. I do. Oh, oh, Sanderson. Hey, you look better in your newspaper pictures. I thought I made it clear I wasn't interested in your case. But on the telephone, you wouldn't let me tell you what I want. I've got plenty of money. I'm not interested in your money either. Right on that door, it says Michael Shane, private detective, doesn't it? Well, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. It cost me two bits a letter, too. You said something about somebody wanting to kill you. Yeah. Why don't you take your troubles to the police? I can't. I don't have anything to tell them. You think I'm a crank, don't you? No, I think you're very charming, Mr. Sanderson. Just keep your voice down. I know. I know a weak, dissipated body and a mind that's crazy half the time. But if you live one day, just one day, in the atmosphere I do, you'd be shaking just like me. I tell you, I tell you, death is in the air. Yeah, yeah, sure. What's the matter? That scare you? I suppose you like divorce cases, alimony, spying on women. I'll bet you like spying on women. Well, that's enough, Buster. Goodbye now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I tell you, I, I'm going to die. Not in my office. I'm busy. Beat it. You don't, you don't believe me. Look, look, just tell me one thing. Yeah? One thing. Why did the insurance company refuse to sell me any life insurance? From where I sit, you look like a mighty bad risk. No. No, I've had an examination from my personal physician. There's nothing wrong with me. That is a matter of opinion. They wouldn't tell me the real reason. That was just an out. All right, so what? Just find out, that's all. Just find out why they refused me. Well, it'll cost you 20 a day in expenses. Oh, here's my address. You, yeah. You'll find three houses on the estate. Mine's on the uh, on the right of the big house. I know all about you, Sanderson, and your famous father. He died the other day, didn't he? Yes. Yes, he's dead. And he wasn't my father. Huh? He was my stepfather. That's why I used the name of Mark Sanderson. But his corruption lives on like... Like something rotten inside you that you can't get out. Like something in your blood and your heart. And you can't tear it out. Yeah, that's cute. You ought to set it to music. Are you always this jittery? Why shouldn't I be jittery? I, uh... Do you, do you have some water? Water? 
You mean you drink water, too? Yes, sir. My, my medicine, my, my capsules, you know, my nerves. You'll find some water down the hall. You'll, you'll let me know tonight, huh? You'll find out? Yeah, yeah. I got a pretty good hunch why they refused your policy. You do? Why? Why? Because they probably don't expect you to live very long, Mr. Sanderson. <laughs> We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. He was a fancy client, all right. Mark Sanderson, stepson of the late Gregory Lawson. He was still young, maybe 30, but all his stepfather's filthy millions could never make a man out of him or give him anything decent out of life. He sat in my office, slobbering with fear, his eyes dull and empty. I don't need clients like that, but the insurance company angle intrigued me. Why had they refused Mark Sanderson's policy? Well, I turned toward my phone, feeling like a Hollywood agent doing his best for a client he didn't have much hope for, and dialed the life insurance company. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak to Miss Bennett. It was the old shovel on. Miss Bennett was maybe the 30th vice president in charge of bathtub accidents. We cannot give out that information, but if you speak to Mr. Forsyth, he's the branch manager. All I had to do was mention Mark Sanderson's name, and there'd be a long pause on the other end, and then... No, sir, we can't discuss our policy with you, Mr. Shane. The matter is closed. It is entirely within our own discretion whether or not we choose to insure Mr. Sanderson's life or anyone else's. No, I wasn't getting anywhere. Nobody was going to tell me the real reason they'd refused Mark Sanderson life insurance. I got Dave Sizenby on the phone. Dave used to be a private eye and then went to work as a detective for the insurance company. He said he'd see what he could do. I waited about ten minutes and then... Jane speaking. Mike? Yeah, Dave. It's hush, hush. Hey, what's going on? You're beginning to make me think Sanderson really has something to worry about. I don't know. All I could tell you is that it might be a good idea to see a lawyer by the name of Almsby. Who? Almsby. O-L-M-S-B-Y. In the Lee building downtown. That's all? No, one more thing. You, uh, didn't get the information from me. Attorney at law. The office was easily as old as Olsby himself. About 70. Dried up like a prune. His voice was like parchment, dry as dust and ready to crack. You're a shrewd young man by the look of you. And if you have in your head the good sense to avoid unnecessary trouble, you will desist from inquiring into the affairs of the Larson family. Well, that's as pretty a turn threat as I've ever heard. It's excellent advice, Mr. Shane. As for your question, I am not at liberty to divulge any information. You mean to me? To you or anyone else. I realize Mark's hysteria has caused you some trouble. And as the family attorney, I'll be glad to pay. Smooth. I didn't think I was going to take this case, Mr. Ormsby, but you know I'm getting more and more interested. Then you will get yourself more and more involved. Well, that's my business, Mr. Ormsby. Mr. Shane... You must anticipate a short life. Could be, Mr. Olsby. At least a happy one. So long, Pop. Well, I found out a few things before I went out to the swamps where the old man had dug in after he retreated from the New Orleans reform movement. He'd built a large house for himself, a smaller one for his second wife and stepdaughter, and another for his stepson. He kept his cousin Agatha with him. Seems he separated from his immediate family, kept tight hold on them, but didn't want them too close. They'd finally died two days ago after a long illness. I went down there to his little kingdom in the swamp and got a funny feeling. A little chill, even though it was a warm night. Little rolling wisps of fog. Night sounds that had a death knell in them. There were lights on downstairs in the old man's house, but I headed for young Mark Sanderson's place. It was dark, and I thought I'd mosey around the house to the back when... Somebody was playing hide-and-seek with me. Okay, Uh, take it easy. Who is it? 
Just a friend, pal. A word to the wise thing. All right, I'm listening. You're not wanted around here. Who doesn't want me? Nobody. Okay, I get the message. Why don't you guys ever listen? This is for your own good, pal. I don't want to have to use this blackjack. You made a mistake. Never tip your mitt. You asked for it. Yeah, you move pretty fast for a big guy, but not fast enough. All right, I got the blackjack now. Come on, get up. Yeah, now beat it. Shane, you surprise me. Must be something to it, after all, the bigger they are. Well, that was quite an exhibition. Oh, are they wearing revolvers with dinner dresses this year? Who are you? Mike Shane. There's a flagstone path here. Let's get around front, out of the shadows. You must be Celia, Mark's sister. But do you, uh, you have to keep pointing that gun at me? Yes, for a while. Well, anyhow, I'm glad to... Oh. Yes? Oh, my. What's the matter? Haven't you ever seen a woman before? Not very often like you. Is that really the color of your hair? My hair has been red since the day I was born. You've got nice shoulders. Oh, I like yours better. You're going to catch cold in that outfit. You have what so many men lack these days. A sense of virility and strength. Well, that comes from eating all my vegetables. What are you snooping around here for? I was looking for Mark. Oh. You're the detective he hired. Check. Now you do interest me. Who's the man you were fighting with? Don't you know? No, I don't, Mr. Shane, isn't it? That's right. Mark and Aunt Agatha and Mother are in the house. Oh? The reading of Stepfather's Will tonight. Um... Mr. Elmsby, the lawyer. May I come along? Why not? Don't go in. They've already started. So what? I want to hear that word. Who's in there? They all are. I don't want to interrupt. I'll open the door a little. Yeah. Quite a gathering. Yes. Mother, Aunt Agatha, Mom. Hold it on. on. Listen. All my property, real and personal, owned by me at the time of my death, to that person from among my four heirs who outlives all other persons. Whether it be my cousin Agatha, my stepdaughter Celia, my dissolute stepson Mark, or my neglectful wife Margaret. Why do I do something like that all the time? He's good. Shall be bequeathed, therefore, only after the death of my last heir but one. And in the event my inheritor cannot by law inherit, then these goods shall pass to Philip Almsby or his heirs and his dad. <laughs> That's it. That's going, Mr. Shane. Okay. Well, we waited for you, Miss Celia. We didn't know where you were. Thank you, Mr. Almsby. Mr. Shane, did you hear that? Did you hear? There's your answer, Mark. That's the reason your insurance was refused. Yes, he couldn't stop hating. It's so obvious, isn't it? Dear father wants us to kill one another off. Mother. (laughs) Poor mother. He couldn't leave you alone, could he? Even after he died. My mother, Mr. Shane. Mrs. Larson. And my aunt Agatha, father's cousin. Apparently, cousin Agatha was bored by the proceedings. Oh, and Agatha's always taking catnaps. Agatha, Agatha, wake up. Maud, stop shaking her. Oh, she doesn't want to wake up. I... Oh, Aunt Agatha. She... She's not moving. She... She's not breathing. For a very good reason. Your Aunt Agatha's taken her last catnip. She's dead. <laughs> We'll return in a moment to the new adventures of Michael Shane and the hate that killed. I didn't want to take the case in the first place, but it was the insurance angle that got Why was Mark Sanderson's insurance refused? I couldn't get any information from the insurance company. I couldn't get it from the lawyer Olmsby either. But then I found out what it was all about. The insurance company must have gotten wind of the terms of the old man's will. (laughs) And what a will. 
Old Gregory Larson's wife and Mark and Celia and his cousin Agatha, all of them were heirs in a sort of ten little Indians routine. All his money to go to the last one to stay alive or to lawyer Olmsby. But the old man wanted them to kill each other off. It was that simple. I wanted a few words with my client, Mark, and I waited while Sergeant Lavery went through his routine with him and then decided to bust it up. I want protection. I'm a taxpayer. I don't care what you have to do. Put me in jail if you want to. Now, I slow down, protection. Sanderson. You'll blow a gasket. Where do you fit in here, Shane? Well, like I told you, Sergeant, this is my client. I suppose now you're convinced someone is going to try to kill me, Shane? I had a talk with your sister, Celia, Mark. You didn't tell me you lived here a few days before your stepfather died. Celia and I came here just before he died. But it didn't mean anything. You heard his will. Yeah. Uh, Sergeant. What? Why don't you lock him up? Maybe jail is the safest place for him. Okay. Speak to Denton inside. Yes. Yes, I will. I will. All right, Shane. Your client's taken care of. You can go home now. No, I think I'll stick around, Sergeant. Why? You think there's going to be more killings? Well, now, Sergeant, don't you? I was curious about Margaret Larson, Mark's mother. Why hadn't she been with her husband the last days of his life? Why had he called Mark and Celia, not her? The more time I spent in this atmosphere of death and hate, the more jittery I got. Margaret Larson was sitting in her living room. A low fire crackled in the fireplace. That was the only light in the room. She sat erect in an old, creaky rocking chair by the fire, a light glinting on her dark brown eyes that were just a little too bright. When will it stop, Mr. Shane? As long as I can remember, it's been like this. The fear, the hate. I don't remember anything else. It's never been normal. His hatred touched all of us. That horrible, sick man inside his house. Never going outside. But you felt him all the time. You once thought enough of him to marry you. That was my mistake. He hated you more than the others. Yes. Mr. Shane. Yes? How did Agatha die? She was poisoned. What kind of poison? I don't know yet. What about Celia and Mark? What's going to happen to them? Uh, Mark, by his own request, is in jail or on his way. Jail? Yeah, he said he wanted protection. Oh. And Celia, she's the kind who can take care of herself. Hey, look, I'm getting the willies or something. Can't we have some more light in here? I... What's the matter? Mr. Shane. You know what? In all the years I've spent in this swamp land, I've, I've seemed to develop an extra sense What are you trying to say? There's someone in this room. I don't hear anyone. You weren't supposed to. Oh. What? Oh, the sucker for a left hook. My pal with a warning. Don't move, pal. Don't even blink your eyes. I got a gun. I'm not getting too close to you. Come back for a rematch? I, uh, I better answer the phone. You better not. You. Yes. Answer it. Hello? Yes, Sergeant. This is Mrs. Larson. <gasps> Thank you, Sergeant. What is it, Mrs. Larson? Mark. Isn't it funny? I, I can hardly feel anything. It's Mark. Poison? The same as Agatha. Where? In his car. He stopped to take a drink. There was poison in it. The same poison that killed Agatha. <laughs> all right, Shane. This is all very touching. Come on, let's go. No, wait, just I a said, minute. Let's go. I'm getting out of this place. It's giving me the creeps. Mrs. Larson, tell Celia about Mark. She's in danger. Tell her. That's just so you'll know it's loaded, Shane. I'm sorry to spoil your rug, lady. Well, Shane, I won't aim at the rug next time. He was smart. He kept me at arm's length. The way he handled me, you'd think I had the plague. He was so calm and so careful, I began to worry. Give me the nervous guys. Give me the guys who think they're tough. I can take care of myself with them. But this bird knew exactly what he was going to do. He acted like a trapper who'd caught a wildcat and was measuring him for the kill. We went down the hall and out the rear door. If I was going to do anything, it better be pretty quick. It had turned cold and the damp fog clung to my clothes, got into my nostrils. I took a little path that led into the swamp. 
Funny, I kept worrying about Celia, about protecting her, not about myself. It was all screwy, sort of detached, almost a dream sequence. Things were happening too fast, and I couldn't stop them. All right, how much farther into this swamp, laddie? We're here. Okay. Uh, go stand up against that tree over there. Here? Right there. <laughs> it was a big, fat old cypress tree, and I loved it. He thought it was going to be like an execution without a blindfold, but you can tell about these punks. You can tell when their finger itches. Before he lifted his sights, I was around on the other side, and his bullets tore chest high into the big, fat tree trunk. <laughs> Maybe your feet are showing change. <laughs> I got plenty of time. I got nothing but time. This is the most important thing I ever did in my life, and I'm going to do it right. Now, careful, Shane. I'm starting to come around. Oh, it was going to be a dilly. I ducked my head out and <laughs> pulled it back in. If I counted right, that made four and one in the house. Five. It was starting to edge around. It cut like a knife through the meat on my shoulder. It must have been just a nick because it only burnt. It didn't slug me. Six. He was still edging around, coming a little closer, but he still wasn't taking any chances on my jumping him. A nick, you Shane? <laughs> Watch it now. I'm gonna run. Which side, Shane? <laughs> that spun me around, caught my other arm. Bullet hit solid. I almost went down. Seven. <laughs> you counting them, Shane? I got a couple of more clips when this one's finished. Here I come again. Who wrote that story about the hunter who wasn't happy unless he was hunting a human being? He must have laughed like this punk. He must have been off his trolley. I caught a look at the weasel's face and then... <laughs> it was like the granddaddy of all fuses blowing out. I'd heard about people feeling the wind of a bullet, but this wasn't a wind. It was a gentle sigh, a little puff. He missed my nose by a 32nd of an inch. And that was eight. I dashed out after him. But he was on his way, fumbling with his gun, putting the new clip in while he ran. Only he wasn't watching where he was going. He tripped over a log. I pulled up short and I stared. There were several logs laid out in a rough circle, sort of protecting a patch of ground. Ground? A punk had tripped and gone in head first and started to sink. His body thrashed around. The head came up covered with what looked like oily mud. Only then I knew what it was. Quicksand. It didn't take 15 seconds. And he disappeared. Even if I wanted to help him, I couldn't. He came too fast. I looked and he was gone. A couple of big bubbles came up, slick and moldy. And then that was all. <laughs> back out to the house, my mind was wrestling with angles and worrying about Celia so hard, I almost forgot I had a slug in my shoulder. I could see a light on the second floor of Mrs. Larson's house. I prayed that that meant Celia was still alive. I ran to the front door and began pounding. Why, Mr. Shane? Oh, why all the commotion? Oh, you're still okay. How about your mother? She's fast asleep in her bed. Come on in. Yeah. What's that? Oh, her cat must have followed me here. That's good luck, Mr. Shane. And all new all in superstition. Let her in. Yeah. Sit down. Now, what... Oh, Mr. Shane, you're bleeding. Yeah, I almost forgot. Here. Let's get that jacket off. Okay. Oh, easy. Sorry. Yeah. Now, I'll just tear the shirt open. <laughs> You uh, heard about your brother? Yes. Mother told me. In a way, I, I think perhaps he's better off. He never was very happy. My stepfather saw to that. Oh. Sorry. I've got to clean it out, you know. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Celia, I'm going nuts trying to figure this thing out. Your stepfather hoped you'd kill each other off. He planned it that way. But you and your mother wouldn't bite on that kind of bait. Thank you. The only other answer is Olmsby. He gets everything if all of you are taken care of. I don't have anything on him. It, it won't gel. I'm afraid this will sting a little. <laughs> oh. There. It's all over until the doctor takes over. Here, have a little of this. It's from my dear departed stepfather's wine cellar. Napoleon Brandy, 1812. Yeah. I'll often get a whiff of anything that rare. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. That was clumsy of me. I'll pour you another. <laughs> Anyhow, that stray cat's going to have a good time. He likes Napoleon Brandy, too. Yes, he does, doesn't he? You know, I think I'll join you. I have a weakness for good brandy. Fine. 
I have a weakness for women who have a weakness for good brandy. <laughs> Here you are, Mr. Shane. I... Mike. Hey. You were right, Sid. That cat was good luck. You'll be stiff in another few minutes. What? Yeah, that brandy is spiked with enough poison to kill Gargantua. Where'd you get this brandy, Celia? Why, I... I think Mr. Elmsby gave it to me. We'll be back in a moment with Mike Shane and the thrilling climax to our story. Thinking about Olmsby almost sent me off on a tangent. The big idea was slow in coming, but it paid off. The whole thing fell into place. It was kind of hard to see all at once. It, it came out gradually. Celia, your mother didn't go into your stepfather's house before he died, did she? She hasn't been inside that house in 15 years, Mr. Shane. Oh, that's it. And it's so simple, so so very simple. Hey, hey, let me have that brandy bottle. I'm taking it down to headquarters for a little fingerprint job. I don't understand. I'll be back. Now, you probably don't know it, but you called me Mike a few seconds ago. It's enough of a start for me. But what about Mr. Olmsby? There's a payoff for him, too. It's hard to believe, Shane. There's no other explanation, Sergeant. Olmsby was the only one who knew the exact terms of the will. He'd get everything if the family were all out of the way. Yeah, he had a good idea what would happen. And he decided to wait it out. That's why he hired that, that character to get rid of me. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Almsby didn't want anybody to get in the way of the natural course of events. Yeah, an old man hates so much he can't let it die with him. He wasn't satisfied until he'd fixed it so his rotten touch reached out from the grave. It's still hard to believe, but you can't argue with fingerprints. <laughs> Sure. There was only one answer. The fingerprints on the bottle of Napoleon brandy and the fingerprints on Mark's flask and Aunt Agatha's special milk bottle, they all matched. His plan was simple. He figured all the suspicion would rest on his wife after Agatha and Mark and Celia were dead. Yes, the fingerprints all matched. They were the fingerprints of Gregory Larson. He kept right on killing even after he was dead. There's a moral in all this somewhere. Something about evil turning on the evil door and paying him back. I, uh, I haven't quite figured it out yet, but Sid is a pretty clever girl. I think I'll show her how the other half of New Orleans lives. Take her to dinner tonight and uh, discuss it with gestures. <laughs> Director Bill Russo again. Our story was based on characters created by Brett Halliday. Our music is composed and conducted by John Duffy, and Michael Shane is portrayed by Jeff Chandler. The New Adventures of Michael Shane is a Don W. Sharp production, transcribed in Hollywood and distributed exclusively by the Broadcasters Guild. Next week, you'll hear Michael Shane in another thrilling adventure. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This one began with a bedlam and got worse as I bumped into a burglar, a bookie, a Boswell, and a body and a big shot named B. And before it was all over, everyone had lost his head because the headless peacock had moved. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. With Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Headless Peacock. The day had been eight noisy hours of international complications, local vintage. That it started when a Frenchman from Beverly Hills who spoke no English 
hired me to find the Filipino houseboy he thought had stolen the family silverware to sell to a prosperous downtown Chinese. However, it had played differently since the Frenchman had been wrong all the way. And both the houseboy and the silverware had turned up in the cool of his own basement, where the servant had gone to do his polishing and comfort. Which was hardly the end of things, because even now, as I slumped behind the desk in my office exhausted, the accused Chinese, who was highly insulted, was on hand together with a nasty pet terrier tucked underneath his arm to tell me all about it. And just to top that off, the door was suddenly flung open and Bedlam really set in. Because the new arrival, who was maybe 28 with green eyes and sparkled in an almost pretty face, was also a redhead with demeanor to match. And it was obvious that one, she wanted to hire me, two, she was in a hurry, and more important, she really... She... Uh, hey! Just a minute! Hold it, both of you. Now, Mr. Tang, I've had enough. Here on your way out, take this. It's the Frenchman's address in Beverly Hills. The mistake was his. See him. Goodbye, sir. Thanks, honey. It was going to be me or that windbag with Terry any minute. What can I do for you? Plenty, and all of it in a hurry. Sit down and listen hard, will you, Marlo? My name is Dennis. Front part, Artie. Oh, which is short for what? The whole thing. It's really Ruth Dennis. R.D., see? Oh, that's cute. R.D., Artie. Yeah, what's the problem? It's a guy I love, Marlo. He's tall, blonde, and his name is Gordon Holzer, and he sells shoes. But don't mm. laugh, because when he connects, he does it by the carload. Mm. Also, I figure he loves me, and at the moment, is in lots of trouble. Why? Because when I came in on the train late this afternoon, Gordon wasn't on hand with the usual brass band. He wasn't at my apartment either. But a note was. Said he had to work late at the office. I waited an hour and then gave him a ring. He told me he wasn't in, hadn't been, for two days. Next, I called his home. He has a bungalow up on Vista Del Mar. 7700 North. Mm-hmm. And when you got no answer, you started to worry, huh? Yeah, so I went up there. Gordon, of course, wasn't around. But somebody else was. Somebody small on the natty side. With no more eyebrows than a goldfish. He belonged to a new sedan, long and black. Did you talk to him? Oh, better than that, we wrestled. You got a cigarette? No. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Thanks. Darn. Right. See, Marlo, this guy was snooping around the place, so I decided to find out a few things. I made believe I had a gun in my pocket, and I told him to put his hands up. Oh, fine. Well, it worked for a while. Which brings us to the wrestling. Huh? Yes. When I mentioned Gordon's name, he knocked me down. But he wasn't very big, so I managed to hit him once with my bag before he got away. Also, I ripped his coat pocket open. And here, this fell out. The newspaper clipping. A picture of a fat hunk of jewelry that was once stolen from someone named Isaac B. Stolen from Isaac who? B is in Bzzz. Oh. Look, it's a peacock with the head broken off. But with a tail that's loaded with diamonds, rubies, and emeralds. What's it mean? What is it... Marlo, that's the reason I'm here. I don't know. Mm. You'll turn the clipping over. You'll see that the theft must have happened quite a while ago because the ad on the back features a Christmas special. Tell me, you figure that Gordon stole this from Mr. B? Uh, well, no, I, I don't. Well, then why'd you come to me instead of the police? Well, You I... what? Come on, Artie. Let's have it all, huh? Okay. That's better. I don't suppose it's smart not to tell you anyway. Gordon isn't all shoe salesman. He's part lunatic. When it comes to the horses, you know, the right pony a day keeps the doctor's bills away. I thought I'd cured him. Now I'm less than sure. So you figured that maybe he got in too deep while you didn't know about it, and now he's trying to even things up by playing with stolen property, is that it? I hope not. But even if it is, I still want to help him. Now here, here's a hundred dollars, Marl. You go to work for me, yes or no? Yes, on one condition. All right, what? If I find out the facts and pass them on to you, until and if he turns up crooked, and I drop it, agreed? Agreed. The lady left, and in that hour that followed, I was on my own in the files of the Hollywood Times. I learned that Isaac B. was a 70-year-old eccentric with curly hair, a bulbous nose, no chin, a million dollars, and a mansion on West Adams Boulevard. He had a Napoleonic complex and was a great philanthropist, as long as the grant in question would perpetuate the name of Isaac B. About the headless peacock, I learned little except that it had never been recovered and that the gems in the tail were of an unusual cut and would be hard to peddle. So it was 8.30 when I finally dropped the oversized bronze knocker monogrammed I.B., be, after which a man about 40 with a sallow complexion and a voice as delicate as spun glass opened the door halfway. Uh, yes, sir? I'd like to see Mr. Isaac B., please. Name's Marlowe. And your business? Personal. I'm a private detective. And you? Me? Why, I... 
I'm Everett Ransom. I'm Mr. B's biographer, but also Mr. Marlowe. I act as his aide. Now, if it's about money for some cause, you'll have to follow the usual channels and write to you Mr. B. You can stop right there, Boswell. I'm not after money, just information. About what? A piece of jewelry that was stolen from Mr. B, a headless peacock. The peacock? You know of its whereabouts. I didn't say that. Now, do I see Mr. B or no? You, you, young man. Open up, Ransom. Bless him either. Yes, sir. We'll sit over here in the boy. How cozy. Thank you, Ransom. Mr. B, my name is Philip Marlowe. Yes, 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 yes. I heard the private detective, the peacock and all that. Well, what do you have to say? Not very much. I understand the peacock was stolen from you some months ago. Why, huh? yes. Yes, shortly before Christmas. It was one of Mr. B's favorites. Priceless is both a museum piece and for the hundred thousand dollars worth of we jewels. We all the know that, Ransom. Yes, sir. Shall I, uh, shall I go now, sir? No. That busted me for the Young People's Club. I want you to take it with you before you leave tonight. I'll show you the inscription change I want made the first thing in the morning. You can keep it in your apartment until then. Yes, sir. Yes, now, Marlowe. Get to the point. Quickly, please. All right. Mr. B, a client of mine... Whose uh, name is what? Miss Ruth Dennis, if it matters, is worried about a boyfriend. Which concerns the uh, peacock in what way? I don't know. Unless you can tell me something about a natty little man who's short on eyebrows. Eh? Yeah? The last scene, he was carrying a newspaper picture of the bird. Mean anything? No, no, no. Is that all you know about the theft, Mr. Marlowe? Just about. That and the name Gordon Holzer in a bungalow on Vista Del Mar near uh, Franklin. Holzer, Holzer, bungalow. What are you talking about, Marlowe? Shots in the dark, Mr. B. Oh, no shot. When they miss, they miss a mile. Good night, sir. Outside in my car, as I started away from the curb, I glanced into the rearview mirror and saw the reflection of a sedan that was also just beginning to move. A sedan that was both very long and very black. I kept to the quiet streets and stayed under 30 until I'd gone about two miles, and then, at the next intersection, a busy one, I made my move, which was a sudden spurt of the thick traffic via a wide left turn that produced screeching tires and uh, frank opinions. You stupid jerk! I swung around the block once, made it back onto the quiet street just in time to catch sight of the sedan going by fast. I followed it, and 20 minutes later, when it braked to a stop in Beverly Hills in front of a hat shop marked Lester's, I did the same. I piled out of my car and walked quickly toward what I thought would be the natty man without eyebrows. But when the door of the sedan opened, it was a woman, blonde and beautiful, who ran to the door of the shop, unlocked it, and hurried inside to where a telephone was ringing. There was an alley beside the building, and I ran back to where I could see inside. There were five telephones side by side in a phony front cabinet that spelled Bookie. And on the wall above a publicity picture of a natty man without eyebrows, sitting in the middle of a bunch of zany Why, hats. No, no, Mr. Holder, Beautiful blonde was talking on one of the telephones. And when I moved closer, I was happy to hear her address the party at the other end of the line as none other than Gordon Holder. Uh-huh. He's on his way up there now. Well, where are you? Oh, returning home. That's fine. He's still in the mailbox? Good. Of course, Mr. Holder, you decided to pay that 15000 for sure this time, haven't you? You know, Mr. Lester wouldn't want you to disappoint him. I moved yet. out of the alley quietly and went back. Entered the shop through the front door, which was still open. Beautiful blonde was just hanging up the phone when I stepped into the light. What? Good evening. Who are you? What do you want here? A new hat. Something chick, chick. Any suggestions? Yeah. Get out of here. This shop is closed for business. Bedding included? Be- oh. Why, sir, there must be some mistake. This is a hat shop. With five hidden telephones and a boss man who collects pictures of headless peacocks for a hobby? I... Sorry, baby, I don't buy it. Not even as a conversation piece. So shall we start all over again, huh, baby? Well, (laughs) yes. Why don't we? And with this to keep us from changing the subject. A heavy service 45, honey. Looks a little bulky in that dainty hand, don't you think? It'll look worse when it explodes in your face. Now, who are you? By name, Philip Marlowe. By occupation? A private detective. And just to keep the interview rolling, I sleep in pajamas, tops and bottoms alike. Love Chinese Stay cooking, back. pressed almond don't duck in particular. Closer. And don't, don't prefer blonde. Give me that. <laughs> you big bum. I don't know why I didn't shoot. I do. But lest we lose the question and answer period, your turn. Name. Patience. Oh, no. <laughs> What's the rest of it? Hancock. A very fine Virginia name, Mr. Marlowe. Anything else? Uh, yeah, there is. What's your connection with Mr. Lester, Gordon Holzer, and the Headless Peacock? 
If it's any of your concern, I happen to be Mr. Lester's business associate. But believe me, when he gets back from Pasadena, he... <gasps> oh, I'm... You I'm... mean just what you said. The man I'm looking for is in Pasadena. Don't look. Thank you, honey child. The interview's now closed because as of this minute, I'm off for the home of the Rose Bowl. Good night, patients. <laughs> I was going to Pasadena like Patience Hancock was going to join the Campfire Girls. But as long as the little Virginian wanted it that way, I couldn't see any reason not to play ball. So after I called my client and brought her up to date, blow by blow, I headed for 7700 North Vista Del Mar in what I figured was a business transaction, headless peacock included. I parked away from the place which was cedar shingles under healthy ivy and a single lamp at work in the living room. And I walked up to where I could see that a man, blonde, tall, and alone, and hat, coat, and frightened face, was about to leave. When the door opened, I took that as my cue to switch 38 from shoulder holster and announce myself. Well, what do you want with me? Words, Mr. Holzer, lots of them. You see, I work for a... Oh, Mr. Holzer, that man on the floor there behind you, that natty little man without eyebrows, seems quite still as and shot to death. He is. But I didn't do it. Honest, I didn't. Now, let me out of here. I gotta go. Start running? Come on, Holtz. I'm not all champ. Get back inside. Well, all right. But I can explain this. Oh, sure. Sure, it's easy. Like one, you lost too much money playing the horses through this dead bookie here who used to double as a milliner. Boy. And two, to square yourself with him, you got mixed up with a hundred thousand bucks worth of headless peacock. Oh, right. And three... Mr. Holzer, as of just now, you had an appointment with said milliner, which body on the floor here says got out of hand. Do you care to add anything? Like how you got the peacock away from Isaac B. and what took you so long getting around to peddling it? I don't know any Isaac B., nor did I... Nor did you what? Outside the window. Somebody's moving. Yeah, somebody with a gun. Duck holds it. It's going to be like... I'm going to shoot! <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, Sunday afternoon, a perfect time for music. Sunday afternoon, the time of the week when almost everyone takes time for relaxation. Combine Sunday afternoon with music and relaxation, and you have the Symphonette and the Coral Ears, two outstanding CBS musical programs. Most of these same CBS network stations bring you both programs every Sunday. Relax and enjoy them tomorrow. And now with our star, Gerald Moore, we return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Headless Peacock. It had come one, two, three. A corpse on the floor, shots through the window, and Gordon holds her out the back door while bullets made lights out. And Marlowe on the floor, the smart move. It made this the time to call the law, so in case the character with a gun was still hanging around outside. I left the lights off, fumbled my way to the phone, and dialed 116 in the dark. A minute later, I had Detective Lieutenant Matthews on the wire. So you got a corpse, huh, Marlo? Give it to me again, will you? Who, where, and why? A guy named Lester, supposed to be a hat designer in Beverly Hills, was taxed up better as a bookie. He was shot to death here at 7700 Vista Del Mar. Whose place is that? Uh, One Gordon Holsey. He has his name on the mailbox. Hey, got a motive, Marlo? Well, it's a theory. Could be that Lester put on too much pressure trying to collect 15 grand holes or owed him from bad bets on the ponies. There's more, but it'll keep till you get here, Lieutenant. Uh, okay, Marlo. A couple of the boys are on their way now. Mm-hmm. I'll be over myself later. Stick around, will you? Yeah, okay. Goodbye. Marlo, you promised me you wouldn't call in the police, but I heard enough to know you just finished talking to them. Didn't you, you two-faced cheat? You bet I did, cutie. What's more, when you hired I'm me... I'm not I... through. I want to know something else. What are you doing here in the dark, and where is Gordon? All right. That order, first the lights are out to keep me from being shot in the back. And second, your boyfriend Holzer left on a double because I was about to find out why Lester's body is here on Holzer's living room floor. Lester's body? You heard me. You you mean that little man is in here? Dead? Very much so. And and don't burn yourself out on that shock surprise routine. Marlowe, I swear, I... Okay, turn on a light and show me. Where is this corpse, if any? Baby, don't forget the last time lights were on in here, the room felt like the receding end of a shooting gallery. I didn't see any firing line when I came in. Yeah, that's a point. But there are two ways of looking at it. Will you turn on a light, or will I? Okay, okay, we'll play it your way. Yeah, take a good look. Oh, Marlowe, it's him all right. 
Same little man. Artie, you knew I was coming over here. You knew the setup, and I was close to winning an argument with Holzer. And when somebody broke it up by shooting through that window, straight enough not to hit anything, even though Holzer was a perfect target, add it up to yourself, baby. Oh, it wasn't me, Marlo. Please believe me. You do, don't you? Let's look in this bag of yours first, honey. <laughs> Give me that. Yeah, in a minute. Ah, well, that's one thing in your favor. No gun. Could have dropped it in the shrubbery on your way to the door, of course. Here's what I really want anyway. My keys? What do you want them for? I'll tell you later. Well, that's the boys in blue and just in time. Yeah, you louse. In time for what? The whole lot of you is a material witness. But, uh, I've got work to do and I want to get it done without you screaming at me all the way. Oh, I wish I'd never hired you. I wish I'd never heard of and you. And another thing, if you're playing me for a patsy kid, that's only the beginning. You'll need a deep well full of wishes before it's over, so come on, behave yourself. I told the two prowl car cops no more than I'd already told Lieutenant Matthews, except that Artie should be held because she was Holzer's girl. That plus the small lie that I'd cleared with the lieutenant to leave as soon as help showed, and I was out the door, into my own car, and pointed toward Artie's place, which was on Tamarind. I figured there was a good chance Holzer would head there first, and if I moved fast, I might catch up with him before the police did. Artie's place was dark, which could mean anything under the circumstances, so I dug in my pocket for the keys I'd taken from a purse and started for a door when footsteps behind me changed my mind. Oh, Marlowe. Mr. Marlowe, say, this is a stroke of good luck finding you here. That depends. How'd you manage it, Mr. Ransom? Why, Mr. Beard had me trying to locate you since about an hour after your interview this evening. I checked everywhere and finally looked up your client's name in the phone book, got this address, and, uh, well, here you are. Yeah, yes, I know. Why have you been after me? What's all the excitement? And make it fast. I'm in a hurry. Uh, yes. You see, your call this evening intrigued Mr. B and me very much. And after you left, we naturally began discussing the theft of the peacock again. Naturally? Look, Ransom, get to some point, will you? I got things to do. Oh, certainly, Mr. Marlowe. Well, sir, the point is that in going over in our minds the days preceding the theft, we both recall a man named Holzer or, or Holter or something very close to that. Mm -hmm. He came to the house one day claiming to represent a certain philanthropy. He, um, he was a fake, of course, and we never saw him again, but it was less than a week later that we discovered the peacock was gone. Stolen. What this man look like, you remember? Well, I most assuredly do. He was bald, about 50 and fat. No, no, it couldn't possibly be the same man. Oh, Oh, you found Mr. Holzer then? Once, briefly, yeah. Uh, now, there's no resemblance. Oh, I see. Well, I... I don't know how I'm going to break the news to Mr. B. He's upset all over again. I... I can't tell you how much that headless peacock means to him. Try saying a hundred thousand bucks. Uh, Mr. Marlowe, have you run across anything else tonight other than that newspaper clipping that would seem to be connected with the pin in any way? I, am. Um, I can arrange a reward, you know. No, nothing. I'm sorry. Well, good night, Mr. Ransom. If anything comes up about headless peacocks, I'll call you as soon as... as... What is it? What did you find? A note stuck in the door. Oh, maybe I should... No, no, this. no. No, I can handle it, really. Dearest Dottie, I didn't realize how fast things got out of hand. I must have lost my mind. I'm going to undo all the wrong I've done, and I'm getting out. Love, Gordon. Yes, I should have listened to a smart girl in the first place. What? Why, Mr. Marlowe, the fellow sounds desperate. Yeah, he's got a right to. That natty little man I mentioned earlier at night is dead. <gasps> murdered. Oh, great Scott. But, but then, Mr. Marlowe, then how can this man possibly undo all the wrong he's done, as he says in that note? That beats me. But one thing is sure. It hands my little client a nice clean slate, which makes my next stop the police. I'll see you, Mr. Ransom, in happy peacock hunting. <laughs> in my car and drove back the way I'd come to Gordon Holzer's house on Vista Del Mar. The prowl car was gone, but Lieutenant Matthew's sedan was angled in against the curb, the red spotlight still on. I parked and went in. The lieutenant, his hands jammed down in his pocket, stood with two other plain clothes men near the shattered window, while a photographer worked over the corpse on the floor. Artie was nowhere in sight. Matthew spotted me as soon as I walked in and bore it down on me with all the frivolity of a heavy cruiser. Marlowe, I thought I asked you to stick around. Yeah, yeah, you did. But I got an idea that wouldn't keep. Yeah? Did it prove anything? Not for sure. Where's the girl? Which one? You mean there's more? Oh, yeah. That red-headed fireball, Artie Dennis, you already know about. Yeah. The other one is a southern belle named Patience Hancock. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Long <laughs> to Lester. Yeah. Caught her snooping around outside trying to find out what had happened to him, and when we gave her the word, she blew her top. Mm. I got both of them locked up. Good. Say, did you get any facts out of patients? Yeah, plenty. No? Oh, uh, 
Your bookie theory was right, Marlowe. Thank you. Yeah. All we got to do now is find Holzer, wrap this up. Yeah, I'm not sure it's as simple as that, Lieutenant, uh, but it's the next step anyway. Come on, let's take a look out back, huh? When he left here, that's the way he ran. I already looked. It's a blank. Oh, really? It's the door that leads out to the alley. Mm. Here, this way. All right. And you see? Nothing. Mm. Must have beat it through here and out to the street. You wouldn't happen to know where... Now, what's the matter, Marlowe? What are you staring at? Hmm? Oh, that uh, that window there in the house right across the alley. Yeah. See the one with the lights on and the shade drawn? Oh, yeah. Some old geezer sitting in there. So what about it? The silhouette of his head on the shade, Matthews. Yeah? I won't forget that profile as long as I live. Corduroy hair and a light bulb nose. That is Isaac B. in that room, or... Holy smoke, wait a minute. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, put the gun away! <laughs> what's the idea? You're crazy? You shot down on the ground. Yeah, yeah, and the old guy in there didn't bat an eye. Didn't even turn his head at the sound. That gives me a big idea, and we're going to check something fast. Come on. <laughs> we ran back inside, and as I picked up the phone, Matthews found out for me that the house across the alley faced on Common Avenue. Then I dialed Isaac Lee's home number, and when I finally got a sleepy hello, I asked him a question. The answer he gave boosted the odds on my hunch into the sure thing class. When I hung up, Matthews unhappily agreed to play along. And with one of the plain clothes men, went around to Common Avenue to cover the front of the house across the alley. By the way, I went out to the back way again, 38 in hand, crossed the alley, climbed up on a brick wall, and moved toward the window. It was 18 inches open. I eased one edge of the blind aside and looked in. A life-size bronze bust of Isaac B., I've heard mentioned earlier, sat on a table in front of the window. And beyond that... Was Gordon Holzer backed against the wall and staring in stiff fear at a pistol clenched in the hand of the biographer, Everett oh, Ransom? Man. Don't shoot. I, I made a mistake, I admit it. You certainly did, Mr. Holzer. A much greater one than you realize. But I want to return this now. I brought the peacock back to you. Don't you understand? Yes. Yes, but I'm afraid you don't. I got careless a few weeks ago and left the shade up one night when I took the peacock out of hiding to admire it. And you watched the whole thing from your dark bedroom window, which is directly across the alley, didn't you? Yes, I... I knew it must be valuable. When I got in the jam yesterday, I broke in here and stole it. But I'm sorry, and that's why I brought it back. And now... And don't I... move. Don't move, Mr. Holzer. You see, two facts must never be revealed. One, that I stole the headless peacock from Isaac B. a year ago. And two, a little matter of murder. You killed Lester? Yes, I killed Lester. I waited for you to come home. And when that Lester showed up and went into your house, I mistook him for you. He was a very nosy little man. I had to kill him. You shot through my window so I could get away from Marlowe because you couldn't afford to let me talk to him. In fact, you can't let me talk to anybody. Ever. That's right, Mr. Holt. Luckily, I found out you'd be coming here to my place to return the peacock because I was with Marlowe when he found your note to that girl. He knows a lot about this, Marlowe does. But by the time I'm through... Neither he nor anyone else will be able to figure out what really Look, happened. I'll go away. I'll no. I'll do... No, Mr. Holzer, it's too late. This way, I'll have to restore that gorgeous thing to Mr. B. But I'll be something of a hero for catching the thief and the murderer. I'm sorry, Mr. Holzer. But after all, you did bring this on yourself. You're quite a moralist, aren't you, Ransom? Marlow! How did you... Oh, Marlow! Get back, Holzer! Get out of the way! Get Drop it! Get it. Get your head! Turn loose of the gun! Oh, you scratch him! Come on! Nice going, Holzer. He's out. And I've... I've got his gun, Marlowe. Yeah. Here it is. I'm going to stand real still. Talk real quietly from now on out. Good enough, Marlowe? Not quite, but it'll help. From what I've seen of Artie Dennis, brother, you're going to be a lifer anyway, but not with the state. Hey... Hey, it's cold out here. Come on, give me a hand. Thanks for getting me out of the pokey, Mr. Marlowe. You rat. No, I figure it's safe to turn you loose now, Artie. Uh-huh. <laughs> Gordon's going to have to stay in here a while, I guess. That's right. But that won't be so bad. At least he'll be where no horses or women can bother him. So I can get to him again. Won't be for long. Got a lot in his favor, you know. I hope so. I still don't understand how it all worked out. I was in jail, remember? Hmm. How did you pay Granson? Well, I saw the profile of Isaac B. on a window blind. Didn't move even when I fired a shot. That convinced me that it was a bust of the old boy. 
So I called him up at his home, and he told me that Ransom had a house on Common Avenue, which put it right across the alley from Holzer's. From there, it all fit. Hmm. Well, why didn't Ransom kill Gordon when he fired those shots through the window? Oh, that. He still hoped to recover the peacock for himself at that point. But he didn't know where Gordon had put it, so he couldn't afford to kill him right then. Oh, lovely. You know, Marlo, all in all, we're pretty lucky, Gordon and I. Yeah. Try to keep it, will you, baby? Keep it that way on everything but the horses. Oh, you can make book on that, mister. Mm -hmm. Good night, Phil. Good night, baby. I watched her as she walked away. She looked up at the barred windows where a very willing guy was learning a lesson he needed badly. Tossed him an okay with the fingers of one hand. Now, it made me feel good because I was sure she meant it. It was the kind of a kid who could make it stick. Then I drove home, and all the way I thought about the crazy assortment of people that had become involved because of the ponies and the headless peacock. I was still thinking about it over a glass of milk in my kitchen when I glanced at the newspaper on the table, opened the sports page. Oh, it was like magic. <laughs> My eye was drawn to a box in the corner and down the morning line for tomorrow's races until it stopped at the name Lucky Peacock. Oh, it was perfect. A hunch. A hunch that couldn't miss. Lucky Peacock was a cinch to win by a head. Or maybe he'd lose by a head. Or maybe he'd... Yeah, well. No use, Marlowe. Tomorrow you go to the races. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Donnelly, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks, Howard McNair, Eve McVeigh, Jack Moyles, and Peter Leeds. Lieutenant Detective Matthews was played by Larry Dobkin. The special music is written by Richard Orant and conducted by Ivan Dittmars. Ladies and gentlemen, the ringing of that phone bell means mystery, adventure. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. Yes. Good. Yes, I know that in 48 hours it's going to be Christmas, but... Who is this? Who? Look, I'm a big boy now, so... Okay. Tonight at 8. Goodbye. What the devil was that? This may come as a shock to you, Mr. Wolf, but that was Santa Claus. You've been drinking? Uh-huh, the usual, milk. He's coming to see you at 8. He's got a problem. Indeed. It seems that some low, not to mention murderous character, is going around slaughtering Santa Clauses. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's the bulkiest, balkiest, smartest, and most unpredictable detective in the world. That chair-born genius, Nero Wolf. Created by Rex Stout and brought to you in a new series of adventures over this NBC network in the person of Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Earlier than eight, however, the case of the slaughtered Santas. It began to be precise on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. The hour was close to six, the weather cold, the sky dark. Uh, how you doing, Santa? Uh, I'm freezing to death, Harvester. Well, it's a cold day. You packing up? Yeah, I guess so. Not many people around anymore. Oh, heading for home and dinner. How was the collection? Well, I, I don't need no armored car, but... A few dozen kids are going to have something for their Christmas stockings. Your competition, the guy in the opposite corner, is already scrambled. <laughs> Probably got low blood pressure. Well, give me a hand to get the collection part off the chains, eh? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, I'll just walk you down the block. Got to phone in. Okay, fine. One Santa still left. Wonder what he's waiting for. <laughs> Santa Claus. <laughs> 
Well, watch yourself going down those chimneys tonight. Sure, sure. Well, I'll cut across the avenue here. Be seeing you. Hey, that car coming down the street. Got its lights out. Look out! Hey, Peg. Huh? Did I ever tell you I love you? Ah, oh, it's not me you love. It's a hot soup. Ah, now you're not the only woman who can cook a dish of soup. Huh? It helps, though. I'm just beginning to thaw out. Yeah, that's a cold corner you play Santa Claus on. Well, don't hurt to make a few bucks. I ain't done so good this past year. Well, maybe the next year it'll be... Oh, well. Besides, I kind of like it, you know. Kids asking questions all day long. Yeah. You know, I wonder how, how they figure the other two Santas at the intersection. Our kids think of only one thing at a time. <laughs> Moises? Sure, Pat. You know, uh, one of them other Santas got hit by a car tonight. Oh? Uh-huh. Yeah, packed up a few minutes before I did, started crossing the avenue, and bang! You know, hit and run driver. Oh, gosh, that's too bad. Was he hurt? Yes, he was killed. <sighs> Here's your soup. Oh, the traffic the way it is nowadays... Well, I better take a look at the stew. Somebody at the door. I'll get it, Peg. Okay. Yeah, what? Oh, oh! Mike! Wolf? Yes, Archie? I've been thinking. Good heavens. Oh, I admit it won't bring about a national emergency... But Mr. Wolf, Christmas is only a couple of days away. If you're hinting about your present... No, no, no. I was just imagining you behind a team of reindeer. Your imagination is morbid. You'd make a wonderful Santa Claus. Oui. You've got the perfect build for it. Of course, as for character... Archie. Yeah. <laughs> Can you picture me scrambling down a chimney? <laughs> well, I might have to build bigger chimneys, but... Bah. Well, there's that, too. However... That is the front door. True. I was thinking... You might see who it is. Well, if nobody's been lying to me on the phone, that'll be Santa Claus. Maybe me. But I haven't decided what I want for Christmas yet, Mr. Wolf. For example, should she be blonde or brunette, tall or short? Archie. On my way. Good evening. I dislike dawdling on anyone's doorstep. Well, stop dawdling. Come in, please. Mr. Wolf has been warned of my arrival. He has. Through here. Uh, Mr. Wolf. This is, uh, Santa Claus? My name is Barton. John Barton. How do you do, sir? I have no time for the social graces, Mr. Wolf. I'm about to be murdered. Heard in my house, I have objections. I'm a frightened man, Mr. Wolf. Me? This, this costume you see me in is responsible for it all. Why are you in it? I had a notion it might be, well, entertaining to play Santa Claus in public. I'm a wealthy man, sir. I can afford to have whims. Therefore, I have assumed this masquerade. However, it apparently... (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be the death of me. Mr. Barden, you have adequately conveyed an atmosphere and an emotion. I suggest you concentrate on facts now. There you have. I have been acting as Santa Claus for the tuberculosis fund. My station is the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle Avenue. I might add the northeast corner. Why? Because at that intersection there have been two other Santa Clauses. One on the southeast corner and one on the southwest corner. Three Santa Clauses, then, on three corners. Yes. Now, then, earlier tonight, the man on the southwest corner started home. He was crossing the avenue when he was run down and killed by an automobile. A regrettable accident. The car was running without lights. It deliberately ran the fellow down and then vanished. Not an accident, Mr. Wolf. You saw this yourself? I did. One Santa Claus death. The man on the southeast corner got home all right. According to the radio news flash, that's where he was killed. By bullets. Coincidence? Possibly, but I wouldn't want to risk my life on the chance. This is Friday night. In the nature of things, you would have made two more appearances. Very well, Mr. Barton. I'll write you a check as a retainer, then hurry along home. I'm late now. No. I beg your pardon. You will neither hurry home nor notify anyone at your home of your whereabouts. But I... You will remain here until such time as I think it's safe for you to leave. The house is well guarded. I can't do that. In which case, I cannot accept you as a client. I fail to understand. Mr. Barton, it is very easy to murder someone. Avoiding the consequences of such an action is something else again. However, I'm assuming that you're not primarily interested in what happens to your murderer after you're dead. Of course not. 
Therefore, you remain here. Archie? Yep. First, the corner of 34th and Carlisle, a complete report. But that's nonsense. The corner will be deserted Mr. now. Mr. Barton, you're hiring my intelligence. You will therefore permit me to use it as I see fit. A complete report, Archie? Right, sir. You will then visit Inspector Crame at headquarters. You will, in whatever manner you find effective, collect all the police information about the two already murdered Santas. Fine. The manor, I think, will be applying a blowtorch to the inspector's toes. Your levity is ill-timed. The inspector is likely to throw me out of my ear. Your problem. My ear. And on your way home, you might stop in at Mr. Barton's place. I don't see any purpose in that. Mr. Barton, there is a basic problem to which we must find an answer. Whether those two men were murdered because they were Santa Clauses, or because their deaths were merely preliminaries to yours. Archie, I suggest haste. Yes, sir. And avoid blonde. Hmm? <laughs> I would like you to be home in time for Christmas. Hey, Pudge. Yeah? Got the price of a cup of coffee? <laughs> you sure you mean coffee? Either you're gonna dig it up or you ain't. Never mind the questions about my personal affairs, see? Oh, I apologize. Here. Two bits. <laughs> Thanks. You're welcome. Don't let me keep you. You're not. 34th in Carlisle, huh? During the day filled with milling throngs? Hey, that's a nice phrase. I'll have to remember it. Milling throngs. And now, desolate and deserted. Well, that's life. Is that a fact? That's philosophy. Yeah. But for two bits, I don't have to listen to no philosopher, see? Good night, bud. <laughs> Uh-oh. The inspector's got company. If all you reporters will shut up and ask your questions one by one, I'll answer. Right. Right. Inspector Kramer, it's true a couple of Santa Clauses have been knocked off tonight. It's true that two men who have been employed as Santa Claus by charitable organizations have been murdered, yes. Any connection between those two guys, or does somebody just hate Santa Claus? You know, so far as we know, there is no connection. That means it could be maybe some kind of maniac who decided he doesn't like Christmas or Santa Claus. Is that right? Yeah, the department is investigating along those lines. Like how? Well, we're checking all the local asylums for possible escape lunatics. Yeah, but Inspector, suppose this nut has never been in an asylum. <laughs> That'll be all, boys. Oh, but listen, no, I no, said no, that'll no, be all. Now, anything new comes in, you'll get it, understand? Oh, well, no, hey, good one. Operation. Hello, Inspector. Yeah, I spotted you coming in. What happened? You decided to reform and got a job on a paper? Nope. I'm a public-spirited citizen, that's all. Yeah, I could add a few things to that description with practically no strain at all. Mr. Wolf and I are very sentimental about Christmas. We object to Santa Claus is being killed. Nuts. Oh, Inspector, aren't you in favor of Christmas? I'm in favor of Christmas. I'm in favor of motherhood. I'm in... Leave motherhood out of this. Neither of us are mothers. Our chances of becoming mothers aren't too good either. And furthermore, Okay, I would... okay, you're not given. So get out of here. <laughs> Thank you, Inspector. Uh, but good one. Yeah? In case Wolf decides to send me something for Christmas, you know what I wish he'd send me? What? Your head. <laughs> Well. Oh. Now I know what I want for Christmas. What did you say? I said my name is Goodwin and it's cold on your doorstep. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Come in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't mention your name. I'm Laura Barton. Mrs. Laura Barton? No. Fine. Fine. That is, what relation are you to John Barton? His niece. Why do you ask? Oh, you've got a beautiful voice. Uh, all this marble and no butler? Well, I don't know where Pleasant is. He should be here. Have him shot at sunrise. Oh, Laura. Oh, Wayne, this is Mr. Goodwin. I never heard of him. What does he want? Well, I don't Wayne know. Wayne he... what? Stevens. Uh-huh. Friend of Mr. Barton? Half-brother, but we seem to be doing all the answering. How about your answering some questions, Goodwin? I'll try. Come into the library. What do you want? For Christmas? Uh, erase that. I would like to see Mr. Barton. He's not home. Where is he? Don't you know? I wouldn't have come here asking for him if I did, would I? I suppose that's true. 
What did you want with him? Conversation. About? Anything. You see, I like to talk to rich men. Are you rich? <laughs> I can't play the piano either. You could always learn. But being rich is harder. I found Mr. That... Mr. Goodwin, you must have some reason for coming here. Some reason concerning Uncle. Laura, you're being imaginative. Well, Uncle is late. He's probably still on that street corner playing Santa Claus. He enjoys it. Why bother about what... I don't know, except... He's never been as late as this? Well, no. Not since he started that masquerade of his. Would you happen to know where the butler is? Out getting drunk, I suspect. He was in the kitchen a little while ago. Disappeared. Pleasant likes to look on the wine when it's red. Or even when it's rye. Uh, no, I take that back. Oh, you do? He prefers Irish whiskey. We don't stock it. Therefore, no, um... too bad. I better run along. Good night, Mr. Stevens. Miss Barton. Good night. Uh, I'll see you out. Prettiest butler I ever saw. Blonde. Now, old Dr. Tidmouse always said, beware of blondes, because... Mr. Goodwin, I... Well, I'm waiting. Well, I... Mr. Goodwin, you must know something about Uncle, something you didn't want to tell us. Makes you think so. Well, otherwise, your visit was just pointless. Let's suppose I know. Now, I might be a kidnapper. Oh, no. My honest brown eyes. Your first name is Archie, isn't it? Archie? Archie Goodwin. Hmm. Goes together nicely, don't you think? You work for Nero Wolf. You're going back to him now? I might be, but then again, I might be going to the movies. I recognized you. Your pictures have been in the papers. Take me with you to see Mr. Wolf. You can trust me. I never trust blondes. Well, that's unfair. Well, no, I don't trust brunettes either. Furthermore, I'm not sure Mr. Wolf would want to see you, so I... Uh... So? So why don't you, uh, trail me home, hmm? <laughs> Archie? Archie? Where's Santa Claus? Guest room. He was tired. What, uh... I've been trailed home. Deep? By a blonde. Who is? All right, I admit I didn't make any strenuous effort to shake her off, but she trailed... Where is she? Outside. Good. Your report. Oh, but she might freeze to death out there. That's her problem. Your report, Archie. It's short and simple. It would be simple. I haven't got time to resent that. A blonde is dying. As for the report... Corner of 34th and Carlisle is a very quiet spot at night. No one was around, but a bum who got into me for a quarter. For coffee, he said. You will not put that quarter on the expense account. Stop worrying. That was a private gesture. There were four corners. Corner number one had a dress shop on it. Corner number two, a drugstore with a beautiful redhead in the window, making with a hair rinse. The ad said her name was Noreen, but it didn't give her phone number. Ah, gee. <clears throat> Third corner was devoted to a shoe store, and the fourth corner had a bank on it. A bank? Mm. Uh -huh. Kind of thought we'd have a pause at that point. Mean something? Inspector Kramer's information consisted oh, of... Oh, you're being coy. Kramer furnished the information the police could find no connection between the two murdered Santas. Except for the fact that they were both playing Santa Claus. Well, isn't that a little on the obvious side? This is an obvious case. The Barton home, Archie. Uh, marble and old lace. The butler, his name is Pleasant, was among those missing. Among those present... Laura Barton, the old man's niece, and Wayne Stevens, his half-brother. Ah. Yeah, only for Laura. Stevens was not at all pretty. It was Laura Barton who followed you here. It was Laura. Archie, uh, go upstairs mm -hmm. and... Uh... Oh, now, wait a minute. The girl, the weather, common humanity demands that you have... Louis, you speak for yourself, not humanity. I'm human. On occasion, a debatable point. Very well. Let her in. Ah, oh, thanks. Laura! Yeah. Come in. Laura Barton, Mr. Wolf. How do you do? How much money do you inherit on the death of your uncle? Wh what? That is known as the shock treatment. However, I need an answer. Oh, uncle isn't dead, is he? That, for the moment, is irrelevant. How much? Half his estate. The other half? Wayne, uncle's half-brother. Very well. Archie, would you go upstairs and inform Mr. Barton that his niece is here? Uncle is here? On my way. Yes? Archie, Mr. Barton. Come in. 
Mr. Wolf would like you to come downstairs. I suppose he has a reason. Mm hmm. A blonde reason, your niece. My niece? That's right. She did. Ju- where'd you get that? A man of my wealth finds it safer to carry a revolver. But it's not safe to point it at people, especially for the people. Turn around, Goodwin. But, Mr. Barton, we're protecting you. By letting that girl into the house? If I had the time, I'd be amused. As it is! Archie, you be drunk. Good heaven. Uh Uh-huh. Santa Claus came early. Go ahead. Which one are you referring to, my own or the one Santa gave me? You had better sit. No, no, I had enough trouble getting up a little while ago. I'm staying out of any positions in which I might have to do that again. Mr. Barton is among the missing. Indeed. Mm Mm-hmm. Hit me on the head and use the back exit. I checked with Fritz in the kitchen on the way here. He offered a reason for his peculiar behavior? Laura Barton. So? I... I don't understand. Uncle wouldn't do... Uncle apparently has. He also, would appear, fancies himself in costume. He used to be very much interested in the stage. He he acted for a while, a long time ago, till the family objected to... Archie? Got it. Nero Wolf's office, Archie Goodwin speaking. You recite very nicely, Goodwin. This is Kramer. Let me have Wolf, huh? Mr. Wolf? Inspector Kramer. Yes, Inspector? The papers haven't been carrying it, Wolf, but uh, you're working on the Santa Claus case, aren't you? Possibility? You didn't send Goodwin down to headquarters on a possibility. Uh, Never mind. We're working on a line down here, Wolf. Now, look, uh, if it doesn't strain your professional ethics, you might be able to help. How? There's a bank on the corner of 34th Street and Carlisle. We got the thought that suppose a gang was preparing to take that bank tomorrow morning. Those Santa Clauses have been on the corner for nearly a week now. They might have noticed something about the bank's routine, guards or what have you, that could interfere with the gang's plan. A mighty ingenious and imaginative thought, Inspector. Hey, you didn't say yes or no. I have at the moment no opinion. That's all you're going to give us? At the moment. However, Inspector, in a very little while I shall give you, uh, <laughs> the murderer. Archie, Miss Parton will remain here. As for you... Yeah, you return to 34th Street and find our coffee-loving friend. Hmm? You will what? persuade him in whatever manner you think best to return here with you. Huh? Yes. <laughs> you know, I think it's possible you may be able to put that quarter on the expense account after all. Yo. What? Oh, why? I've seen you before. Yeah, I've learned to love the neighborhood. That's why it's going to break my heart. What is? Leaving it with you. With... <coughs> Sensitive about having <coughs> guns pulled on me tonight. Let go of me, will you? Not until I... I... you that, but... Yeah. <coughs> Gun looks in a lot better shape than you do. You're coming with me. Oh, where? Mr. Wolf would like to see you. Nero Wolf? Yeah. Well, Why? He's trying to salvage a quarter. Ah, Archie. Uh-huh. Complete with the... He wouldn't give his name. He did have a gun to it, though. This one. Yes. Archie, you know Miss Barton, of course? Hi. And Mr. Stevens? He joined us a moment ago. Miss Barton thought she'd be happy if he were here. Hello, Stevens. That's not the only reason I came. My brother is still missing. I'm concerned. Yes. You, sir, will you sit down? Watching people stand makes me uncomfortable. I don't have to. You do. Archie is stronger than you are. Mm, All right. Ah, That's better. If you don't mind, Mr. Wolf, I've never been here before, never met you. But you look as though you could handle things. I think my brother's been kidnapped. Possibility we should have to consider. Miss Barton, perhaps you have a theory, too? Well, I don't know. Uncle's been behaving strangely for weeks now. What way? I'm not sure. Wayne... Well, of course, John's always been a little peculiar, but I'm afraid I saw nothing especially strange, outside of this Santa Claus stunt, of course. I see. Miss Barton, your uncle played Santa Claus all week on one of the corners of 34th Street in Carlisle. I know. 
On two other corners, two other men indulged in the same activity. Those two other men are now dead. Oh, well, no. wait. Mr. Wolf, you mean they were killed by mistake for Barton? It is true that one man made up of Sandy Claus looks very much like any other man's similar costume. But the answer is no. One of the two men was shot in his home after he had removed his costume. Well, then, what connection? Miss Barton, in the event that you wanted to hide a tree, where would you hide it? Hide a tree? Why, I, I wouldn't even begin to know. If you were very clever, you would hide it in a forest. If you wanted to hide a murder and were very clever, you would adopt the same principle. Wait, you mean that if someone wanted to kill Uncle and didn't want to be suspected, he'd... Go about murdering several people with an ostensible, if lunatic, reason. He would never say go about killing Santa Claus. I get it. Then people would think the man he really wanted dead for a special and private reason had been killed for something that didn't point to him. True. That was why two Santa Clauses were murdered tonight. The third Santa Claus, however, the real object of the murderer's attention was lucky or suspicious. He fled. Ah, do I have to hang around here and listen to all this? You do, my unwashed friend. Mr. Barton fled, and the murderer was in a quandary. He had, so to speak, invested in two murders merely to make the third one confusing. But he found himself unable to commit that third murder. He couldn't find his victim. Could he ask the police to do so? Hardly. But he might try to inveigle a private detective such as myself into the job. Uh, that makes sense, Mr. Wolf. but uh, why would my brother have deliberately fled from your house? Uh, I, I mean, he was protected here, so... But do I make myself clear? Very clear, Mr. Stephen. Archie, that gun you took from that dirty gentleman, you still have it? I still have it. Then would you mind pointing it at Mr. Stevens here until the police remove him? All right, come along, Stevens. Well, that's the end of Mr. Stevens. Inspector Kramer will take good care of him from now on. But now, Mr. Wolf. Laura and me and the refugee from a washcloth over here would still like to know how and why and who was involved. I knew two people had a motive for John Barton's death. Laura Barton and Wayne Stevens. One of them proceeded to kill Santa Clauses in the hope that the police would assume those killings to be the work of a lunatic. The paper certainly hopped on that assumption. Yes. However, John Barton, aware that his life was in danger, escaped his murderer and hid. In this house? No. A man in Santa Claus costume came here and said he was Barton. However, he was an obvious imposter. He proved that by his flight when his niece came here. You mean he could fool you, but he knew he wouldn't be able to fool me, so... Precisely, therefore, was not Barton. Who was it? Who else had disappeared at the propitious moment? The butler, Pleasant. True. I distrust coincidence. Stevens needed an accomplice, hence he sent Pleasant here. And Pleasant would give you a song and dance about Barton's danger and then scram. You'd start investigating, discover Barton was missing, try to find him, and lead Stevens to his victim, huh? I frustrated that part of the plan by insisting on Pleasant's remaining here, which he did until... That part of it's fine. But how did you choose between Laura and Stevens? It was Stevens who knew, without being told, that Barton had been in his house and had fled from it. Yeah, yeah, you yourself mentioned that Stevens had only been here a moment, so you hadn't told him. Obviously, the butler phoned him as soon as he had hit you over the head and escaped. Furthermore, the butler masquerading as Barton had attempted to throw suspicion on Miss Barton. That convinced me of her innocence. Well, you've done it again, Mr. Wolf, except for one minor detail. You're not very successful at irony, Archie. What minor detail? Where is Barton? In this house. Huh? When did that happen? You arrived home with the gentleman sitting near you. The bum? The... Wait, wait a minute. This I ought to be able to figure out myself. Laura said Barton used to be an actor. That's item one, huh? Yes, Archie. Also, why is a supposed tramp hanging around a deserted intersection for handouts? The answer is he wasn't. He was keeping an eye out for trouble he knew was after him. <laughs> oh, so it turns out I gave a quarter to a millionaire. Uncle, your uncle. Oh, that is... I, I know, my dear, yes, I'm uncle. <laughs> I did a rather decent job, didn't I? <laughs> no one recognized me. Uh, except, of course, you, Mr. Wolf. Not recognition, Mr. Barton. Logic. Archie, open some beer for us. Yes, sir. Logic, eh? 
Well, whatever it was, Mr. Wolf, I owe you a good deal. How can I ever repay you? Oddly enough, the answer is simplicity itself. <laughs> Make out a check. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Howard McNear, Grace Lennard, Vic Rodman, Herbert Butterfield, Bill Johnstone, Gene Bates, and Bob Bruce. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Bashful Body. Don Stanley speaking. Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gut of the prison of the grave. This time I took a beating and gave one. The man who lived in the dark was afraid. Someone I never got to meet was murdered, and a knife-wielding crab was destroyed. All because a girl who hated the water took a boat ride in old Mexico. From the pen of Raymond Chandler, outstanding author of mystery, comes his most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy as we present The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's story, Mexican Boat Ride. Clear and clean. You know the kind that knocks ten years off your age and makes you taste the sunshine and your orange juice? It was a day to be spent on an open road to someplace new and exciting. But a phone call I'd received that reduced my open road to Camelita Avenue and nothing more exciting than Beverly Hills. The house I stopped at was one of those you entered through a tunnel of dank, overhanging foliage on a flagstone path grown green with damp moss. A low, thick-walled affair with tiny, barred windows hidden from the sidewalk. I pressed the bell, and a moment later, a sallow housekeeper opened the door with what seemed to be a last ounce of strength. She squinted at my card and beckoned me inside. I followed her down a dusky corridor to a heavy, closed door, where she signaled me to wait. The air in the house smelled thick and stale. When she came out again, she held the door open for me and motioned me into a room full of darkness. It became nearly complete when the door clicked shut behind me. All I could see was the vague form of a man in smoked glasses propped up on a bed across the room. There's a chair beside you, Marlowe, if you care to sit. Oh, thanks. I'm Carl Estabrook, importer. You may have heard of me. No, I don't think so. Well, no matter. <laughs> Marlowe, I have a peculiar problem. I want to know why my wife Ona was on a boat day before yesterday off the coast of Mexico. If you could find out... Well, if that's all you got to go on, I doubt it. No, there's a little more. Huh? Ona and I planned to take vacation together. But when I was confined with this illness, we decided she should go on alone. Oh, then your illness is the reason for the midsummer blackout, huh? Yes. If I expose my eyes to light at any time in the next few weeks, the doctors promise me plenty of pain and virtual blindness. Oh. It's temporary, but tedious to mend. That's why I need a capable man with sharp eyes. To look into what, specifically? The paradox of my wife aboard a boat. Mm -hmm. She has a phobia about them. The mere thought of being on a boat makes her panicky. She drove to Ensenada, Mexico, earlier this week, but believe me, her plans did not include boat rides. Well, tell me, how'd you find out she was on one? Is she right? No, she hasn't written me at all, but that's not unusual for her. A friend of mine got back yesterday from a fishing trip down there. The day before, his boat passed another with a girl aboard. He got a good look at her. He was so sure that it was Ona that he hailed her. The girl turned and ran inside. <laughs> it, 
it bothered him to the extent that when he got home here, he called me to find out if Ona was in Ensenada. Is that all? And that's all. He didn't get the name of the boat. Look, you want me to go all the way down there just to find out if the girl he saw was Mrs. Estabrook? Right. Uh, what is your fee, Marlowe? Fifty bucks a day, plus expenses. That's the minimum, if I take the job. I don't think I will. When business gets so bad, I have to do divorce work, I'll quit and write my memoirs. No, I'm sorry, but that's the way it is. No, no, sit down, Marlowe. Ona and I have had our share of difficulties, true. She's quite a few years younger than I, and used to be a dancer. But, generally speaking, we're happy. Specifically what? I'm worried about her. Here. There's money in this envelope and a recent photograph of my wife. And there's more of both if the need arises. Uh, incidentally, what kind of a day is it outside? Gorgeous. Well, then you can drive. It's only 250 miles. Yeah. By the way, how has the importing business been lately, uh, legitimately speaking? You do have a suspicious mind, don't you? Only when the situation calls for it, and this does. However, I can understand an imagination working overtime here in the dark, Mr. Estabrook. So I'll take your money and go on down to Ensenada and see if anything's wrong. But look, I'm giving you notice beforehand. If it turns out to be family laundry and nothing more, I drop it. You're a reputable man. Just see that I get my money's worth, Marlowe, and you can keep the change. I'll expect to hear from you. When my eyes adjusted to the dazzling glare outside, I looked in the envelope and picture of an impish, dark-haired woman and five $100 bills. For the first time, I realized what Estabrook had meant by keep the change. But it didn't help my attitude even a little. By two o'clock, I was on the road south. A late lunch in La Jolla with an old friend, a routine baggage inspection at the border. And then 70 twisting miles of lonely road brought me to Ensenada, just as the Mexican sun dropped into the sea. I drove past the piers and canneries at the edge of town, and then along the curving shore to the only hotel elegant enough to meet the demands of the woman I figured on Estabrook to be. After I'd gotten a room and cleaned up, I went to the desk and asked for her. She was registered, had number 74, and at the moment was out on the patio. <laughs> All of which sounded ridiculously normal. And I thought again of an imagination at work in a dark room back in L.A. I thanked the clerk in crippled Spanish and turned in time to catch the end of a long, cold stare from a pair of frog-like eyes that bulged out of an otherwise handsome head on a man in a gray gabardine suit. I didn't think my language had been that bad. But when Popeye followed me out onto the patio, I wasn't too sure. There was no mistaking Ona Estabrook. She sat alone at a table in the far corner, a tall, minted gin drink in front of her. So I put on my best tourist-type smile and walked over. Well, Ona Estabrook, this is a pleasure. Enjoying your visit? Why, why yes, very much, but I, I don't think I... Know me? Oh, of course, you wouldn't remember my name's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. No, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Marlowe, but you I... You were a heard... dancer, weren't you, before your marriage, I mean? Yes, I was a dancer, but you, you'll have to excuse me now. I, I, I'm expecting a friend. I hope oh, you don't mind. Oh, well, just one thing then, Mrs. Estabrook. Would you mind telling me why you were out on a boat day before yesterday? A boat? Mm-hmm. Why do you ask that? Because you hate boats. You have a phobia about them. And yet you were seen aboard one just two days ago. How come? Well, I... Oh, how clumsy of me. Uh, I've spilled the drink all over my skirt. Excuse me. I'll have to change. That maneuver was as subtle as a bulldozer at work. When she spilled her drink, it was done desperately and fear sent her running for the exit. I turned to follow her as she left the lighted patio and headed down a dark arcade. But a gray gabardine suit and a pair of Popeyes slid out of a chair and beat me to it. I waited until their footsteps faded, which said they turned a corner. Then I started after them. It was strictly follow the leader, but I didn't realize how many were playing the game until a knife point stung at the skin at the soft part of the back about kidney high. Stop, senor, and don't cry out. Don't even say ouch. I turned and saw a mottled red face ugly on a squat long arm body. The ivory-handled knife in his hand could have clipped my spine in one easy thrust. You got a car here, senor? Come on, I speak English good. You got a car? Yeah, I got a car. What's it to you? I am Hayaba, the crab. It's lots to me. What's Let's your pitch, go. Buster? Come on, tell me. Uh, Martinez says for me to keep a sharp eye on things, to be sure something is not wrong. It looks to me like something is wrong with you, senor. Who's Martinez? <laughs> you gonna play possum, senor? <laughs> uh, this one is your car, huh? 
All right. Yeah. Okay. I take first your yes. one. Uh, now, please to get in. You gonna drive. Believe it or not, you're making a big mistake, Krabby. Besides, what if I don't want to drive? Oh, you better want to drive, gringo. <laughs> or I kill you right here. Go on, drive. Handle it. Stop here. And now we get out. Uh, it's nice and quiet here on the beach, no? We walk over there to that old adobe wall. We're gonna have a talk there. It's gonna be dull, Buster. We've got nothing in common. Please, senor, don't make it hard on me. I don't know why you gotta come and mix everything up again when time is running out. Why did you come? I needed new haraches. Hmm, look, senor. You think I'm ugly? You know beauty, Crab, let's face it. See, si, and I can act even uglier. Maybe I could go on the radio and make a big hit, no? <laughs> or maybe I make the big hit on your face. Oh! Mm, don't try something, senor. Or I kill you with your own gun. Now, the truth. You spoke to the senor about the boat. Why? I forget. Oh. Hey. Who are you, senor? Hey, private detective named Marlo. Oh, a private detective. Who are you working for, Dolph Bentley? I never heard of Dolph Bentley. Who's he? You're lying. The senora knows him. I heard her say Dolph Bentley won't make it tonight. Yeah, he's lucky. Si, I tell you something else. He better not make it. Martinez is going to do business with one man only tonight. Now you want to say something? No? Then I'll say it. You take what's going to be left of your face, oh. Oh. Senor Bentley, until you get out of Ensenada oh. and don't come back. Oh. Oh. Understand? Ah. Oh. Hey. Uh -oh. Hey. Wait a minute. Come on, wake up, wake wait up. Minute, stop okay. the crash. Come on. Who are you? Wait, oh, it's you. I'll wait, kill you. Wait, 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 take it easy with uh, you. You're in good hands now, Marlo. I'm a fellow uh, American. <laughs> uh, you know, you're pretty lucky, you know that? I am? Oh, sure, yeah. Let my pal go. Huh? I am? Oh, I chased him off. You know, it's a wonder he didn't put a knife in you. These yeah. fellows are mean with knives. This guy was no slouch with a gun butt, either. Hey, hmm? where'd you come from, anyway? Oh, down the beach a ways. I just finished oh. working on the boat, and I was taking a walk, oh. and I heard the commotion came over to see about it. This guy was beating you up, so I yelled and started for him, but he ran. Oh, is that right? Mm -hmm. I'm glad somebody stopped him. Thanks very much, Mr. D Roman. Oh. Uh, Lou Roman's my name. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm pleased to meet you, Mono. Hi. You know me? Uh, well, yes, I... I took the liberty of looking in your wallet to see that that devil had robbed you. Oh. It doesn't seem so, though. Yeah, I guess I got here just in time. You're a private investigator, I see. Hey, you working on a case now? It's debatable. So far, the case is working on me. Oh. I'd like to find a guy named Dolph Bentley, though. Dolph Bentley? Yeah, yeah. The guy who beat me up had the idea that I was... Ooh. I was hired by Dolph Bentley. Did you ever hear of him? No. No, and I come down here every year to fish, too. Uh -huh. know a lot of folks around here, but I never heard of that one before. Uh, why are you after him? Well, he's he's tied up in some way to the crab who seems to work with another guy named Martinez, who in turn is going to do some business of some kind tonight with somebody other than Dolph Bentley. I don't know. And it's it's all connected for some screwy reason with a the woman who took a boat ride the day before yesterday. Well, uh, what about that? Uh, the woman being on a boat, I mean. Oh, well, she can't stand boats. She's afraid of... Oh, my head. Oh, wait, wait. Here. Thanks. I'm going to get you some first aid right yeah, away. That's a good idea. Holy smoke, my car. Man, I'll relax. Huh? Relax. It's right over there. Hey, come on. Let me help you out. All right. Easy oh. now. Easy. Oh. That's it now. I'll drive you. Uh, hey, where are you staying? Uh, at the hotel, huh? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Thanks, okay. Roman. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still busy. Uh, yeah, easy. I got you. I, I got to get back there. I got to find that girl, because... She's up to her head doing a very nasty mess. Uh, listen, Marlo. Huh? If I can help in any way, let me know, will you? <laughs> you know, us Americans have to stick together in a place like this. Right? Yeah, that's it. Come on. Let's go. Oh. Let's go. Lou Roman, the hail fellow, was indeed well met. He found my gun and drove me back to the hotel. A long hour had gone by since own Estabrook had run from the patio, followed by the pop-eyed character in the gabardine suit. 
I tried a room check with the desk again, and from there spent 30 minutes peering into corners and balconies and getting nothing but indignant glares from Mexican lovers. So I left the building and started through the grounds. I worked my way from the stables up into a secluded garden, deserted by all but a marble statue of Montezuma. But when I passed him, groaned. In the dark at my feet lay Haiba the crab, his mottled face twisted into a tortured grin of agony. And sticking straight up just above his belt buckle was the white ivory handle of his own knife. Crab! Crab, who was it? Who got you? Oh, senor, I, I am sorry what I did. Never mind that. Who did this? Do you know? Oh, si, si. It Lord Bentley. Now get a doctor. No, no, you, senor. I uh, tell Martinez that Lord Bentley is... Crab. Yeah. <laughs> In just a moment, the second act of Philip Marlowe. But first, when you're 65, if you have worked in business or industry, call any office of the Social Security Administration for information about your old age and survivor's insurance. The account number that appears on the Social Security card identifies your wage account. The amount of retirement and family insurance that may be payable is set by this account. Now with our star, Gerald Moore. We return to the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's story, The Mexican Boat Ride. Even as the life trickled out of the ugly little man called Aiba, and his face, which had been knotted tight in pain, went slowly limp and he was still. I knew that I'd have to get next to Dolph Bentley before the importance of Ona Estabrook aboard a fishing boat off Ensenada would make any sense. Also, I knew that there was a good chance that said Mr. Bentley and the gentleman in Greg Aberdeen, known to me as Popeyes, were one and the same. So I started back for the hotel. But halfway there, I stopped at the sight of a figure ahead scampering toward an all-alone taxi parked near the main entrance. It was Ona Estabrook. I took off after her. When she was in the cabin away before I could get close enough to do any good, I tried the next best thing, which was the sombrero doorman nearby, who I figured might have heard the address she'd given the driver. Yeah, but what I didn't figure was that the doorman might not habla much English. The Senora Estabrook. Uh, si, senor. Her enters libre a minute ago. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I know that. Now, look. Where did her go? Which way in the libre? Libre. Uh-huh. Oh, un momento, senor. Libre, libre. Oh, no, no. Viene, senor. No, look. Pronto. Amigo, I, I don't want a taxi. I don't, no libre. No libre. None whatsoever. Ah. Now, please, come here. Let's let's back it up a little, huh? Senora Estabrook in Libre, right? Si, senor. Okay. Now, where did she go? What direction? Uh, que direction? Oh, I already comprendo. Uh-huh. The senora. Yeah, the senora. Que direction? Comprendo? Uh, si, senor. Senora Estabrook go to the pier, the the fishing spear. Which one? Which fishing spear? There you uh, go. Qual pier? Uh, the small pier, senor. Uh, the little one near the big canary. The fish's canary. That's senor. all I want to know. Gracias, amigo, and... Uh-oh. Senor? Senor, what are you seeing? I'm not sure. But even if I were, I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. Buenas noches, pal. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I had been seeing at the silhouette of a man huddled close to the ground and slinking out from a hotel along a high hedge that led back toward the statue in the body of Aiba, a man who I knew could be the elusive Popeyes. I followed the walk that was close into the hotel until I was on a line with the hedge, and I started after him fast. I still had a good two yards to go when he heard me and pivoted, so I swung first! Oh! Why, you dirty... Roman, wait a minute, hold it! Gee, it's me, Marlo, I'm sorry. Oh! Holy smoke, I... I thought you were someone else. Oh, can't you, maybe? Oh, brother. Oh, I'm sorry. What'd you hit me with? I have everything I had. I figured you were Dolph Bentley, and <sighs> as such, Roman, I didn't want you to get away with murder, literally. Murder? Hey, not that girl you mentioned, Marlo. Oh, and Estabrook? Huh? No, no, no. The corpse is that item you sigged away from me over in those ruins. Somebody got to him with his own knife there near the statue. Aha, uh-huh, then I was right. I did see someone move over there. Well, yeah, a couple of minutes ago, Marlon. I was on the balcony outside of my room at the face of the garden here, you see. And when I saw you run for the main entrance, I had a feeling that you might be in trouble again, so I came on down here. Well, then what happened? Well, I was about to call out to you when I heard some noise over there near the statue. It was a man. He was running away fast, heading toward those stables. 
A man wearing gabardine, maybe tan, maybe gray. I... Maybe Dolph Bentley. Thanks, Roman. You've been a big help. When you get back to the hotel, tell him about the dead man, will you? I gotta run. The stable was a robust left fielder's peg to home plate from where we'd been standing. So by the time I got there, I was out of breath and facing nothing more important than thick darkness, a lot of hay, and a couple of horses who couldn't sleep nights talking things over. Until I moved around a corner past the stalls and close to the half-open door of a shack, marked both cabina telefono and the equivalent in English that showed a single unshaded light. And under that, a man standing alone next to a telephone, writing something on the back of an envelope. He was wearing a gray gabardine suit, and when he lifted his Popeyes from the paper in front of him, I knew the next move had to be mine, 38 and all. Let it go, Buster. Keep your hands close to your sides. Just as you say, senor. I'd be a fool not to obey you. You're so right, a dead fool. So keep that in mind while we chat, won't you, Mr. Bentley? Bentley? Uh Uh-huh. How did you find out who I am? It was easy. All I had to do was listen to a dying man's last two words when I asked him to name his murderer. He said, Dolph Bentley. Any comment? Yes. You know a lot, senor. Don't resent it, friend. I learned it all the hard way. Don't move, Bentley. I was only changing my position, senor. Which will be prone if you try it again. Now, what do you know about this whole mess and an American girl named Ona Estabrook who I figure is no mobster? Nothing, senor. You're a liar, Bentley. Which brings me to the point. One, why the pressure on the girl, and two, what's so important about her taking a ride on a fishing boat? Come on, brother. It's getting late for a murderer. Start talking straight the first time out. All right. I'll start with a question. Senor, how does all this concern you? You gain a percentage if the smugglers are not interfered with, perhaps? We were talking about the girl, remember? Yes, I remember. But you see, senor, I have little to offer on that score. How little? A single observation. In your country, senor, people who do not mind their own business are called nosy. Here in Mexico, we have another term. Asno. Which means what? Jackass, senor. Who, unlike the cat, cannot see in the dark. But can try his best, Bentley. No gun, senor. Okay, amigo, no gun, but this. Uh Asno. When Bentley met the floor and went out cold, I sagged to one knee. Stayed that way until the air rushing into my lungs quit sounding like sandpaper over a drumhead. Then I got back to my feet and turned on a bracket lamp on the other side of the room. I opened Bentley's jacket, slipped his 32 automatic out of its shoulder holster, emptied the clip and... stopped dead at the shimmer of light dancing on polished silver that I hadn't expected. It was a badge. Below his shoulder holster and pinned to his vest. Republic of Mexico, Department of Customs, Captain! I made a dive for the envelope near the telephone. On the back there was writing in thick pencil, which I finally figured to mean fishing pier near Cannery, 2 a.m. Inside, nothing. On the front, further proof that I'd never met with the Dolph Metley at all, but instead it tangled hard-like with one Captain Juan Descartos intelligence section custom building, Mexico City, Mexico. While trying to revive Captain Descartos, the truth rammed into my mind. Owner Estabrook had rushed off for the pier near the Cannery. That Captain Descartes had noted is a good place to be at two o'clock in the morning, which was less than 20 minutes away. And a great time for me to get to my car and appear. It won't work, senor. Yeah, you're a bright boy, thanks. <clears throat> You like the job on the car, senor? I think it shines well for the eight pesos you owe me. Uh, nobody asked you to bother, Junior, but I'll see you later. Right now I gotta run, huh? For eight pesos, one dollar you can write, senor. I'll replace the distributor cap. What? Come here, you. But, but senor, it was very dirty all over. Inside, too. The steering wheel, black as can be. Look, I, I ruined my best drag cleaning That's it. tough. Now give me that distributor cap or you'll be the saddest pair of dark eyes between here and the Panama Canal. Senor! Oh, never mind. Here. You pay me the dog? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put the cap back where it belongs. Quick, will you? I'm in a hurry. Well, come on. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> the precious 60 seconds ticked off before I was out of the parking lot and driving fast toward the fishing pier near the cannery where I knew I was finally going to get next to Dolph Bentley and if I made it in time, prevent another murder. But when I screeched to a stop away from the pier, piled out of my car and ran the length of the oil-soaked planking to where a single boat was making ready to cast off, 
I saw one of the two persons aboard the small catch was Ona Estabrook. The other was Lou Roman, haughty American fisherman. When I stepped aboard, our hunch hit me right between the eyes. I pulled my gun and pointed it an inch above his waist. What are you doing here, Marlo? I might ask you the same question, Roman, or do I call you Bentley from here on out? Marlo, you know, now he can't kill me. Now I don't have to be afraid of him anymore. Oh, Marlo, thank goodness you got here in time. Yeah, hooray. The Marines have landed in the form of a private... Cut it out, Bentley, and don't move. Oh, no, what do you mean about being afraid? What's your connection with this fisherman here? Look, it was an accident, Marlo. A mix-up in our baggage... Lou Roman and I both happened to stop for customs inspection at the border at the same time, and our suitcases were switched. I didn't notice it at the time, but when I got to the hotel, I discovered the mistake and went to Roman's room to correct it. But instead, you found Bentley here posing as Roman, right? Yes. He killed him, Marlo. He told me he did. That's a dirty lie. Roman's all right. He's in Chicago. No, he's not. He's dead. You killed him. Someplace between here and Tijuana, Marlo. He said I'd get the same treatment if I opened my mouth. Then he's the one who forced you to go out on that boat yesterday. Stay back, Bentley. Yes. So that people wouldn't be suspicious and made me appear at the hotel, in the patio there, at the restaurant. Well, why didn't you run? Well, I couldn't. He wasn't around. Another man was. A horrible man with large eyes that never left me. Yeah. So why don't you drop it, Marlo? No sale, Bentley. You see, I know that the horrible man with the large eyes can't be one of your henchmen. His badge says so. What? Badge? He's an officer, Marlo? Yeah, captain owner. Give up, Bentley? You had better. There are too many men ready to take you. Descados. <laughs> Where'd you come from? Oh, I have been here quite a while. But your story was so interesting, I just couldn't interrupt. And when Marlo took you for Dolph Bentley, Captain Descartes, mm. you played along because you didn't know who he was, is that it? Yes, senora, and I did not find out until I heard Bentley call Marlo a private eye. <laughs> You're not mad at me, Captain, huh? Even though I bungled your plan to capture Martinez, and uh, not to mention our little meeting at the stables. <laughs> uh, senor, do not say that you bungled the job of catching Martinez. It was more a matter of uh, priority. Uh, por favor, senor, the tacos. Of course, here you are. Gracias. You see, senor Marlo, I am certain that one day I will catch Martinez, but not at the cost of letting a murderer kill again. Hmm. But, senor Marlo, there is one thing that puzzles me. The murder of the one known as Haiba. Oh, Martinez henchman. Well, you see, Captain, he knew that a man named Dolph Bentley was mixed up in this because he'd overheard Ona and her keeper, then called Lou Roman, talking about him. He wanted to know more. Also, he couldn't figure who I was. So he beat you up? Correct. Bentley, of course, only saved my life because it was an easy way to find out just how much Haiba did know. After which he got to him. Enough? Not quite, senor. There is still one thing. How did you know that Lou Roman was actually Bentley? On a hunch, Captain. And by positive identification from you, Ono, when we were on the boat. But um, now it's my turn. I got a question for you, honey. Have you had enough vacation? Uh-huh. Matter of fact, Marlo, I wired my husband just before we came in to eat. Oh. I, I said the change did in your world good. Be home tomorrow to stay. Love always. Well, Captain, will you pass the tacos, please? They're, they're awfully good, really. <laughs> It was late the next afternoon, and Ona Estabrook was already gone when I checked out of the hotel, said goodbye to Captain Dos Catos, Adios, amigo. and headed north for the border, where two hours later I stopped for customs inspection of my baggage. It was dark, and I was only 50 miles from Los Angeles before I realized exactly what that inspection had meant, because it was then, for the first time, that I noticed the little cowhide suitcase on the seat next to me, which should have been mine, was tagged differently. The name and address of a man who lived in Long Beach, California. I got there, I kept driving. I knew I could ship it to him and ask for mine in exchange when I got home. Oh, yes. I'd had just about enough for a while. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character and crime's most deadly enemy, star Gerald Moore, and are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald. Script is by Mel Dinelli, Robert Mitchell, and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Mary Shipp, Harry Bartell, Nestor Piva, Bill Boucher, Ralph Moody, Bill Shaw, and Jerry Farber. 
The special music is written by Richard Aron. Thank <laughs> you.